Hey there, audiobook enthusiasts. Welcome to the audiobook collection. Today's upcoming audiobook is a special shout out to one of our amazing Patreon backers. If you're keen on personalized requests, consider becoming a part of our Patreon community. The link is in the video description below. Your support is truly appreciated, and I'm grateful to have you with me on this exciting audiobook adventure. And hey, if you're looking for a bundle of 300 plus novels, swing by my Kofi shop. For just $35, you can snag a Google Drive link to an audiobook treasure trove. Additionally, if you want to show some love to the original author of this novel, check out the author's credits discreetly provided in the description. Your support makes a difference. Thanks for being part of this literary journey with me. Chapter 21, I Think I Am OK Part 2 Marvel DC, Images, Manhus, and every anime that will be mentioned and used in this story are not mine. They all belong to their respective owners. The main character carried to Josue Valdez and the story are mine. Location The Xavier Institute Stepping resolutely through the enigmatic threshold of the portal, I found myself instantaneously transported to a realm entirely distinct from the one I had left behind. Before me lay an enchanting vista, a school adorned in a winter wonderland, veiled in a pristine blanket of snow. It was a landscape seemingly untouched by time, with the ambience whispering the telltale signs of the holiday season, while my original world, the MCU, was on the brink of summertime. The chill in the air embraced me, urging me to seek solace in warmth. Drawing upon Kane's remarkable abilities, I summoned the skill to imbue my body with a comforting radiance, dispelling the cold's grasp and fostering a cocoon of comfort. As I surveyed my surroundings with keen curiosity, my discerning gaze fell upon an intriguing contraption. Appearing to be a camera alongside a button, it held the promise of intrigue and mystery. Driven by an insatiable thirst for knowledge and understanding, I cautiously approached, my hand lingering over the enigmatic button. With a measured breath, I pressed it, waiting for an answer. Cyclops, on speaker identify yourself. Carito, easy, Scott. It's me, Spider-Man. Cyclops, the one from the disco a few years ago? Carito, yup. Cyclops, well, I'll be damned. Get in here. As the gates of this enigmatic realm parted before me, I ventured forth, stepping into a world that seemed both familiar and foreign. My eyes drank in the sight of numerous mutant children engaged in play, their unique abilities granting them a captivating dance with the winter's snow. A harmonious blend of enchantment and idiosyncrasy unfolded before me, with some reveling in the snowy delights while others sought shelter from the cold, their mutations presenting curious limitations in such weather. Approaching the door with a sense of anticipation, I mustered the courage to knock, a subtle yet resonant gesture announcing my presence. Moments later, the door swung open, revealing a figure that carried a timeless aura of strength and resilience, Logan. A flicker of surprise danced across his features, an unanticipated encounter with someone from beyond the confines of this extraordinary realm. Yet, amidst the astonishment, a glimmer of recognition stirred within his eyes a connection forged in the crucible of shared experiences and the kinship of kindred spirits. Logan, it really is you. How did you get here? Carito, I opened a portal from another dimension and thought of you guys, that's how I got here. Logan, are you sure you even have spider powers? Carito, I'm a bag full of surprises huh? Smirks. Logan, it's good to see you again. Extends hand. Carito, likewise, my friend. Shakes it. In the wake of our unexpected reunion, Logan and I found ourselves ensconced in a conversation, fostering an atmosphere of camaraderie. In a display of warm hospitality, Logan extended a gracious invitation, inquiring if I wished to partake in a repast. Given my predilection for indulgence, I gratefully accepted, fully aware of the culinary delights that awaited. Escorted to the dining room, we joined a gathering of other gifted children, each possessing a unique array of extraordinary abilities. As we gathered around the communal table, an atmosphere of congeniality pervaded, binding us together through our shared experiences and the wonderment of mutant gifts. Carito, this place does serve good food right? Logan, you don't have to worry about that. Carito, all right bet. In the midst of our graceful approach to procure the tantalizing offerings laid before us, a presence stirred nearby, capturing the attention of the room. As Logan and I moved to retrieve our plates, the radiant figure of Jubilee, Diffusing a vibrant aura, set her eyes upon me with an air of intrigue. Her gaze seemed to emanate an inexplicable sense of recognition, perhaps akin to the meeting of kindred spirits, drawn together by the intangible thread of destiny. Jubilee, in shock. Carito, what? Jubilee, 
I'm not having a lucid dream right now, Logan? Clarito, excuse me? Logan, nope, he's really here. Jubilee, Kaya. She wraps her arms and legs around Clarito. Clarito, confused Latino noises. Logan, she's always wanted to see you again. Clarito, it was this bad? Jubilee, it was hell. Logan, she talked about you like her Prince Charming. Clarito, oh really? Smirk. Jubilee, pout stop it. Snuggles around Clarito's neck. Clarito, can I get food first? Jubilee, no. Clarito, so you are just gonna latch onto me like a monkey? Jubilee, yes. Clarito, bruh. In the midst of savoring our delectable repast, we found ourselves amidst a sea of envious gazes, the culinary splendor prompting curious glances from our fellow denizens. Sensing the desire for a quieter sanctuary, Logan gallantly led us to a secluded haven, a private alcove where we could partake in our nourishment away from prying eyes. However, the aura of tranquility we sought was momentarily interrupted by Jubilee, her captivating presence insistent upon maintaining her hold on me, with gracious charm. We found ourselves partaking in our meal, even as Jubilee remained steadfastly by my side, ensconced upon my lap, her warm embrace weaving a tale of unspoken kinship and affection. Logan, how have you been? Clarito, good. Though, I thought Scott was going to welcome me inside. He did pick up when I was at the gate. Logan, he was told to fill some documents right after he was done letting you in. Clarito, oh, would have liked to say him to him. Jubilee, he'll be done in a bit. He wants to say hi. Clarito, ooh, that would be nice. Also, Jubilee can I eat? Jubilee, hm, all right. Gets off Clarito and eats. As the minutes gently ebbed away, fostering a tapestry of shared anecdotes and cherished memories, a new presence materialized within the confines of our private enclave. Stepping into the room with quiet grace, the luminous figure of Rogue graced us with her entrancing presence. A charismatic aura enveloped her like a captivating enigma wrapped in a shroud of intrigue. Rogue, oh, who is this handsome lad? Clarito, oh, hey, name's Carito. Smiles. Rogue, I'll deeply remember that. Smirks. Jubilee, pouts back off, Rogue. Rogue, jealous are we? Carito and Logan. Rogue, are you taken, sweetie? Clarito, no. Rogue, well, how about you and I? Gets lightly smacked on the head by Jubilee. Jubilee, don't you dare. Rogue, or what? As the door swung open with a graceful arc, a figure of elegance and poise stood revealed, Kitty Pride, her presence a study in understated sophistication. Her keen eyes fell upon Carito, and a veil of astonishment draped over her countenance, rendering her momentarily speechless. The air seemed to shimmer with intrigue, as the unanticipated encounter gave rise to a symphony of unspoken queries and uncharted emotions. Kitty, I'm not having a lucid dream, right Logan? Clarito, I'm having a deja vu here. Logan, nope. Kitty, Kaya, latches onto Clarito. Clarito, oh fuck, falls to the ground. Logan, this dude is a chick magnet. Jubilee and Rogue, hey, hands off. As the delicate symphony of emotions unfolded, the air crackled with palpable tension. The gentle hands of those around me gently extracted Kitty pride from my embrace but the echoes of the moment lingered in the room, a ghostly imprint of the connection that had momentarily enveloped us. Logan, wanna see Scott? Clarito, sure. As Logan and I prudently distanced ourselves from the spirited exchange, we relinquished the tempestuous domain to the captivating intricacies of the girls' discourse. Our purposeful stride led us through the bustling corridors of the Xavier School, where an atmosphere of intellectual ardor and esoteric knowledge permeated the air. Amidst this scholarly sanctuary, we eventually arrived at the hallowed threshold of Scott Summers's office. As we crossed the threshold, we beheld the formidable figure of Scott Summers, his demeanor a study and stoic resolve tinged with palpable weariness. Engrossed in the weighty matters that demanded his attention, he was ensconced amidst a sea of papers, a diligent captain navigating the uncharted waters of responsibility and leadership. Scott, oh, Clarito. I'm so sorry I didn't say hi earlier. I've been busy I'm sorry. Carito, now nah man it's fine, really, I understand. Scott, hugs Carito good to see you again, buddy. Carito, you too. Scott, how long are you staying here? Carito, around two days or so, I have things to do so I can't stay here for long, unfortunately. He means civil war. Scott, well that's alright don't worry, we are just happy to see you again. Carito, same, smiles. 
In the wake of our momentous encounter, the camaraderie amongst the boys swelled, and the hours drifted by in a symphony of engrossing conversations and leisurely camaraderie. As the day progressed, I had the privilege of making the acquaintance of two extraordinary individuals, Nightcrawler and Colossus, both embodying a spirit of congeniality that seamlessly melded with my own disposition. Nightcrawler's penchant for mischief and levity resonated with me, fostering an instant affinity, while Colossus exuded a serene demeanor that invited comfort and ease. As we explored the sprawling expanse of the Xavier School, Nightcrawler, Colossus, and I traversed its hallowed halls, discovering the many facets of this unique sanctuary for mutants. Led by the insightful guidance of Scott Summers, I came to understand the profound purpose behind Xavier's visionary endeavor, to create a haven of learning and empowerment for those marginalized and persecuted due to their exceptional gifts. Listening to Scott's impassioned recounting of the genesis of the school, my heart swelled with admiration and empathy for Charles Xavier, a man of profound altruism and benevolence. His determination to educate and nurture young mutants, shielding them from the relentless tide of prejudice and persecution, stood as a testament to his indomitable spirit and unwavering commitment to fostering a brighter, more inclusive world. Moved by the plight of the X-Men, my respect for Charles deepened, resonating with the echoes of historical injustices and discrimination that once plagued humanity. The harrowing echoes of past prejudices and persecution stirred a profound empathy within me, compelling me to stand in solidarity with those who had been unjustly marginalized and castigated. The resonance of Charles's vision imbued my heart with a renewed sense of purpose, as I found myself bound to this remarkable tapestry of extraordinary beings. With the collective reverence for Charles Xavier echoing in our hearts, the momentous hour arrived when we were presented to this visionary leader. Anticipation hummed in the air, as we prepared to encounter the man whose indomitable spirit and unyielding pursuit of equality had changed the course of history for generations of mutants. Xavier, hello young man, I'm Professor Charles Xavier. It's a pleasure to finally meet you. Uses his electric chair to move toward Carito and offers his hand. Carito, gently shakes his hand it's an honor, sir. I see that you have heard of me? Xavier, oh, most definitely. Kitty and Jubilee didn't stop talking about you on how you were like a celebrity in looks. Carito, or, oh, come on I'm just like any other person. Scratches his head. Xavier, and he's humble too. Are the ladies already fighting for him? Logan, you have no idea. Nightcrawler, it's actually pretty funny to watch. Carito, it's not funny at all. Pouts. Colossus, don't worry, Carito. I will tell them to give you breather space. Carito, see guys? Be like Colossus. Scott, and R. Seeing you so in distress was funny to watch. Carito, Ark. As laughter cascaded like a harmonious melody through the air, a collective decision was made, a jubilant celebration in honor of my arrival at the Xavier School. As twilight cast its enchanting veil upon the realm, the X-Men came together to orchestrate a sumptuous feast, a culinary marvel that would tantalize the taste buds of those in attendance. Stepping into the kitchen with a resolute determination, I took it upon myself to contribute to the culinary artistry, inspired by an impromptu desire to lend my skills to this momentous occasion. With a graceful yet efficient dance around the kitchen, I collaborated with the chefs, transforming this gastronomic undertaking into an extraordinary ensemble. The kitchen swelled with a harmonious synergy, as culinary masters became my valued assistants, mutually enchanted by the creative ardor that infused the room. As minutes unfurled like a delicate tapestry, the table was bedecked with a lavish banquet, a cornucopia of flavors and aromas awaiting the discerning palates of the X-Men. Swiftly cleansing myself of the culinary endeavors, I prepared with a sense of anticipation and eagerness to partake in this evening of camaraderie. With measured haste, I arrived at the dining room, where a grand tableau awaited me, a constellation of remarkable individuals, each bearing the mark of an extraordinary journey, gathered around the table. They exuded a sense of kinship and shared purpose, their expectant gazes emanating an aura of welcoming warmth. Storm, you're late. Carito, well, I couldn't smell like a subway station. Nightcrawler, what is that supposed to mean? Carito, the chefs will tell you. Smile and takes a seat. As the chefs gracefully served the table, I couldn't help but feel a swell of pride and excitement. The dishes before us were my own creations, a culinary homage to my Puerto Rican heritage, crafted with care and a touch of my personal flair. The ambience of the dining room was aglow with a soft radiance of candlelight, setting the stage for a feast that held both cultural significance and heartfelt sentiment. With each lid carefully lifted by the skilled hands of the chefs, the delectable treasures hidden beneath were revealed like precious gems on display. 
my heart swelled with anticipation as I beheld the vibrant colors and enticing aromas that danced before us. Jubilee, what is this? Carito, let me all present you, my homeland's dishes, made by yours truly. Rogue, wait, you made this? Carito, I did the whole menu. Jubilee, what? Carito, now, the first meal I've prepared holds a special place in my heart. Allow me to introduce you to the tantalizing flavors of mofongo. This delightful dish is a cherished staple that graces the tables of Puerto Rican homes and restaurants alike. Picture this, a harmonious blend of mashed fried plantains infused with a generous dose of garlicky goodness, complemented by the delectable essence of chicharrons, crispy, fried pork skin. But fear not, for I have curated a medley of alternative combinations to suit everyone's palate. Traditionally served as a side dish alongside succulent pork or tender chicken, tonight, I've chosen to elevate mofongo to the grand stage, where it shall take the center spotlight as our main course. I considered each of your dietary preferences with utmost care, ensuring a splendid array of options to indulge in without hesitation. So, let your taste buds embark on this culinary adventure, where the warmth of Puerto Rican tradition and the artistry of my passion converge. May you savor every bite, for in this feast, we shall not only relish the flavors but also the shared experiences that unite us as a family of kindred spirits. As the X-Men beheld the spread before them, an air of anticipation enveloped the dining room. Their discerning eyes studied each dish with a keen appreciation for the culinary craftsmanship that had birthed this feast. The ambience was filled with a hushed reverence as if paying homage to the culinary treasures that graced the table. As the first forkfuls touched their palates, a symphony of flavors unfolded, a kaleidoscope of taste that seemed to defy earthly boundaries. Eyes widened in astonishment, and silent murmurs of delight trickled through the room. Each morsel appeared to transcend mortal expectations, as if crafted by the hands of divine culinary deities. The members of the X-Men, ensnared by the enchanting gustatory experience, lost themselves in the culinary ecstasy. Their expressions conveyed a mixture of amazement and delight, as they savored each bite with an almost reverential reverence. Whispers of disbelief and sheer satisfaction intermingled, giving voice to the indescribable joy ignited within their taste buds. Time seemed to stand still as the dining room became a haven of gastronomic bliss, where the boundaries between food and emotion blurred. The X-Men, captivated by the culinary magic woven by Carito, indulged in a culinary symphony that spoke to the deepest reaches of their souls. And yet, amid the rapturous silence, a curious realization dawned upon the atmosphere, the faint symphony of moans that punctuated the air. In a moment of light-hearted humor, the vibrant scene seemed to evoke the theatrical flair of food wars, where the culinary prowess evoked intense sensory responses. It was as if the taste sensations had reached a crescendo, coaxing forth spontaneous expressions of delight. Rogue, it's official. I'm in love. Jubilee, more than before. Kitty, same with me. Iceman, no wonder why you guys love him. I do now. Polaris, put me in line too. Sway, husband material right here ladies. As the evening's festivities unfolded with an air of elegance and sophistication, a curious shift in the atmosphere caught my attention. The room seemed to hold its breath, and an unspoken tension hung in the air, drawing my gaze toward the collective focus of the female guests. Their eyes, a light with intrigue and interest, were fixed upon me with an intensity that stirred a hint of curiosity within my soul. A chorus of hushed whispers seemed to ripple through the room, like a symphony of secrets being exchanged in silent eloquence. At that moment, I found myself at the center of their collective attention, a focal point of enigmatic interest. Questions swirled in my mind like celestial constellations, each one seeking an answer to the enigma that had captured the gaze of these remarkable women. Logan, well, Carito. You fucked up now. Carito, was it bad? Nightcrawler, bad? I'm in heaven. Carito, oh, that's a relief then. Smiles. A hushed aura of awe and fascination seemed to envelop the room as my presence cast a spell of magnetic allure upon those gathered. A palpable sense of reverence filled the air, and the other guests couldn't help but shield their eyes as if the very essence of my charisma emitted a radiant brilliance that defied direct gazing. Jubilee, girls. We must protect him at all costs girls. A graceful chorus of nods rippled through the gathering of distinguished women. Their gestures, executed with the poise of refined elegance, bespoke a shared understanding and agreement that transcended verbal communication. Storm, you have certainly impressed me, Carito. Carito, it's not over yet. In a mesmerizing display of synchronicity, the heads of the gathered company turned with seamless grace, akin to the elegant motion of owls surveying the world around them. 
as their gazes converged upon me. A sense of intrigue and wonder seemed to dance in their eyes, a captivating and somewhat intimidating spectacle. Xavier, oh? Is there dessert? Carito, why yeah, I think you'll all love it. With a graceful flourish, the chefs returned. In their hands, they carried a second plate, adorned with an exquisite drink, perfectly complemented by a carefully crafted beverage that exuded an air of sophistication. Carito, well, for refreshments I made something that is called pina colada. Cool off after an afternoon of sightseeing in the sun with a nice cold, frosty pina colada. The official drink of the island since 1978, these are served up just about anywhere, find them in bars, restaurants, and even roadside kiosks and order them with or without rum. It's refreshing either way and will hit the spot as you take it easy after your explorations. I put most of them without the rum but for you drinkers, I did you all a favor. Winks. Logan, appreciated. Carito, and now for the dessert. Flander queso, what is it? Flander queso is like caramel custard and a piece of cheesecake combined. The traditional Puerto Rican flan is made with simple ingredients like eggs, sugar, evaporated milk, condensed milk, and cream cheese. It's usually vanilla flavored and covered with homemade caramel sauce but you can find some variations of this popular sweet treat featuring other flavors including chocolate, coconut, and even Nutella. If a caramel sauce isn't your first choice, try it topped with fresh fruit and cream. The extras are gonna be placed right beside you and I also did the same here as I did with the mofongo. I switched the flavor depending on the person's preferences, even though it's the first time meeting most of you I did nail your preferences with the mofongo. So I hope you also like this one too. Smiles. Upon partaking in the first sip of the pina colada, an ecstatic symphony of gasps resonated through the room. The tropical elixir, crafted to perfection, evoked a chorus of moans and expressions of unadulterated pleasure as they savored the sweet nectar of paradise. Comically, some found themselves overpowered by the irresistible allure of the beverage, losing their equilibrium and tumbling off their seats in a display of light-hearted mirth. With their bearings restored, they cast their gaze upon the Flander Casso, a dessert so divine that it seemed to beckon from the realm of culinary heaven. An air of trepidation mingled with anticipation as they beheld this masterpiece of confectionery craftsmanship. The prospect of tasting something so exquisitely delectable was both thrilling and humbling, and the anticipation was palpable. Undeterred by the intensity of the previous culinary ecstasy, they eagerly indulged in the Flander Casso. Each bite, a revelation of flavors and textures, proved to be an enchanting journey into the heart of culinary artistry. Their taste buds danced in rapture, succumbing to the enchanting allure of this culinary masterpiece. The effect of this divine delicacy proved to be profound, as their eyes widened in awe, and their expressions softened in pure ecstasy. A state of euphoria descended upon them, transporting their senses to realms of indescribable delight. As they savored every morsel, they were taken on a journey that transcended the confines of reality, their senses enveloped in a blissful embrace. As the nights wore on, the symphony of culinary delights left an indelible impression, etching the memory of this extraordinary feast deep within their souls. The state of elation, a cherished gift from the culinary wonders before them, lingered long into the morning. Morning. In the tranquility of the early morning hours, words seemed to elude me, unable to encapsulate the essence of the moment. As dawn graced the X-Men, their radiant smiles and heartfelt requests beckoned me to craft a morning repast. Surrendering to their genuine enthusiasm, I prepared a simple yet satisfying breakfast of pancakes, bacon, and eggs, my culinary prowess ensuring that even in my modest endeavor, their pleasure would be assured. The gratifying response, despite my modest efforts, affirmed the potency of my culinary skill, leaving me appreciative of the ability to bring delights to those I cherish. Amidst the camaraderie, laughter, and light-hearted banter, the interactions between the girls emerged as an intriguing blend of flirtation and jest. For reasons unbeknownst to me, Storm playfully alluded to her marriage to Black Panther, an exchange that left me uncertain of her intentions. Grateful for the camaraderie and friendship shared among the X-Men, I navigated the charmingly chaotic antics of the male members, engaging in gaming and light-hearted pranks, each endeavor met with scolding and chuckles. However, amidst the camaraderie and laughter, the girls' persistently flirtatious gestures took on an increasingly vexing aspect. Unsure of the source of their affectionate attention, I found myself questioning the origins of their allure. Were their actions inspired by some hidden charm skill I unknowingly possessed? The ambiguity surrounding their intentions left me both amused and bewildered. Yet, in the tapestry of this memorable day, the pleasant moments eclipsed the minor inconveniences. 
I found solace in the friendships forged, the laughter shared, and the sense of belonging within this remarkable community of heroes. Thus, as the sun set on this eventful day, I found myself content, embracing the joy that lingered in my heart. New York City. 11 p.m. As the hour drew nigh, a summons from Logan beckoned me to his side, a proposition I readily embraced. Arriving at a picturesque valley, a serene expanse of nature before me, Logan stood, donning a rugged coat that seemed to embody the spirit of the untamed wilderness. The setting sun cast a warm glow upon the landscape, its rays caressing the earth with a gentle touch. Carito, oh hey, Logan. Logan, sup bub, this won't take long don't worry. Carito, I'm not worried about that, what I am worried about is what we are doing. Logan, need your help with something, like I said, figured I could count on you as you said. Carito, well, yeah, of course. But if we are gonna do something I would like to plan things out you know? If it's a hangout there are a couple of places that I know where they serve good drinks and stuff. Logan, well, if you think what you have in mind is better than my idea then go ahead. Carito, well, we can go to my home country from here. I promise you that I know some good places. Logan, you going to open that portal of yours? Carito, well, yeah. It's confusing but I can hack the atoms and form a wormhole to a different location of my choosing. It's kinda complicated to explain. Logan, don't talk all science with me. It gives me a migraine. Carito, alright, I know how you roll so I'll take us to a bar with good drinks and good food. Logan, alright if you're so confident about it. Carito, yes. Alright, let's go to Old San Juan then. Logan, old what? Carito, it's a famous tourist area. Focuses and opens the portal let's go. Walks in. Logan, okay, follows. As our surroundings shifted and materialized around us, the teleportation whisked us to an unexpected locale within a vibrant disco nestled within the historic confines of Old San Juan. With a quizzical expression etched upon Logan's weathered visage, it was apparent that the unusual destination had sparked curiosity and confusion alike. Instead of finding ourselves at the anticipated entrance of the lively establishment, the whims of teleportation had led us to a seemingly mundane yet crucial area, the bathrooms. Logan, I thought I was promised a good time in a bar not in a bathroom. Carito, I had to sneak my way inside here, it's packed most of the time. Logan, wait where are we? I hear intense music. Carito, well, my friend. Welcome to Industry Club, bar. Here you will hear intense music, people dancing, and good drinks in the bar. They are pretty organized here. Gently janks a wristband from two people. Logan, did you just? Carito. It's pay to enter here. And I just happened to take two of the VIPs here. Smirks don't worry no one will notice. Logan, you are one big troublemaker, huh? Smirks. Carito, if it's to have fun? You bet your ass. Now, let's party shall we? In the midst of the vibrant disco's pulsating ambience, Logan and I found ourselves seated at the bar, ready to embark on an adventure of libations and merriment. With an air of playful competition, I beckoned the bartender to present their finest concoctions for the both of us. The bartender, evidently intrigued by the prospect of a drinking challenge, seized the opportunity to liven up the atmosphere and denounced the impromptu contest to the delight of the crowd. As the shots were lined up before us, the countdown ensued, and the revelry commenced. I, with the grace of a seasoned connoisseur, deftly imbibed each shot while my comrade Logan, bless his heart, found himself somewhat overwhelmed by the relentless barrage of spirits. But fear not, for even as Logan temporarily succumbed to the intoxicating effects, his indomitable healing factor ensured a swift recovery, reminiscent of the mythical phoenix rising from the ashes. The drinking feats were followed by a veritable feast fit for Epicurean royalty. Plates piled high with delectable delights graced our table, and we devoured the sumptuous spread with unbridled delight. Yet, little did I anticipate that my insatiable appetite would culminate in an astronomical bill, one I shall diplomatically refrain from discussing further. And then, oh, then came the moment of reckoning. The rhythmic rigat and beats enveloped the dancer floor, beckoning all to partake in the spirited para o oh, dance. With a twinkle in my eye, I introduced Logan to the dancer's sensuous charms, naively assuming he'd find amusement in the cultural expression. Alas, my misguided explanation led to a rather memorable yet awkward moment as Logan, in true Wolverine fashion, embraced the dance with a gusto that might have veered toward personal interpretation. As the nights wore on, 
the party reached its zenith, and Logan, true to his nature, found his own private escapades, leaving me to reflect on the underlying reason for this grand celebration. Ah, yes, indeed, it was Logan's birthday, an occasion deserving of unbridled revelry and camaraderie. So, here's to my dear friend and the memories forged on this extraordinary night, where laughter, libations, and dancing united us in a symphony of celebration. Carito, Myra, Wo, I, bro. Bartender, Gapaza, Pa, what's up, brother? Carito, Hastel Major Posa K Tengen, Porfa. El amigo Mayo Gringo Cumple Hoy. Make me the best dessert you have, please. My American friend's birthday is today. Bartender, Dale, Pa, Slomando a Pedarora. All right, bro. I'll get it ordered now. Carito, Dalemano, Gracias. All right, bro, thanks. As the clock struck past midnight, marking the culmination of Logan's birthday, I sat at the table adorned with a sumptuous array of Michelof beers, patiently awaiting the arrival of the Pista de Resistance, the birthday cake specially ordered for this occasion. Time, of course, is but a fleeting notion, for what truly matters lies in the heartfelt sentiments that transcend the constraints of temporal boundaries. A few minutes later, as the lustrous cake graced the table with a gentle flourish, a small contingent of close companions gathered around, their voices harmonizing in anticipation of a cherished tradition, the celebration of Logan's birthday. As the strains of happy birthday awaited release, I gestured to the group, signaling for them to accompany me on a brief journey to the secluded alcove that had been generously provided to us, a gesture of appreciation for my previous libation-laden feet, which had garnered acclaim from all present. With utmost delicacy, I tapped on the door of the private chamber, awaiting the emergence of its enigmatic occupant. Carito, Knox Logan is, Carito. Are you in clothes? Logan, I'm now. Girls, get your clothes on. Amidst the jovial ambience, a pair of mischievous giggles resonated in the air, underscoring the revelry that had transpired in the privacy of the secluded chamber. Logan, true to his legendary reputation, had indeed found delight in the company of the fairer sex. Logan, you can enter now. With an air of jubilation and shared anticipation, our assembled group surged forward, traversing the threshold of the private chamber with a harmonious fervor. An effervescent energy enveloped the room, tinged with the resonant melodies of joy and celebration. With a concerted effort, the door swung open, ushering us into the intimate sanctum. As the rhapsody of harmonious voices swirled in the air, the chorus of well wishes cascaded in both English and Spanish, a symphony of heartfelt sentiments woven together in a tapestry of multicultural unity. In a fitting tableau, the birthday cake, an emblem of this festive occasion, was gently placed upon a small table, positioned within proximity to Logan's presence. The flickering candlelight atop the confectionery centerpiece mirrored the radiant spirit of camaraderie and warmth that permeated the room. In the midst of the collective tribute, Logan's reaction was a study in astonishment. His countenance, usually a bastion of unyielding resolve, was temporarily disarmed, rendered speechless by the unexpected outpouring of affection and goodwill. Though known for his gruff demeanor, the expression etched upon his face now betrayed a touch of vulnerability, as the genuine sentiments of the moment washed over him. Carito, happy birthday, my friend. Smiles. Logan, do you know how long it has been since I had a happy birthday song? Carito, a very long time. Logan, thank you. Carito, for what? Logan, for being my friend. Genuine smile. As the dancing flames succumbed to the gentle breath of the celebrated soul, Logan gracefully extinguished the candles, marking the culmination of his birthday ritual. Applause erupted, cascading through the room like a harmonious cascade, reverberating in appreciation of the momentous occasion. The room gradually emptied, leaving behind a tranquil ambience that was subtly enriched by the lingering glow of camaraderie. As the others dispersed to their respective pursuits, it eventually boiled down to just Logan and me, relishing the remaining minutes of this cherished celebration. Yet, I couldn't resist the temptation to playfully taunt my venerable friend, and so, with an impish glint in my eye, I continued clapping, a sly grin dancing upon my lips. The mere suggestion of prolonging the applause elicited an amused expression from Logan his signature resilience underpinned by an unmistakable flicker of amusement. Carito, congratulations. The next day. Afternoon. As the sun reached its zenith, casting a golden hue upon the landscape, I found myself once again in the presence of the X-Men. The afternoon air hummed with a sense of serenity, and the world seemed to hold its breath, awaiting the next chapter in our intertwined destinies. In the heart of the Xavier School, amidst the verdant beauty of nature, 
We gathered for a final embrace. A bittersweet air enveloped the moment, for I knew that the time had come to bid my beloved comrades farewell. Carito, I. Had a lot of fun here. Thank you for your hospitality. Xavier, any time, Carito. You are always welcome here. Scott, he's right you know, you're always welcome here. Jubilee, crying why do you have to leave? Wah. Kitty, crying as well I know right? Wah -wah. Rogue, I it's not like I'm gonna miss you or anything. HMPH. Jean, please come back any time you want, Carito. Cook for us again. Logan, thanks for everything, my friend. As the moment of departure drew near, the X-Men gathered round, each bidding me their heartfelt farewell. Their voices resonated with a mixture of fondness and melancholy. Amidst the tapestry of emotions, a sense of camaraderie prevailed, unifying us in the face of inevitable parting. The X-Men, both men, and women, enveloped me in their embraces, a cacophony of affectionate hugs and heartfelt words. The ladies, in particular, exhibited an exuberant display of their affections, their enthusiasm almost overwhelming in its intensity. I found myself ensnared in their warm embraces, a sea of laughter and camaraderie encircling us. Carito, I'll come again, next time. Smiles. The farewell was heartfelt, and as I stepped into the portal that bridged the realms, the X-Men bid me their warm adieus with waves and smiles. With each wave of their hands, the memories of our time together replayed in my mind like a cherished film, leaving an indelible impression on my soul. As the portal transported me across the dimensions, I traversed the ethereal pathways that connected our worlds, guided by the enigmatic forces of existence. Moments later, the shimmering portal dissipated, leaving me standing firmly within the Avengers facility, the very place I had departed from. The transition was seamless as if I had never left, and yet, the experience with the X-Men felt like an extraordinary dream, vivid and unforgettable. As I walked into the facility, I found myself amidst the familiar presence of the Avengers. Each of them stood in the hallway, a tableau of strength and unity, their presence resonating with an air of purpose and determination. Steve, Carito, you're back. Are you okay? Tony, for a moment I thought you disappeared on us. Vision, welcome back, Carito. Hawkeye, sup, Spider. Sam, don't go running off like that man. You promised me a tripleter from your home country. Wonder, I thought my favorite chef was leaving. What a relief. Ready, sup, bro. Good to see you. Pietro, sup. I decided to drop by for a bit before continuing my adventure. Natasha, hey, Carito. How are you? At that moment, an inundation of questions and sentences cascaded toward me like a torrential downpour of words. The sheer volume of inquiries and remarks left me momentarily dumbfounded, my mind seemingly overwhelmed and struggling to keep pace with the barrage of information. In the midst of this verbal deluge, my brain seemed to adopt a curious lethargy, as if it had decided to selectively tune out certain portions of the incoming torrent. It was as though an instinctual self-preservation mechanism kicked in, prioritizing the most vital details while allowing others to drift into the background like distant echoes. Natasha, hey. Wanda and I are sorry for the conversation two days ago. Wanda, yeah, sorry. Tony, what do you mean? Clarito, trade secret. Tony, Ark. Natasha, ah. You okay? Lost in a profound state of introspection, I weighed the question carefully. Finally, I found my voice and offered a thoughtful response. The room fell silent, awaiting my words with bated breath. At that moment, the power of human communication and connection became palpable. Clarito, yeah, I think I'm okay. Civil War is coming. Chapter 22, Civil War Part 1 Marvel DC, Images, Manhus, and every anime that will be mentioned and used in this story are not mine. They all belong to their respective owners. The main character carried to Josue Valdez and the story are mine. No poff. Location, Lagos. Present day. In the vicinity of a quaint cafeteria, Wanda Maximoff, known as the enigmatic Scarlet Witch, found herself engaged in a seemingly ordinary act, delicately sprinkling sugar into her coffee. Yet, Beneath the guise of her casual demeanor, her mind was veiled with an air of intrigue, for she believed herself to be concealed from prying eyes. Her companion, Carito, took it upon himself to amuse himself at her expense, playfully jesting about her supposed disguise. The light-hearted banter persisted for hours, with the gentle mockery serving as a source of entertainment. However, the jesting reached its limit when Captain America intervened, quelling Carito's teasing with a gentle yet authoritative gesture a resolute reminder of the decorum expected of a team on a mission. 
Unfazed by the playful taunts that had subsided, Wanda embraced her role in the mission at hand. With unwavering focus, she assumed the duty of surveillance. Her keen senses attuned to every minute detail in her surroundings. Like a spectral guardian, she surveyed the area, ever watchful for signs of potential threats or clues that might lead the team closer to their objective. Captain America, on radio all right what do you see? Scarlet Witch, Standard Beat Cops. Spider-Man, they eating sugar donuts and chocolate? Or was it coffee? Scarlet Witch, yes. Spider-Man, bruh. Scarlet Witch, anyways, I see a small station. Quiet Street. It's a good target. Rooftops. Spider-Man, there's an ATM on the south corner. There's gonna be cameras. Captain America, on radio both cross streets are one way. Scarlet Witch, on radio so, compromised escape routes. Spider-Man, MHM, means Mr. Bones will go ape shit and doesn't care if he's on top 10 videos on YouTube. Captain America, on Radio Wonder, do you see that Range Rover halfway up the block? Scarlet Witch, on Radio Yeah, the red one? It's cute. Black Widow, on Radio Yeah, it's also bulletproof. This means private security which means more guns. Which means more headaches for somebody. Probably us. Spider-Man, PFFF, we can take it. Literally, we have dealt with worse. Scarlet Witch, on Radio Carito ain't wrong. You still remember I can move things with my mind right? Black Widow, on radio looking over your shoulder needs to become second nature. Spider-Man, one of my powers is literally that. Black Widow, on radio that sixth sense is unfair. Falcon, he walks beside Spider-Man anybody ever tells you you're a little paranoid? Black Widow, on radio not to my face. Why, did you hear something? Captain America, on radio eye on target, folks. This is the best lead we've had on Ramelo in six months and I don't want to lose him. Spider-Man, even if he sees us coming that won't be a problem. Right, Falcon? Falcon, hell yeah. Though, he does kind of hate us. Amidst the bustling chaos of the urban thoroughfare, an incongruous sight unfolded, a colossal garbages truck, its towering frame laden with an immense burden of refuse, became an unyielding force, relentlessly bulldozing its way through the congested traffic. Unperturbed by the cacophony of honking horns and screeching tires, it continued its ominous path, indifferent to the havoc it wrought upon the hapless vehicles in its wake. Captain America, on Radio Sam, Carito, see the garbage's truck? Spider-Man, damn, someone forgot to take their chill pills. Captain America, on Radio Sam, tag it. In response to the unfolding chaos, Falcon, with an air of calculated resolve, dispatches his trusted companion, Red Wing, to venture into the heart of the turmoil. Red Wing, an embodiment of advanced technology and sentient artifice, navigates with deftness through the tumultuous traffic to approach the colossal garbage's truck, poised to unveil the enigma concealed within. With Falcon's guidance, Red Wing initiates a sophisticated X-ray scan, penetrating the metallic confines of the gargantuan vehicle. Its ethereal sensors adeptly penetrate through layers of refuse, unveiling the innermost secrets of the truck. The digital tableau of the scan materializes before Falcon's eyes, displaying a visual tapestry that reveals the truck's secrets. The scan, a masterpiece of technologic ingenuity, divulges that the garbage truck is burdened to its very limits, laden with an insurmountable weight of discarded debris. However, to Falcon's surprise, there is only one solitary occupant confined within rendering the dire situation even more perplexing. The figure inside appears apprehensive, their demeanor fraught with a mixture of anxiety and tension. The juxtaposition of the gargantuan truck's immense mass and the singular presence of this anxious soul seems paradoxical, entangling Falcon's mind in a web of intrigue. Falcon, the truck's loaded for max weight. The driver's armed. Spider-Man, he's gonna use it as a battering ram. Captain America, on radio go now. Scarlet Witch, on radio what? With remarkable grace and precision, Spider-Man and Falcon initiated their aerial voyage, transcending the confines of solid ground to embrace the boundless expanse above. Falcon's mastery of flight, enabled him to navigate the open skies with unparalleled finesse, while Spider-Man's web-swinging prowess allowed him to traverse the urban landscape in a seamless dance of agility and speed. Captain America, he's not hitting the police. In the hallowed halls of the Institute of Infectious Diseases, the sentry at the imposing gate stood resolute, though weariness etched lines upon his face. Abruptly, a clamor reached his ears from the right, prompting him to turn and ascertain its source. To his disbelief, 
a thunderous garbage truck hurtled recklessly towards the entrance, its driver fleeing in a panic. Fear surged through the guard, compelling him to retreat to safety. In an explosive display of chaos, the monstrous vehicle crashed through the gate, flipping over in a devastating spectacle that obliterated its intended target. Following the turmoil, two sinister yellow trucks swiftly exploited the breach created by the demolished garbage's truck, stealthily infiltrating the Institute's grounds. As they came to a halt, a cadre of heavily armed men emerged, led by the notorious Crossbones. Their malevolent intent was clear as they began unleashing a barrage of gunfire upon any hapless soldiers who dared to cross their path. Inside the beleaguered building, the enemy contingent coldly executed their sinister strategy. By unleashing toxic gas from their grenade launches, they forced the soldiers and scientists to succumb to uncontrollable bouts of coughing and gasping for breath. The once secure confines of the Institute were now a battlefield, teeming with the suffocating fumes of their malevolence. However, in the face of such treachery, hope emerged from the heavens. From the skies descended Captain America and Spider-Man, gracefully guided by the heroic Falcon. Captain America launched into action with unwavering resolve, deftly wielding his iconic shield to incapacitate one adversary after another. With precision and strength, he neutralized foes with swift, shield-propelled strikes. Meanwhile, Spider-Man displayed acrobatic prowess and quick thinking toppling another villain by ingeniously deploying his web to topple the menacing truck upon the unfortunate thief. As the enemy ranks sought to retaliate with gunfire, Captain America's shield once again became an instrument of justice, dispatching multiple threats with uncanny accuracy. Amidst the chaos, one last adversary persisted, barely standing after a fierce blow from Captain America's shield. Seizing the moment, Spider-Man expertly ensnared the dazed foe with his web, propelling himself towards the enemy and delivering a stunning drop kick that secured their fate against a cement wall. Captain America, Body Armor, AR-15s. I make seven hostiles. Gracefully maneuvering through the air, Falcon executed calculated aerial circles around the vicinity before ascending to the rooftop. There, with a deft command of his winged apparatus, he expertly shielded himself from the onslaught of incoming fire. Closing in on his adversaries with precision and swiftness, he launched a formidable dual kick that met the faces of both foes with an unyielding force, rendering them incapacitated in an instant. A third adversary, undeterred by the swift defeat of his companions, attempted to retaliate with a desperate shot from his firearm. However, Falcon's reaction time surpassed all expectations, leaving the assailant's futile attempt futile, as the hero swiftly drew his Uzi and unleashed a barrage of well-aimed shots. The impact was merciless, and the would-be attacker crumpled to the ground, the sound of his defeat echoing as he collapsed onto an adjacent truck. Falcon, I make five. With an ethereal grace, Scarlet Witch harnessed her mystical powers, defying gravity itself as she effortlessly levitated through the air, arriving at the scene with astonishing alacrity. In her keen sight, she identified an enemy lurking in cover, and without hesitation, she unleashed her formidable assault upon him. The malevolent hail of bullets met an invisible, impenetrable barrier woven by her potent abilities, thwarting the lethal projectiles with an almost disdainful ease. In a seamless display of telekinesis, she beckoned the foe towards her, his resistance futile against the unseen force compelling him. As the unfortunate adversary was drawn closer, his fate sealed by the mesmerizing prowess of the Scarlet Witch, Falcon emerged at her side with agile swiftness, ready to lend his unwavering support to their shared cause. Falcon, 4 Faultlessly and with the precision of a master tactician, Red Wing initiated a rapid and thorough surveillance of the entire edifice, tirelessly scouring each nook and cranny in pursuit of its noble guardian, Falcon. Its sensors meticulously scanned the structure, leaving no shadow or concealed passage unexplored. Like an aerial virtuoso, Red Wing gracefully navigated the airspace around the building, its form gliding effortlessly with an innate understanding of its mission. Falcon, Rumelos on the third floor. Captain America, Spider-Man I need a boost. Spider-Man, sure, I can yeet you from here, grabs Captain back with his wall-crawling skill. Scarlet Witch, what about the gas? Captain America, get it out. In a display of unparalleled agility and cooperation, Spider-Man and Captain America flawlessly executed a tactical maneuver. As if choreographed with the finesse of a ballet, Spider-Man propelled Captain America to the third floor with astonishing precision. There. The nimble web slinger employed his stealth prowess to devastating effect, ambushing an adversary by deftly relieving him of his mask before effortlessly propelling him into a nearby wall with a powerful back kick. Ever the acrobatic virtuoso, Spider-Man ascended to the third floor with unrivaled ease. 
his detoxification skills affording him unmatched resilience against any challenges that lay in wait. Meanwhile, amidst the intricate labyrinth of hallways and chambers, a formidable foe named Drumlow led his well-trained cadre of soldiers. Their purpose was relentless, as they sought to penetrate the secrets hidden within the secured confines of the third floor. In a remarkable display of brute force, Romulo's mechanical arm forcefully shattered a bulletproof glass door, granting them access to the coveted area. Steely determination gleamed in his eyes as he methodically inspected the surroundings, his soldiers poised and ready to execute his commands with unwavering precision. Discovering an area of paramount significance, Romulo acted with ruthless efficiency, wasting no time. He hastened to unlock the enigmatic chamber, revealing a chilling sight, a biohazard of potentially cataclysmic consequences. Crossbones, pack it up. In the midst of the frenetics battle, the seamless coordination between Spider-Man and Captain America was nothing short of a mesmerizing display of martial prowess. Faced with the relentless assault of Crossbones's soldiers, Captain America's legendary shield, a symbol of unwavering resolve, was wielded with masterful finesse. In a feat that defied the ordinary, the vibranium disc ricocheted with near-mystical precision, rebounding off the walls with uncanny accuracy to deliver an unerring blow to one of the assailants, leaving him incapacitated with a swift strike to the head. Seizing upon this opportune distraction, Spider-Man, ever the acrobatic virtuoso, fluidly intervened with a lightning-quick response. With unparalleled dexterity, he ensnared the disoriented soldier's face with his ingenious webbing, yanking the unfortunate foe downward with controlled force, leaving him sprawled upon the unforgiving floor with a resounding thud. Meanwhile, as the second adversary sought to exploit Spider-Man's blind spot, the arachnid hero's preternatural senses were far from fooled. Evading the sneak attack with a graceful duck, Spider-Man seized the opportunity to turn the tables on his assailant. In a jaw-dropping display of strength, he firmly grasped the man's leg and utilized his remarkable agility to propel him into a nearby cement pillar with bone-crushing impact, leaving the pillar shattered in his wake. Amidst this breathtaking spectacle, Scarlet Witch, a force to be reckoned with, employed her mystical gifts to counter the deadly threat of toxic gas that had encroached upon the scene. Her powers swirled with another worldly grace, expertly dispelling the hazardous fumes, thereby ensuring the safety of her comrades. Ever the sentinel of the skies, Falcon fearlessly guarded her back, engaging in a deft aerial ballet with three formidable adversaries. Swiftly calculating his approach, he unleashed a measured assault, launching two precisely targeted missiles that found their mark with unerring accuracy, rapidly neutralizing the threats that dared challenge them. Meanwhile, Crossbones, a malevolent figure cloaked in darkness, observed the unfolding tableau from the vantage point of a balcony, his calculating eyes surveying the scene with a sinister gaze. Crossbones, TCH, they're here. With seamless precision, Crossbones and his formidable team executed a daring maneuver, employing a zipline with the deftness of skilled acrobats, facilitating their rapid exodus to the awaiting escape vehicle. Like a shadowy symphony of synchronized movements, their escape plan unfolded flawlessly, leaving no room for error. Within the fortified confines of the facility, the stalwart duo of Captain America and Spider Man immersed themselves in the task at hand with unyielding determination. Methodically combing through the aftermath of Crossbones's intrusion, they embarked on a meticulous investigation, keenly aware of the significance of their discovery. Each detail uncovered revealed a glimpse into the mind of the villainous Rumlow, and they discerned the magnitude of what he had pilfered. Recognizing the urgency of the situation, they promptly relayed their findings, deploying their unwavering commitment to justice as they swiftly transmitted their report. Captain America, Rumlow has a biological weapon. Black Widow on radio I'm on it. In a breathtaking display of finesse and agility, Black Widow emerged on the scene, astride her sleek motorcycle, like a masterful conductor orchestrating an intricate symphony of combat. The enemy's escape vehicles loomed before her, a formidable obstacle that she was determined to overcome. With the steely precision of a seasoned warrior, Black Widow anticipated the adversary's desperate attempt to hinder her advance. Swiftly transforming her motorcycle into a weapon, she deftly maneuvered it with exquisite control, sliding it down with exacting accuracy onto the soldier's foot, leaving him incapacitated and helpless in her wake. Amidst the confusion she caused, her movements were a mesmerizing blur of combat finesse. Employing a taser with calculated precision, she neutralized another opponent with an electrifying jolt. Her unparalleled combat skills were on full display as she tackled and drop-kicked adversaries with a dance-like grace, each move executed with lethal intent. The confrontation escalated as more adversaries attempted to challenge her, but Black Widow, like a martial artist in perfect harmony with her surroundings, artfully countered their every move. 
a judo throw brought one assailant to the ground, a well-timed evasion allowed her to avoid another's attack, and a series of devastating strikes incapacitated those who dared oppose her. Yet, her triumph was short-lived, as an unforeseen adversary revealed himself. Crossbones, a formidable and relentless foe, launched a surprise attack, seizing her by the hair with brute force. Despite the adversity, Black Widow remained resolute, using her elbows as a formidable defense to break free from his grip. However, her usual tactics seemed to falter against this indomitable adversary, as her electrifying bracelet, a trusty ally in past battles, proved ineffective against his formidable resilience. Crossbones, I don't work like that no more. In a swift and ruthless act, the assailant forcefully propelled her, her body colliding with the truck's unyielding surface in a grim display of force. With a chilling determination, he proceeded to introduce chaos into the equation, brandishing a lethal grenade, and with calculated precision, he hurled it inside the vehicle, where two of his accomplices awaited, poised to unleash further devastation. Crossbones, fire in the hole. In a breathless display of combat prowess, she swiftly executed a masterful kick, propelling one of her mercenaries into the unforgiving walls of a bus. With an astute awareness of her surroundings, she deftly seized the second mercenary, employing him as an improvised shield against the impending threat. The ensuing explosion from the grenade cast her violently from the vehicle, leaving her grappling with pain as she coughed and fought to regain her composure. On an adjacent balcony, the stalwart duo of Captain America and Spider-Man arrived, poised to intervene with resolute determination. However, their valor was met with a relentless barrage of explosive rounds from a turret, causing them to dive for cover. With remarkable agility, Spider-Man wielded his webbing as a lifeline, thwarting the first bullet with unparalleled dexterity. But Crossbones, determined and unrelenting, continued his ruthless assault, driving them both to seek refuge down the narrow corridor. The heroically swift Spider-Man raced ahead, his uncanny speed distinguishing him from the captain's more measured stride. Meanwhile, the vehicle commandeered by Crossbones lurched into motion, its menacing presence a constant reminder of the perilous battle being waged within the facility's confines. The relentless onslaught of firepower from Crossbones' weapon kept the heroes pinned down, their every move marked by a tense struggle for survival. In an audacious bid to outmaneuver the onslaught, Spider-Man leapt from the balcony a breathtaking display of agility as he nimbly dodged the explosive rounds. However, the unyielding hand of fate was less forgiving to Captain America, as the indomitable hero was tragically sent hurtling to the ground. Spider-Man, damn, got hit by three different things. You good, Steve? Captain America, NGH. I'm good. Spider-Man, Sam. He's in an AFV heading north. I'll be right there with Captain. Within the confines of the ominous vehicle, where the malevolent villains conspired in shadows, Crossbones assumed a position of grave authority. His calculating gaze, a testament to his sinister intent, fell upon the insidious bioweapon of unimaginable consequences. With methodical precision, he encased the malevolent agent within a secure container, carefully shielding the world from its devastating potency. Having completed this ominous task, Crossbones entrusted the volatile package to one of his mercenaries, a dutiful pawn in this nefarious game. Crossbones, take this to the airstrip. We're not gonna outrun them. Lose the truck. With a reckless disregard for order and control, the driver careened into a diminutive open plaza, the screeching tires a dissonant symphony of chaos. As the vehicle came to an abrupt halt, its occupants were suddenly set adrift in this confined urban expanse, their actions now unfettered by the constraints of their prior containment. Mercenary, where are you going to meet us? Crossbones, I'm not, cocks his metallic arms. Amidst the urban expanse, Falcon descended upon the plaza with a grace that bespoke mastery of the skies. Adorned with his enigmatic goggles, the epitome of cutting-edge technology, he assumed a vigilant stance, surveying his surroundings with a keen eye for detail. Falcon, I've got four, they're splitting up. In a seamless display of coordination and swiftness, the formidable duo of Black Widow and Spider-Man infiltrated the scene with a captivating grace that bespoke their consummate expertise. Their entry into the unfolding tableau was nothing short of a masterful display of tactical prowess, each movement executed with a precision that left onlookers in awe. Black Widow, I got the two on the left. Start sprinting. Spider-Man, hey, they ditched their gear. Captain America, just arrives it's a shell game now, one of them has the payload. Spider-Man's keen senses tingled with forewarning, alerting him to the imminent peril that loomed in the shadows. Swiftly assessing the situation, he beheld a sinister trap, as a malevolent assailant surreptitiously affixed a lethal grenade to Captain America's iconic shield. 
with a reflex honed through arduous training and relentless commitment to protect his comrades. Captain America acted decisively, discharging the shield into the air before it could trigger a cataclysmic explosion. The ensuing blast echoed through the air, a potent reminder of the treacherous game being played by their adversaries. In the tumultuous aftermath, Crossbones, the embodiment of menace, materialized before them, his nefarious intentions unmistakable. A clash of titanic proportions loomed, and Spider-Man, his extraordinary speed and dexterity at the ready, stood as the vanguard of defense for Captain America. As the malevolent force charged forward, Spider-Man, with a prowess that defied his youth, intercepted Crossbones's punch with a calculated grace, halting the blow before it could reach its intended target. In a stunning display of strength, he deftly utilized his uncanny agility to redirect the assailant's momentum, hurtling him through the air and into an unfortunate stand, which crumpled under the force of the impact. Spider-Man, gotcha, bitch. Crossbones, fuck, not you again. Spider-Man, go and look for the others, I'll handle him. Captain America, all right, be careful. With an indomitable spirit, Captain America bolted away, evading Crossbones' deadly punch with a fluid grace that bore the hallmark of his relentless determination. Meanwhile, Spider-Man, the acrobatic virtuoso, countered Crossbones' aggression with an agile front kick, the force of impact shattering a nearby table, epitomizing the raw power contained within his lithe frame. Embodying the essence of unwavering unity, Falcon and Captain America surged forth in seamless coordination, the indomitable alliance of their camaraderie evident in each calculated move. As they confronted the two adversaries on the right, their practiced maneuvers unfolded with a balletic precision, leaving the opponents swiftly incapacitated before they had time to comprehend the swiftness of their defeat. With a methodical diligence, they thoroughly searched the subdued adversaries for any trace of the elusive weapon. Yet, the pursuit proved fruitless, as none among them bore the malevolent artifact they sought. Falcon, he doesn't have it. Captain America, neither does this one, Nat. In a display of extraordinary athleticism and precision, Black Widow became an agile enigma, her movements a symphony of fluidity and finesse as she deftly navigated the plaza with breathtaking Parker prowess. Urgently, she beckoned the bystanders to make way, sparing them from the imminent clash that unfolded before their eyes. Her unwavering pursuit brought her in close proximity to her quarry, and with a lightning-quick leap, she vaulted onto a nearby table, closing the distance between them in a heartbeat. With fearless determination, she tackled the man to the ground, his gun brandished as a futile defense against her relentless assault. In a whirlwind of combat, Black Widow exhibited a dazzling array of combat techniques, her strikes calibrated with lethal accuracy. With a measured finesse, she incapacitated the first assailant, landing precise blows upon his throat and chest, leaving him gasping for breath and powerless to retaliate. As the unfolding skirmish gained momentum, another adversary emerged from the shadows, but Black Widow's tactical ingenuity was unwavering. With a swift improvisation, she seized a nearby wooden bag, hurling it with surgical precision to momentarily obscure the second assailant's vision. Capitalizing on the opportune distraction, she launched a deft attack on his leg, causing him to stumble and falter in his pursuit. Faced with the revived adversary she had previously subdued, Black Widow relied on her extraordinary agility, gracefully twisting Madeira in a fluid wrestling move that enabled her to seize the second assailant and incapacitate both foes with a powerful throw to the ground. Undaunted by the intensifying stakes, she displayed unyielding poise as she deftly grabbed a gun, her adversaries mirroring her actions with equal resolve. In this tense standoff, the plaza bore witness to a battle of wills and nerve, as both Black Widow and her adversary were poised to make their next move, their fingers hovering over the precipice of action, awaiting the decisive moment that would dictate the course of this riveting confrontation. Mercenary, drop it, holding the bio eapons or I drop this. Black Widow. Mercenary, do it. Mercenary too, he'll do it. In a moment of unforeseen intervention, Red Wing swooped in with calculated precision, unleashing a devastating shot from behind that met its mark with unfaltering accuracy, neutralizing the first mercenary with a lethal strike. Concurrently, Black Widow, a paragon of unwavering poise, wielded her weapon with an artful grace that reflected her honed expertise. Her keen senses and lightning-fast reflexes were her allies as she unleashed a precisely aimed shot, dispatching the second assailant with unyielding determination. With the bio eapon precariously airborne, the stakes intensified to an alarming crescendo. In this pivotal moment, Black Widow demonstrated a superlative feat of agility and coordination. Like a balletic marvel, she contorted her body with astounding dexterity, twisting through the air with a captivating fluidity that belied the gravity of the situation. The bio eapon, 
teetering on the precipice of calamity, seemed momentarily suspended in time as Black Widow's deft hands seized upon it with unwavering resolve. In a breathtaking display of acrobatic prowess, she intercepted the perilous cargo, snatching it from its precarious trajectory before it could meet the ground and unleash its malevolent payload. Black Widow, payload secure. Thanks, Sam. Falcon, don't thank me. Black Widow, I'm not thanking that thing. Falcon, his name is Red Wing. Black Widow, I'm still not thanking it. Falcon, he's cute. Go ahead, pet him. Amidst the bustling expanse of the plaza, an enthralling spectacle unfolded, as Spider-Man and Crossbones engaged in a tumultuous duel that bore all the hallmarks of a virtuoso performance. However, to the discerning eye, it was evident that this was no equal contest, for Spider-Man's agile finesse and tactical acumen rendered it a one-sided beatdown. Crossbones, a force of unbridled aggression, hurled relentless blows at his nimble adversary, intent on breaking through his defenses. Yet, each attempt found itself thwarted by Spider-Man's preternatural reflexes and uncanny ability to anticipate every move. The web-slinger's lithe form, a tapestry of fluid motion, gracefully evaded and countered each of Crossbones's ferocious assaults. With an air of unwavering confidence, Spider-Man taunted his adversary. Spider-Man, never gonna give you up, Tilda. Duck's never gonna let you down, Tilda. Block's never gonna run around, Tilda. Turns on camouflage. Crossbones, where are you, clown? Spider-Man, and desert you Tilda, flying kicks Crossbones to the face. Amidst the dynamic turmoil of the plaza, Crossbones, bearing the physical toll of his relentless confrontation, found himself colliding with yet another stand. The resonant impact reverberated through the air, a poignant echo of the intense clash that had unfolded thus far. Spider-Man, never gonna make you cry Tilda, slaps Crossbone on the face. Crossbones, NGHHHH, about to blow a fuse. Spider-Man, catches his punch never gonna say goodbye Tilda, uppercuts him through a cement wall. With the reverberations of the tumultuous clash still lingering in the air, Crossbones found himself succumbing to the inexorable force of his exhaustion. As he crumpled to the ground, the weight of his battered body seemed to mirror the burden of his malevolent endeavors. Kneeling amidst the debris of the plaza, Crossbones shed the mask that had veiled his identity, laying bare the face that had long remained obscured. The unmasking was a poignant revelation, symbolizing a moment of vulnerability amidst the maelstrom of conflict. Spider-Man, well hello, Freddy Krueger. Crossbones, I think I look pretty good, all things considered. Spider-Man, who's the one that's gonna pay for all that plastic surgery, huh? Your buyer? Crossbones, you know, you might know him. Captain America's pal, Bucky, his Bucky. Spider-Man, yeah, that name does ring a bell. He remembers? Crossbones. Yeah, he remembered, Captain. I was there. He got all weepy about it, till they put his brain back in a blender. He wanted Captain to know something. He said to me please tell Rogers, when you gotta go. You gotta go, and you're coming with them. In an astonishing display of swiftness and unwavering resolve, Spider-Man seized the critical moment before Crossbones could utter another word. With a firm grip upon his adversary's vest, he harnessed his remarkable strength to propel Crossbones into the air with unparalleled force, casting him skyward like a fleeting comet. As the malevolent figure soared through the heavens, the atmosphere seemed to tremble in anticipation, a pulsating canvas of uncertainty and foreboding. The inexorable ascent was brief yet profound, as Crossbones found himself suspended in a breathless limbo, a pawn caught between the realms of earth and the heavens. Then, in a mesmerizing culmination of fate, a cataclysmic explosion erupted in the sky, a scintillating spectacle that seemed to paint the firmament with fleeting brilliance. The echoes of the explosion reverberated through the ether, as if nature itself bore witness to the dramatic climax that unfolded in its vast expanse. Scarlet Witch, are you okay, Spider? Spider-Man, yeah, I'm fine. Scarlet Witch, did your spider senses help you know he had a bomb? Spider-Man, yeah. He already knew it was gonna happen. Dark Portal is opening 300 feet in the air. In the midst of the chaotic aftermath, Spider-Man's discerning gaze turned skyward, where an enigmatic Dark Portal materialized, a swirling abyss that seemed to defy the very laws of reality. With an air of stoic determination, he tightened his fist. The portal, a profound enigma in its ominous illa, held within its depths the promise of unforeseen adversaries or unearthly forces that might emerge to challenge our hero. Goliath has appeared from the portal. It is advised to evacuate everyone, right now. In the wake of the enigmatic Dark Portal's appearance, an air of trepidation seizes Spider-Man's composed demeanor. 
as the gravity of the unfolding situation envelops him with an almost palpable sense of urgency. His heart beats in tandem with the collective pulse of the team as they confront the unsettling reality that lies beyond the threshold of the portal. With resolute leadership, Spider-Man summons his allies, his voice tinged with a fervent urgency as he imparts a vital directive. Each word carries the weight of a hero burdened with the profound responsibility of safeguarding innocent lives. With unwavering conviction, he exhorts every member of the team to evacuate as many people as possible from the perilous locale, employing whatever means necessary. Captain America, Carita what the hell is wrong with you? What's in the portal? Spider-Man, we don't have time for this. An Evolve is gonna be here. Get everyone out now. Scarlet you're gonna fight this monster with me. Scarlet Witch, you am okay? Anxious. The Goliath crashes to the floor and roars in fury. This colossal creature epitomized the apex of evolutionary prowess. Resplendent in its imposing stature, the Goliath towered over its surroundings, reaching an awe-inspiring height of nearly twenty feet, its hulking mass brimming with sinewy muscle and brawny sinews. Its imposing frame was adorned with a textured carapace, an amalgamation of rugged plates that formed a natural fortress against the ravages of Shear's tumultuous environments. The Goliath's dominating presence extended to its powerful limbs, each appendage a symphony of raw strength and precision. Its massive arms, crafted for devastating force, featured immense clawed digits that could effortlessly rend stone and metal alike. The creature's heavily muscled legs, with its sinewy sinews and powerful talons, provided a launching pad for the Goliath's incredible leaps and agile maneuvers, underscoring its unrivaled prowess as both predator and prey. Intricately evolved for combat, the Goliath's countenance bore an intimidating visage, a visage adorned with razor-sharp horns that jutted forth like baleful weapons, attesting to the belligerent nature of its design. Its prominent A's, a mesmerizing blend of fiery intensity and chilling resolve, were a window to the relentless cunning that lay beneath its titanic exterior. Yet, it was perhaps the Goliath's extraordinary resiliency and uncanny regenerative abilities that set it apart as the paragon of evolved perfection. Its hide, reminiscent of weathered rock, was a testament to the countless battles it had endured, healing and transforming even the most grievous of injuries into hardened armor. Amidst the sprawling metropolis, chaos and destruction unfurled in the wake of the rampaging monster, a creature of formidable proportions that defied the might of conventional weaponry. Its invulnerable hide rendered firearms futile, the projectiles repelled with an effortless resilience that spoke of its invincibility. In this dire moment of urban upheaval, two valiant figures emerged from the fringes of the turmoil, Spider-Man and Scarlet Witch, stalwart defenders of humanity. A symphony of strategy and teamwork unfolded as Spider-Man deftly coordinated their assault, instructing Scarlet Witch to employ her telekinetic prowess from a safe distance, while he, the seasoned hero, braced himself for the arduous confrontation with the colossal Goliath. In a testament to his sagacious instincts, Spider-Man drew upon the knowledge of past encounters, having played the game of Evolve, a prophetic prelude that granted him insight into the tactics required to confront such a formidable adversary. Unwavering in his resolve, he steeled himself for the arduous task ahead, knowing full well that peril and injury awaited him in the face of such overwhelming darkness. Summoning his vocal bravado, Spider-Man commanded the Goliath's attention, the sonorous resonance of his call echoing through the chaotic din. The monster, its actions steeped in malevolence, turned with an unhurried air to face the heroic interloper, its monstrous appetite exemplified by the grotesque sight of devouring a hapless police officer. Goliath, g r r r r Spider-Man, yeah you. Your golden coral looking ass regular. Pick someone your own size. Goliath, Rawah. Spider-Man, oh, shit. In an electrifying display of agility and prowess, the monstrous behemoth surged forth, its sheer momentum driving it toward the valiant hero with an intent to annihilate. Yet, the hero, a paragon of dexterity and quick-witted reflexes, proved an elusive quarry, evading the creature's thunderous leap smash with almost preternatural ease. With a balletic grace that belied his mortal origins, the hero harnessed the force of his web, leveraging it to propel himself with kinetic precision. In a daring maneuver, he deftly latched onto the creature's hulking back, a symbiotic fusion of hero and arachnid power. Unleashing a potent assault, he delivered a venom-infused punch, the potency of which seared through the monster's colossal form. The creature's agonizing roar reverberated through the tumultuous landscape, an acknowledgement of the pain inflicted upon its invincible exterior. It was very effective. Bioelectricity is super effective against monster-based enemies. Spider-Man, very convenient. 
in a mesmerizing display of relentless tenacity, Spider-Man, guided by an unwavering sense of duty, continued his venom-punching assault upon the colossal monster's impregnable back. The heroes of venom-infused strikes, a convergence of lethal precision and potent venom, elicited visceral growls of agony from the formidable beast, its every attempt to dislodge its agile assailant proving futile. Yet, the monster, driven by desperation, hatched a daring gambit to break free from the clutches of the indomitable hero. Summoning the last dregs of its strength, it executed a gravity-defying leap, with the sheer force of its descent driving it into a nearby building. In this moment of impact, Spider-Man was forced to relinquish his grip, compelled to endure jarring separation from his imposing adversary. Within the beleaguered building, a symphony of panic and chaos unfolded as the monstrous intruder rampaged through the structure, its insatiable appetite for destruction on full display. A scene of unimaginable horror unfolded, as the creature consumed any hapless souls unfortunate enough to be ensnared within its path of carnage. With a steely resolve that defied the encroaching darkness, Spider-Man, having recovered from the disruption, swiftly took charge. Utilizing his lateral repulsion skill with surgical precision, he launched himself at the Goliath, catching the beast unawares in a thrilling Madeira engagement. In a breathtaking ballet of acrobatics and combat, Spider-Man pummeled the Goliath with venom-infused strikes, each blow an embodiment of his inexhaustible determination to safeguard humanity. To anchor his aerial assault, the hero cast two meticulously placed webs upon the street, entwining them in a brilliant display of strategy and might. As the titanic clash culminated in a thunderous impact, the Goliath crashed to the ground, the plaza trembling in response to the collision. Spider-Man, the epitome of valor and resilience, stood tall amidst the aftermath, his relentless pursuit of justice an enduring beacon of hope amidst the engulfing turmoil. Scarlet Witch, Spider, Move In an astute display of teamwork and calculated strategy, the hero deftly adhered to Scarlet Witch's instruction, a seamless symphony of coordination between the two champions. With a fluid grace that mirrored the dance of fate itself, the hero web swung with unerring precision, skillfully evading the impending chaos as Scarlet Witch wrought her sorcerer's might upon a gas-laden truck. The gas truck, akin to a looming harbinger of destruction, became an unwitting instrument of mayhem as it hurtled with cataclysmic velocity toward the monstrous adversary. Scarlet Witch's powers, infused the airborne projectile with an ominous aura, setting the stage for a spellbinding spectacle of annihilation. In a convergence of elemental forces, the gas truck collided with the monster in a resplendent detonation of raw power and incendiary brilliance. The plaza bore witness to the unfolding cataclysm, the explosion's luminous tendrils painting the canvas of the cityscape with fleeting brilliance. Scarlet Witch, is it dead? Falcon, what the fuck was that? Spider-Man, it's alive. Scarlet Witch, what? How? Huh? As the Goliath's primal roar reverberated through the urban landscape, the very earth seemed to quiver beneath its titanic presence. The echoes of its core bore testimony to the relentless progression of its evolutionary journey, a metamorphic testament to the profound forces at work within its hulking form. Within the disquieting soundscape, an orchestra of squelching and tearing emerged, a haunting symphony of biological metamorphosis. This poignant auditory tapestry was a testament to the creature's unyielding desire to surpass its primal state, evolving into a more formidable force, a living embodiment of nature's artistry at its most enigmatic. In the midst of this awe-inspiring spectacle, the plaza bore witness to the unfolding of a saga writ large upon the canvas of time. The Goliath, resolute in its pursuit of ascension, an indomitable force that defied the boundaries of ordinary existence. As the Goliath's primal visage merged with the intricacies of its evolving form, it epitomized a dance of timelessness, an entity caught in a liminal realm between what it was and what it aspired to become. Within this chrysalis of transformation, the creature's primal fury coalesced with the elegance of burgeoning prowess, crafting an allegory of untamed beauty at the cusp of fruition. Spider-Man, no. IT is evolving. In a display of astonishing power and strategic prowess, the Spider-Hero unleashed a formidable venom blast, a dazzling manifestation of his arachnid might. Yet, the monstrous Goliath, Undeterred by the impending onslaught, summoned its own elemental force, a scorching fire breath that set the stage for a mesmerizing battle of elemental energies. In a mesmerizing dance of opposing forces, the venom blast and the infernal fire breath clashed in a dazzling beam struggle, their respective energies intertwining in a cosmic spectacle. The air crackled with the intensity of the confrontation, as the beam struggle unleashed a symphony of force and resistance. A tug of war that encapsulated the essence of valor and malevolence locked in elemental combat. 
the heroes, steadfast in their resolve, held their ground, the very core of their beings intertwined in this clash of elemental might. As the titanic forces collided, a cataclysmic explosion erupted in a blinding crescendo, its reverberations coursing through the plaza with seismic intensity. The three heroes were propelled back, yet their indomitable spirits remained resolute, unyielding in their determination to protect the city from the encroaching darkness. Spider-Man, TCH. It's in stage two. Get ready. This is a buffed version of the original. Amidst the pulsating tension of the scene, the two heroes gazed at Spider-Man with perplexed curiosity, their minds grappling with the inexplicable phenomenon before them. A symphony of speculation played across their expressions, contemplating the source of this unexpected surge in power. Though unable to decipher the enigma that unfolded, they tacitly acknowledged the monster's newfound potency. In a breathtaking display of raw might, the Goliath, seemingly undeterred by the mysterious transformation, summoned a colossal boulder into its grasp. With a bellowing roar, it launched the immense projectile at the trio of heroes. Yet, the indomitable Scarlet Witch stepped forth her sorcerer's abilities manifesting in a sublime display of control and might. With ethereal grace, she intercepted the colossal boulder in midair, her formidable telekinetic prowess evident in her mastery over the very forces of nature. In an awe-inspiring display of power, Scarlet Witch deftly hurled the boulder back at the monstrous adversary, a display of audacity that defied its elemental might. The colossal projectile found its mark, impacting the Goliath with resounding force, evoking an incensed response from the creature as it bore the brunt of its own destructive potential. Dark Goliath, unfazed Dreaar. Spider-Man, Falcon, help wander with the cover. Falcon, all right. Takes flight. In a bewitching display of eerie prowess, the monstrous apparition vanished from sight, as if embracing the ethereal veil of uncertainty itself. With an enigmatic presence that defied the very laws of corporeal existence, it re-emerged in an instantaneous flash, its massive form materializing before the astonished gaze of Spider-Man. In a breathtaking display of otherworldly celerity, the creature lunged with unparalleled agility, honing in on its unsuspecting target with malevolent precision. Like a tempest of nightmarish descent, it surged forth, its formidable mass colliding with the agile hero in a jarring tackle. Spider-Man, NGH. You aren't supposed to be this fast. Hits the monster with elbows charged with venom. In the midst of the tumultuous encounter, Spider-Man, resolute in his pursuit of vanquishing the Goliath, inadvertently found himself drawn into an ill-fated trajectory. Unbeknownst to the arachnid hero, the specter of an approaching building loomed menacingly in his peripheral vision, its foreboding presence unnoticed in the intensity of battle. A cataclysmic collision ensued as the Goliath and Spider-Man clashed with devastating force the very foundations of the city quaking beneath the tempest of destruction unleashed upon the unsuspecting metropolis. In this moment of chaos, the tapestry of civilian lives hung precariously in the balance, their very existence imperiled amidst the unrestrained fury of the battle. Captain and Black Widow, gallant in their valor, endeavored to rescue the imperiled civilians, their unwavering resolve manifesting in a symphony of heroism amidst the maelstrom of calamity. However, the battle's frenetic pace defied their efforts, as the Goliath's indiscriminate attacks left a trail of destruction in their wake, leaving no corner unscathed by the unrestrained tempest of malevolence. In a mesmerizing display of martial prowess, Spider-Man relentlessly pressed his advantage, his agile form a blur of motion as he targeted the Goliath with venom-fueled stingers. A critical moment unfolded as the Goliath prepared to unleash its infernal fire breath once more, seeking to engulf the hero in a blazing inferno. In a masterstroke of strategic acumen, Spider-Man responded with lightning reflexes, deploying a flurry of webs that ensnared the monster's gaping maw, turning the creature's own power inward upon itself, resulting in a resplendent conflagration that erupted from within. Moment really stunned by the visceral counterstroke, the Goliath became ensnared within the webbing's embrace, affording Spider-Man an opportunity to maneuver the creature away from the vulnerable populace. With a mixture of strength and ingenuity, the hero deftly dragged the Goliath to an unpopulated area. Spider-Man, Scarlet throw me and the monster in the air. As high as you can. Scarlet Witch, huh? Why? Spider-Man, just fucking do it. In an unforeseen twist, the Scarlet Witch found herself moment really taken aback, her composed countenance betraying the stir of surprise within. However, she promptly heeded the call of her compatriots and wielded her mystic powers with finesse and control. With an aura of arcane elegance, she directed her powers towards Spider-Man and the towering Goliath, embracing both figures in an ethereal embrace that defied the boundaries of gravity itself. 
with deft precision, she elevated them high into the heavens, their forms suspended in an awe-inspiring display of telekinetic might. As the ascent continued, Spider-Man, empowered by a fervent determination, embraced the very essence of his arachnid prowess. Emitting a volatile surge of bioelectricity, his form became a conduit of kinetic force, a tempest of energy that intertwined with the Goliath in a pulsating dance of power and subjugation. Spider-Man, so my electricity hurts you, huh? Let's see how you can handle a nuke's worth of it. Ascending to the heights of the heavens, Spider-Man and the colossal Goliath traversed the celestial realm, their ascent becoming a testament to the symbiosis of valor and audacity, unleashing an indomitable surge of bioelectricity that had been meticulously amassed within him. The hero harnessed the full extent of his arachnid prowess, a cataclysmic force coalescing at the epicenter of his being. With a resounding detonation akin to the primal fury of a nuclear conflagration, the heavens bore witness to a spectacle of boundless energy, an incandescent tempest that engulfed the ethereal realm. In an awe-inspiring eruption, the Goliath, a symbol of malevolence, was engulfed by the very forces it had sought to harness, its form disintegrating in the face of the all-encompassing blast. In the aftermath of this titanic encounter, the Scarlet Witch's telekinetic mastery assumed a gentle demeanor, embracing the descending hero with an ethereal grace, a poignant testimony to the delicacy with which her powers could wield both immense force and tender care. Beside them, Falcon, resolute and unwavering, alighted with a grace that mirrored the heroics of his comrades, standing as a vigilant sentinel against the encroaching spectre of darkness. Falcon, are you okay? Spider-Man, I'm fine, how are the casualties? Falcon. Spider-Man, fuck. Falcon, the fight was too much. As much as you tried to take it away from populated areas, it just came right back into it like it was attracted to it. Spider-Man, the Daily Bugle is gonna have a rave from this. Falcon, you guys tried your best. Even though it was mostly you. Again. Spider-Man, Sam. I know how you guys feel about me dealing with all this alone. I know you want to help but sometimes. It feels like fate just forces me to deal with it myself. You saw Wanda, she could barely do anything, and she's one of our strongest. Captain America, just arrives Carito, we didn't think the monster was gonna be this much of a problem. Spider-Man, I knew what exactly that was and it still did a lot of damage. Fuck. Black Widow, walks beside Spider-Man Carito, let's just get back home, okay? Grabs his shoulder. Spider-Man, alright. Quickly looks around on the rooftops WH shows there. Falcon, Carito, you're scaring us. What is it? Scarlet Witch, grabs Spider-Man's face hey. You're not okay right now, let's go home and relax okay? Spider-Man, heavy breathing I. Okay. Captain America, we will handle the casualties, you two can go back home. Amidst the aftermath of their triumphant confrontation, Wanda, the Scarlet Witch, exhibited a graceful aura as she guided Carito back to the Quinjet, a tableau of poise and composure that mirrored the elegance of her telekinetic prowess. In the noble pursuit of aiding the afflicted, the rest of the heroic ensemble, their valor undiminished, dispersed throughout the scene, each embracing their unique mantle of responsibility with udder. However, amidst this orchestrated act of benevolence, an enigmatic figure lurked in the periphery, a shadowy specter hidden within the folds of darkness, its very presence a paradox of excitement and malevolence. Veiled in secrecy, it remained unseen and unnoticed, a spectral observer entranced by the unfolding drama before it. Question mark oh, Spider. You are one interesting specimen. Once I kill you, you will be my thousand successful hunts on your species. Don't worry Spider, I will hunt you down and make you a proper burial. I swear gay craven off will be the last thing you see. Ah ha 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 ha. In a display of arcane mastery, the enigmatic entity unfurled a portal, a gateway to realms beyond mortal comprehension. With an air of detachment, he turned away from the scene a spectral figure retreating into the ephemeral veil that concealed its cryptic machinations. Today, he chose not to strike, but rather to indulge in the audacious art of observation, a calculating predator meticulously surveying his newfound prey. As the entity vanished into the ethereal expanse, an atmosphere of foreboding lingered in the air, for this enigmatic being, an embodiment of enigma and eldritch might, possessed a predilection for calculated malevolence. Like an insatiable hunter, it had marked its quarry, preparing for an ominous finale, the ultimate culmination of its relentless pursuit, a final confrontation with the unwitting victims who would soon find themselves ensnared in its diabolical embrace. And he prepared for his last hunt. Chapter 23, Civil War Part 2 
Marvel DC, Images, Manhus, and every anime that will be mentioned and used in this story are not mine. They all belong to their respective owners. The main character Carita Josue Valdez and the story are mine. Amidst an august gathering of esteemed individuals, a symphony of luminescent holograms took form, illuminating the expanse with ephemeral embers of remembrance. In the ethereal tapestry of light, a reverent moment of retrospection unfolded, an invocation of Tony Stark's past, an enigmatic holographic memoir that conjured the spectral image of his beloved mother. In this evocative mise-en-scene, the radiant glow of the holographic display lent an aura of reverence to the resplendent scene, as if time itself acquiesced to the allure of reminiscence. The elegant cadence of the piano chords resonated with the resonant warmth of familial love, encapsulated within the gentle caress of Tony's mother, a poignant memento encapsulating a bond that transcended the veil of time. The audience, captive to this evocative symphony of light, bore witness to the tender moment of nostalgia their countenances enigmatic portraits of contemplation and admiration, for within this holographic reminiscence, they glimpsed the essence of Tony Stark, the brilliance of his mind and the tenderness of his heart, interwoven in a symphony of love and longing. Maria Stark, try to remember the kind of September Tilda, when grass was green Tilda, starts speaking to a teenage Tony Stark sleeping on the couch wake up, dear, and say goodbye to your father. Howard Stark, who's the homeless person on the couch? Young Tony, sighs this is why I love coming home for Christmas. Right before you leave town. Maria Stark, be nice, dear, he's been studying abroad. Howard Stark, really? Which broad? What's her name? Young Tony, Candace. Howard Stark, he takes Tony's Santa hat off do me a favor. Try not to burn the house down before Monday. Young Tony, okay, so it's Monday. That is good to know, I will plan my toga party accordingly. Laughs for a bit where you going? Maria Stark, your father is flying us to the Bahamas for a little getaway. Howard Stark, we might have to make a quick stop. Young Tony, at the Pentagon, right? Don't worry, you're gonna love the holiday menu at the commissary. Howard Stark, they say sarcasm is a metric for potential. If that's true, you'll be a great man someday. I'll get the bags. Leaves the living room. Young Tony, sighs. Maria Stark, he does miss you when you're not here. And frankly, you're going to miss us, stands up and walks toward an upset young Tony because this is the last time we're all going to be together. You know what's about to happen. Say something. If you don't you'll regret it. Howard Stark comes back. Young Tony, sighs, I love you, Dad. And I know you did the best you could. Maria Stark, thank you, kisses her son on the cheek and leaves with Howard Stark. As the holographic memoir cast its spellbinding luminescence upon the gathering, an unexpected presence emerged from the periphery, a figure of enigmatic mien, standing aloof against the backdrop of the scene. The enigmatic visage of Tony Stark materialized in the shadows, leaning nonchalantly against the wall like a spectre that had slipped through the veil of time. Tony, that's how I wish it happened. Binarily augmented retro framing. Or bath. God, I gotta work on that acronym. An extremely costly method of hijacking the hippocampus. 2. Cyclear traumatic memories. Blows a candle but it does nothing. He does it repeatedly and the hologram turns it off while displaying a blue light and the hologram slowly disappear it doesn't change the fact that they never made it to the airport or all the things I did to avoid processing my grief, but. Plus, $611 million for my little therapeutic experiment? No one in their right mind would have ever funded it. Help me out. What's the MIT mission statement? The crowd of students repeats to generate, disseminate, and preserve knowledge. And work with others, to bring it to bear on the world's great challenges. Walks around the stage well, you are the others. And, quiet as it's kept. The challenges facing you are the greatest mankind's ever known. Plus, most of you are broke. Oh, I'm sorry. Rather, you were. As of this moment, every student has been made an equal recipient of the inaugural September Foundation grant. The students in the room gasp in shock. Tony, as in, all of your projects have just been approved and funded. The crowd applauded and join no strings, no taxes. Just. Reframe the future. Starting now. In a moment of contemplation, Tony Stark's gaze locked onto the holographic display, uncertain of the words he should speak. A sentence of profound meaning left him silent, prompting an improvised conclusion, a poignant blend of scripted and spontaneous that conveyed the depths of his introspection. Tony, just go and break some eggs. As Tony Stark graciously bid adieu, his presence a spectacle of brilliance that resonated with the audience, an uproarious wave of euphoria surged through the crowd.
The collective adulation became an orchestra of jubilation, each soul contributing to the symphony of appreciation for the enigmatic genius before them. In response to their fervent acclaim, Tony waved his farewell, his gesture a masterful flourish that mirrored the grace and finesse he displayed on the holographic stage. With a humble demeanor, he retreated backstage, his exit a graceful departure that left the audience yearning for more. Faculty member, wow, wow, that took my breath away, oh, Tony, so generous, so much money, wow, laughs awkwardly out of curiosity, starts following Tony as he continued to stay silent will any portion of that great be made available to faculty. I know, ooh, gross, but hear me out, I have got this killer idea for a self-cooking hot dog, basically, a chemical detonator embedded. Tony, the restroom is this way, yeah? Faculty member, yeah. Embedded in the meat shaft, ah uh, um. Gets ignored. Script girl, Mr. Stark, I am so sorry about the teleprompter, I didn't know Miss Potts had cancelled. They didn't have time to fix it. Tony, it's fine, I'll be right back. Faculty member, we'll catch up later. In a seamless guise, Tony Stark exited the stage and conveyed the impression of venturing toward the restroom. However, with an astute awareness that belied his nonchalance, he veered unexpectedly to the left, concealing his true intent. In this covert departure from the spotlight, his discerning gaze alighted upon a figure that stirred a sense of recognition within him, an enigmatic presence whose identity seemed to dwell in the recesses of his memory. Pausing with a studied nonchalance, Tony leaned against the wall, a picture of poise and contemplation. The encounter with this familiar yet elusive individual drew him into a tapestry of enigmatic reminiscence, igniting a dance of memories that flickered like celestial embers. Miriam Sharp, that was nice, what you did for those younger people. Tony, ah, they deserve it. Plus, it eases my conscience, as well as Carito's. Miriam Sharp, they say there's a correlation between generosity and guilt. But if you've got the money, break as many eggs as you like, right? An air of unease settled upon Tony Stark as a veil of contemplation shrouded his countenance. With measured deliberation, he reached out to the elevator's call button, each press evoking an enigmatic symphony of thoughts that swirled within him. Tony, are you going up? Miriam Sharp, I'm right where I want to be. As the enigmatic woman fumbled urgently within the depths of her purse, a sense of trepidation washed over Tony Stark, evoking an undercurrent of disquietude within his composed demeanor. The woman's frantic actions seemed to cast an enigmatic spell upon the atmosphere, transforming the bustling ambience into a theater of suspense. Tony's normally unflappable disposition faltered ever so slightly, as the enigma of the woman's intent stirred a tempest of thoughts within him. Tony, okay, hey, tries to stop her. As their eyes meet, a profound and solemn countenance graces her features, conveying a gravity of emotion that Tony instinctively comprehends, captivated by her intensity. He acquiesces, gracefully releasing his grip. Tony, sorry, it's an occupational hazard. Miriam Sharp, I work for the State Department. Human resources. I know it's boring, but it enabled me to raise a son. I'm very proud of what he grew up to be. She slams a photo on Tony's chest his name was Charlie Spencer. You and your friend Spider-Man, murdered him, in Sokovia. Not that matters in the least to you. Do you think you fight for us? You just fight for yourself. Who's going to avenge my son, Stuck? He's dead. And I blame you. Time skip. New York. Avengers Base. Engrossed in the unfolding events of the world, Carito and Steve were fixated upon the television screen, where a compelling report emerged, recounting a mission that transpired in Lagos just over a month ago. The news segment held them wrapped, drawing them into the intricacies of the operation and its impact, evoking a reflective atmosphere as they absorbed the gravity of the situation before them. News anchor, on TV 34 Wakandans were among those killed during a confrontation between the Avengers and an unknown monster in Lagos, Nigeria last month. The traditionally reclusive Wakandans were on an outreach mission in Lagos when the attack occurred. King Kaka, on TV our people's blood is spilled on foreign soil not only because of the actions of criminals but to the indifference of those pledged to stop them. Victory at the expense of the innocent. Is no victory at all. News anchor, on TV the Wakandan King went on to. Carito turned the holographic TV off and threw the controller on the table. Steve, Carito. Carito, no. It fucking fuels me how they can say that. I tried okay. I fucking tried. But I'm just one man. The only one WHO could even damage the thing. Why did I even upgrade your shit when you all can't do shit when the time comes? Huh. Steve, Carito I. 
their attention was suddenly diverted as their senses attuned to the distant emanations of a television, softly resounding from Wanda's room. The serendipitous act of overhearing beckoned them to lean in, their curiosity peaked, as the muffled sounds wafted through the air, enticing them with an enigmatic color, igniting a spark of intrigue within their hearts. Male pundit, they are operating outside and above the international law. Because that's the reality if we don't respond to acts like these. What legal authority does a super-powered individual like Spider-Man have to operate in Nigeria? Steve entered her room and turned the TV off. In the subtle cadence of the unfolding moment, her perceptive gaze alighted upon the sight before her, the abrupt cessation of her television's glow, a prelude to an inquiry that was poised to grace her lips. However, before she could utter a word, her discerning eyes discerned the presence of Carito, standing poised behind Steve. Wonder, K. Carito, I didn't. Carito. I'm going for a walk. Leaves. Steve, sighs. Wanda, I don't even know what to say to him. Steve, it's not his fault. Wanda, tell that to every news center. They are being awfully specific about what happened. Steve, I just... I just want to ease his burden. But I don't know how to do that when he can't even hurt the enemies he has to face. Wanda, not even my powers did anything to that creature. I... I pity him. So much. I sometimes wanna cry for him his frustration, his pain. I feel like a bad friend when I can't think of anything to help him. Steve, every time he goes to fight alone I feel like a 16-year-old kid in Brooklyn. And people died, because I wasn't strong enough to help a friend. I feel like a bad friend too. Wonder, I guess we both need to work on the friend department. Steve, this job. We try to save as many people as we can. Sometimes that doesn't mean everybody. But if we can't find a way to live with that, then next time, Maybe nobody gets saved. Why didn't I tell this to Carito before he left? Sighs. Wonder, we will wait until he comes back. He's pretty tough. In a moment of unforeseen and dramatic disruption, Vision, the enigmatic being of synthetic life, ethereally phased through the very walls that enclosed them, bestowing upon the unsuspecting duo a profound surprise. Wonder, this. We talked about this. Vision, yes, but the door was open so I assumed that. Stutters Caption Rogers wished to know when Mr. Stark was arriving. Steve, thank you. We'll be right down. Did you tell Carito this? Vision, he already noticed before I could tell him. Wonder, his spider sense. Yup, sounds like him. Vision, I'll you use the door. Oh, apparently, he's brought a guest. Steve, we know who it is? In a beguiling twist of events, before Vision could utter a response. Carito materialized with an air of enigmatic color, seemingly materializing from the ether, just beyond the threshold of the room. Carito, the fucking Secretary of State. I bet they gonna put a leash on us. Just watch. Clicks his tongue I take a foot outside this place and something is already happening. In a moment of significant import, the Avengers, embodying a collective assemblage of exceptional individuals, convened with an air of purpose around a stately meeting table, presided over by none other than Secretary Ross. Secretary Ross, sighs five years ago. I had a heart attack and dropped right in the middle of my backswing. Carito, totally not in the mood cool. Secretary Ross, cool indeed. It turned out to be the best round of my life because after 13 hours of surgery and a triple bypass, I found something 40 years in the army had never taught me. Perspective. The world owes the Avengers an unpayable debt. You have fought for us, protected us, risked your lives. Carito, but even though many people view us as heroes, many still see us as a threat. Am I right? Secretary Ross, yes, Spider-Man. Natasha, what word would you use, Mr. Secretary? Secretary Ross, how about dangerous? What would you call a group of US-based, enhanced individuals who routinely ignore sovereign borders and inflict their will wherever they choose and who, frankly, seem unconcerned about what they leave behind? Carito, crushes a glass cup in his hand. A collective hush fell upon the assembly as all gazes converged upon Carito, their countenances marked by an unmistakable veneer of astonishment and disbelief, stirred by the unanticipated conduct exhibited by the enigmatic figure. In the wake of his actions, a tapestry of emotions danced across the room, weaving together an intricate web of curiosity, concern, and intrigue. Carito, continue. Secretary Ross, gulps and shows multiple footage on the holographic screen New York. Upon the illuminated screen, a vivid tableau unfolded, narrating a gripping chronicle of valor and calamity. 
the valiant Avengers, clad in their resolute armor, confronted the relentless Chaitori horde amidst a chaotic urban landscape, as a cacophony of terror reverberated through the air. The civilian populace, gripped by a visceral fear, sought refuge in a desperate bid to escape the tumult, while the military, marshalling their strength and expertise, endeavored to orchestrate a safeguarding of their fellow citizens. With each moment of the riveting footage, the scenes metamorphosed, unfurling into a cascade of gripping spectacles, where the colossal hulk, in a frenzy of unrestrained power, leapt and roared across towering edifices, inadvertently causing fragments of the buildings to descend upon a gallant soldier, ensnared in the fray. Meanwhile, another visage captured the essence of courage personified, as Spider-Man, clad in the mantle of responsibility, stood valiantly holding aloft a section of a beleaguered building the strain evident upon his countenance as he uttered a soulful scream, his unwavering determination etched in every line of his face, for he knew that countless lives hinged upon his resilient strength. Secretary Ross Washington D.C. Upon the luminescent canvas of the display, a haunting portrayal unfolded, three helicarriers engulfed in billowing smoke, symbols of formidable power now ensnared within intricate webs that sought to quell their destructive might. The screen transitioned, showcasing a breathtaking feat of resourcefulness, as the three massive constructs, once harbingers of devastation, now stood webbed together in a display of tactical finesse, ingeniously devised to mitigate the potential catastrophe and preserve the surrounding urban landscape. However, the scene transcended the realm of strategic brilliance, bearing the weight of somber realism. As the footage shifted once more, the screen became a witness to the harrowing chaos that ensued, as people, gripped by panic and fear, fled in every direction to evade the impending calamity. Tragically, Despite their desperate attempts to outrun the cascading chaos, many were ensnared by the inescapable grip of fate, unable to extricate themselves from the path of destruction. Secretary Ross, Sokovia Upon the illuminated canvas of the screen, a haunting tableau of human vulnerability unfolds. The inhabitants of Sokovia, a once thriving city, now gripped by sheer terror, were captured in their desperate flight for survival. Chaos and destruction reigned supreme as relentless battles waged, unfurling relentlessly in every corner of the urban landscape. The very foundations of Sokovia were defied as colossal engines of Ultrans making defied gravity, elevating the entire city towards the heavens. Amidst this cacophony of turmoil, a poignant moment crystallized on the screen, Spider-Man, the epitome of valor and determination, stood alone in a valiant attempt to confront the malevolent Ultran. Yet, the enormity of the task before him became starkly evident as a whole building succumbed to ruin in the maelstrom of the battle, emblematic of the devastation wrought by the clash of titanic forces. Secretary Ross, Lagos The climactic scene depicted on the screen showcased a solo endeavor of valiant heroism as Spider-Man fearlessly confronted a colossal, raging monster. A breathtaking display of agility and tenacity unfolded in their ferocious clash, yet the very epicenter of their battle bore witness to the cataclysmic consequences of their conflict. With each fateful encounter, the rampaging monster proved relentless in its pursuit of destruction, relentlessly plunging the city into ruin. A cycle of havoc ensued, where the creature would vanquish its adversary, only to hastily wreak havoc, leaving devastation in its wake. The horrifying sight of civilians falling prey to its monstrous hunger, further accentuated the scale of calamity, evoking a profound sense of anguish and outrage within the onlookers. Among them, Carito's countenance simmered with an unyielding fury, his emotions threatening to break through the barriers of restraint. Just as the tempest of his emotions threatened to erupt into an unrestrained outburst, Steve, a paragon of wisdom and composure, interceded with a steadying hand. Through his mere presence, he infused the charged atmosphere with an aura of calm authority, inviting Carito to embrace restraint in the face of their shared concern and turmoil. Steve, okay, that's enough. Secretary Ross motions to turn off the projection. Secretary Ross, for the past four years, you've operated with unlimited power and no supervision. That's an arrangement the governments of the world can no longer tolerate. But I think we have a solution. He grabs a book and gives it to wander the Sokovia Accords. Approved by 117 countries. It states that the Avengers shall no longer be a private organization. Instead, they'll operate under the supervision of a United Nations panel. Only when and if that panel deems it necessary. Carito, very silently PFF. Steve, the Avengers were formed to make the world a safer place. I feel we've done that. Secretary Ross, tell me, Captain, do you know where Thor and Banner are right now? Steve continues to stare at him. If I misplaced a couple of 30 megaton nukes you can bet there'd be consequences. Compromise. Reassurance. That's how the world works. Believe me. 
This is the middle ground. Carito, trying to hold it in. Vision? Ready. So, there are contingencies. Secretary Ross, three days from now, the UN meets in Vienna to ratify the accords. As Steve pivoted on his heel, his gaze found its mark upon Tony, hoping to discern a glimmer of shared understanding or perhaps even a spark of reconciliation. Yet, what he encountered instead was a sight that spoke volumes without a single uttered word, Tony, the once indomitable figure of charisma and wit, now shrouded in a veil of introspection, bowed his head in a silent gesture of introspection. Secretary Ross, talk it over. Natasha, and if we come into a decision you don't like? Secretary Ross, then you retire. Clarito, jiggles kinda loudly but attempts to hold it in. Secretary Ross, what's so funny Spider-Man? Clarito, pfff, n nothing, covers his mouth r, ha ha. Tony, Clarito, please don't. Clarito, I'm trying man, but this whole shit, ha ha, it is fucking hilarious to me. Secretary Ross, people's lives are not a laughing matter, Spider-Man. Clarito, I'll tell you kindly before I blow a fuse. I'm gonna ask you to kindly fuck off, we are gonna talk things out. A collective gasp reverberated through the room, each individual ensnared in a state of profound disbelief, as they beheld the audacious act that Carito had just perpetrated. A palpable aura of astonishment hung heavy in the air, woven together with threads of bewilderment and consternation, as the gravity of the situation took root in the hearts of all who bore witness. In the midst of the shocked congregation, the secretary's countenance transformed into a visage of stern displeasure, his eyes ablaze with an ember of anger that smoldered beneath the surface. His gaze bore into Carito with an intensity that conveyed both disappointment and disapproval, for the audacity of the act had flouted the boundaries of decorum and propriety. Secretary Ross, do you have any idea who you are talking to? Carito, yeah I do, but after seeing Little God you kinda don't think someone like you is worthy of my respect. Secretary Ross, are you insane? Carito, you kinda need to be in my specific kind of work. My friends can't do absolutely shit to help me. Even though we have tried but nah, still can't do shit. Tony, okay, that's enough. Secretary, we are gonna talk things out and, scold our friend here. Carito, pff, nice one. Secretary Ross, he better get some help, or he's gonna be arrested. Carito, nah, I'll just create a Harley Quinn if I did. Tony, have a good day, sir. With a simmering display of indignation and controlled fury. The secretary's departure from the premises was a masterclass in restrained displeasure, his footsteps echoing the weight of his disapproval as he navigated the corridors with purposeful strides. His departure, though quiet, left an indelible mark on the atmosphere. Meanwhile, within the confines of the room, Carito's demeanor remained an enigmatic cocktail of defiance and insolence. The air seemed charged with the palpable tension of his audacious conduct, as if his every gesture exuded a rebellious energy that refused to be contained. Amidst the sanctum of the Avengers' quarters, a symphony of differing opinions echoed through the room as Reddy and Sam, fervent in their convictions, engaged in a spirited exchange over their present predicament. In the midst of this verbal interplay, Steve, the paragon of contemplation, assumed his seat, a stoic figure immersed in deep introspection. Across the room, Tony, a maestro of charisma and diplomacy, wielded his silver tongue with skillful finesse, endeavoring to quell the tempestuous storm within Carito's heart. The atmosphere crackled with tension, as Tony's tenacious efforts sought to breach the barriers of animosity that had encircled Carito's demeanor. With the passage of time, Tony's unwavering persistence bore fruit, gradually chiseling away the rough edges of Carito's hostility. A transformation ensued, a metamorphosis guided by Tony's sagacity and emotional acumen. The tempest within Carito's soul subsided, and he acquiesced to the soothing currents of understanding. Rudy, Secretary Ross has a Congressional Medal of Honor which is one more than you have. Sam, so let's say we agree to this thing. How long is it gonna be before they lojack us like a bunch of common criminals? Rudy, 117 countries want to sign this. 117, Sam and you're just like, no, that's cool. We got it. Sam, how long are you going to play both sides? Visions, I have an equation. Sam, oh, this will clear it up. Tony, sighs in frustration. Steve, keeps reading the book given by the secretary. Carito, just laying down on the couch silently and slightly annoyed. Vision, in the eight years since Mr. Stark announced himself as Iron Man, the number of known enhanced persons has grown exponentially. During the same period, 
the world of potentially world-ending events has risen at a commensurate rate. Steve, are you saying it's our fault? Carito, no, he's not saying that. He's saying that there might be a causality. Vision, exactly, Carito. Our very strength invites challenge. Challenge incites conflict. And conflict. Breeds catastrophe. Oversight. Oversight is not an idea that can be dismissed out of hand. Ready, boom. Looks at Sam with a face of I told you so. Natasha, Tony. You are being uncharacteristically non-hyperverbal. Steve. It's because he's already made up his mind. Carito. Of course he did. Tony, boy. You know me so well. Goes to a sitting position actually. I'm nursing an electromagnetic headache. That's what's going on, Cap. It's just pain. It's discomfort. Who's putting coffee grounds at the disposal? Am I running a bed and breakfast for a biker gang? Clarito, I do all the meals for everyone here, and because I wanted to annoy you. I put the coffee there, I already got a new one for you. Tony, I, sighs of course it was you. He places his phone on the table and displays an image of a young man oh, that's Charles Spencer, by the way. He's a great kid. Clarito, he died in Sokovia. Tony, how do you know that? Clarito, you think you're the only one who isn't cursed by the dead? The weight of guilt? The hate of the people despite you trying your best to save as many as you can? Yes, Tony. You know exactly what plagues my dreams. Tony, Carito you. Carito, let me tell you about the boy you are showing. Computer engineering degree, 3.6 GPA. He had a floor level gig at Intel planned for the fall. But he wanted to put a few miles on his soul before he parked it behind a desk. Wanted to explore the world. Perhaps be of service. He didn't want to go to Vegas or Fort Lauderdale, which is something Tony would do. He could have gone to Paris or Amsterdam, which is more fun. But as fate decided to screw with him he decided to spend his summer building sustainable housing for the poor. And guess where he went? Any guess? Tony? Tony, Sokovia. Everyone looked in silence not daring to say anything else. Clarito, he wanted to make a difference I guess. We won't know because I possibly or some of us dropped a building on him while we were kicking ass and getting our asses handed. I have read every casualty from that incident when I returned here. I know. Tony, drinks a cup of coffee so you know that there's no decision making process here, Carito. Hell, all of you. We need to be put in check. Whatever form that takes, I'm game. If we can't accept limitations, if we're boundary less. We're no better than the bad guys. Steve, Tony, someone dies on your watch, you don't give up. Tony, who said we're giving up? Steve, we are if we're not taking responsibility for our actions. This document just shifts the blame. Ready, I'm sorry, Steve. That. That is dangerously arrogant. This is the United Nations we're talking about. It's not the World Security Council. It's not SHIELD. It's not Hydra. Steve, no, but it's run by people with agendas, and agendas change. Tony, that's good, that's why I'm here, when I realized what my weapons were capable of in the wrong hands. I shut it down and stopped manufacturing. Steve, Tony, you chose to do that. If we sign this, we surrender our right to choose. What if this panel sends us somewhere we don't think we should go? What if there is somewhere we need to go and they don't let us? We may not be perfect, but the safest hands are still our own. Tony, if we don't do this now, it's gonna be done to us later. That's the fact. That won't be pretty. Wonder, are you saying they'll come for Carito? Me? Vision, we would protect the both of you. Natasha, maybe Tony's right. If we have one hand on the wheel, we can still steer. If we take it off. Sam, aren't you the same woman who told the government to kiss her ass a few years ago? Natasha, I'm just reading the terrain. We have made some very public mistakes. We need to win their trust back. Carito, that's gonna be extremely hard for me. Tony, if you just didn't act like an ass towards the secretary, maybe he wouldn't be looking at you in a bad light. And also, did I just mishear Natasha? Did you just agree with me? I want to take it back now. Natasha, no, I ah. Uh. Tony, no, you can't retract it. Thank you. Unprecedented. Okay, case closed. I win. Carito, but there's still one problem. Tony, and that is? Clarito, the darks. One of them can consume the world in darkness if left alive long enough. Everything thrown at them will be futile, I'll still be sent like a weapon for each time one appears. Steve, looks at his phone I have to go. 
he immediately leaves and everyone just stares dumbfounded. Carito. Location, London. In a hallowed cathedral, the resplendent voices of a choir fill the air, their ethereal hymn resonating with solemnity and reverence. The atmosphere was charged with a sense of melancholic serenity, as the congregation, led by Steve, bore the weight of a somber duty, carrying a sacred vessel that housed the remains of a cherished soul. Among the soldiers who shared this poignant burden, Carito, steadfast in his support, stood resolute by Steve's side, offering an unwavering embrace of empathy that transcended words. The bond they shared, forged in the crucible of shared experiences and battles fought side by side, now became a shield against the crushing weight of grief. As the procession advanced, Steve's countenance bore the traces of an inner tempest, his tears flowing like a river that traced the map of seventy years worth of memories and cherished moments. The choir's hymn seemed to echo the echoes of love and loss that resided within his heart, a poignant tribute to a love that transcended the passage of time. Upon reaching their destination, the coffin was placed with solemn reverence, a moment that seemed to halt the flow of time itself. Steve's gaze fixated upon a framed portrait of Margaret Peggy Carter, a visage that embodied a lifetime of devotion and unfulfilled dreams. Beside the picture lay flowers, symbols of beauty amidst sorrow. Seated among the soldiers, Sam and Carito remained steadfast allies. Their presence was a silent affirmation of unity in the face of loss, a symphony of support that transcended the boundaries of language. As the pastor rose to speak, the weight of their collective emotions seemed to permeate the very air, the sanctuary now a crucible of shared grief and remembrance. The pastor's words became a balm for weary hearts, offering solace amidst the tempest of sorrow. Pastor, and now, I would like to invite Sharon Carter to come up and say a few words. Amidst the solemn ambience of the gathering, where mournful hearts paid homage to a cherished soul, Sam, the epitome of gentle empathy, cast a tender gaze upon Steve. With a touch as light as the whisper of a breeze, he urged Steve to turn his attention from the floor, where sorrow weighed heavy upon his soul. Sharon, exhales shakily Margaret Carter was known to most as a founder of SHILD. But I just knew her as Aunt Peggy. She had a photograph in her office. Aunt Peggy standing next to JFK as a kid that was pretty cool. But it was a lot to live up to. Which is why I never told anyone we were related. I asked her once how she managed to master diplomacy and espionage in a time when no one wanted to see a woman succeed at either. She said compromise where you can. But where you can't, don't. Even if everyone is telling you that something wrong is something right, even if the whole world is telling you to move, it is your duty to plant yourself like a tree. Look them in the eye and say no, you move. As the sounds of time ebbed away, the farewell gathering had concluded, and the echoes of departing footsteps faded into the distance. Yet, in the heart of the sanctuary, amidst the lingering embers of solemnity, Steve remained a steadfast figure, his gaze fixated upon Peggy's portrait, like an anchor moored to memories of cherished yesteryears. The room seemed to exhale a collective sigh as Sam, cognizant of the sacredness of the moment, gently informed Steve of his intention to step outside, granting him the solace of solitude. With quiet deference, Sam departed, leaving the space to embrace its resident mourner. However, as the universe wove its tapestry of connections, two familiar souls, Carito and Natasha, moved in sync towards Steve. Their steps were soft, like whispers in the night, bearing the weight of compassion and understanding. Steve, you know, when I came out of the ice I thought everyone I had known was gone. Then I found out she was alive. I was just lucky to have her. Natasha, she had you back, too. Steve, who else signed? Carito, right now. It's Tony, ready vision. Steve, Clint? Natasha, says he's retired. Steve, Wanda? Carito, she's TPD. Natasha, I'm gonna go to Vienna for the signing of the accords. There's plenty of room on the jet. Steve, sigh. Carito, I'll sign too. Steve, Carito? Carito, it's not gonna be different for me. They put all these restrictions but once a dark pops out I'm gonna be sent out anyways because I'm the only one who can effectively damage them. Even though I have done a few upgrades to everyone's arsenal, it, it still doesn't even do that much damage to a pure dark. Steve, pinches the bridge of his nose. Natasha, just because it's the path of least resistance doesn't mean it's the wrong path. Staying together is more important than how we stay together. Steve, what are we giving up to do it? Natasha, sighs. Steve, I'm sorry Nat. I can't sign it. Natasha, I know. Steve, then what are you both doing here? Carito, don't be like that. We came here because we don't want you alone. You have helped me more times than I could count. 
So it's my turn to give you the company of a friend. Tab Steve's shoulder come on, group hug. In the poignant stillness of the chamber, where shadows danced upon the walls like fleeting spectres, a tender tableau unfolded. Amidst the echoes of departed souls and the lingering scent of remembrance, Carito stepped forth with an understated grace, uniting both Natasha and Steve in a heartfelt embrace. Like a master conductor orchestrating an ephemeral symphony, Carito drew them closer, the contours of their emotions intermingling in a dance of shared solace. In this intimate moment, their hearts found communion, an unspoken language that resonated with the depths of their camaraderie. Natasha, her eyes alight with a subtle radiance, found solace in Carito's gesture. Her smile, like a wisp of sunlight piercing through the clouds, mirrored the unyielding resilience that defined her character. As for Steve, his countenance, etched with the weight of memories and emotions, experienced a fleeting moment of solace. The tender embrace offered a sanctuary of comfort, allowing a brief respite from the burden he bore, like a gentle caress upon a wounded heart. Location, Vienna. In the heart of the bustling cityscape, a confluence of curiosity and trepidation gathers, forming a human tapestry that surrounds a specific edifice, a nexus of intrigue and guarded secrets. Like a whirlwind of activity, reports and journalists, bearing lenses and microphones, converge in an orchestrated dance to glean a scoop from the enigmatic events unfolding within. Yet, their endeavors prove futile, thwarted by an array of vigilant sentinels who form a formidable barrier, safeguarding the sanctum from prying eyes. Amidst the symphony of commotion, a procession of sleek black cars glides through the thoroughfare, bearing within their confines the creme de la creme of significance. Veiled in a veil of mystery, these occupants are emblematic of the enigma that engulfs the premises. Their identities, veiled in the cloak of secrecy, seem to tantalize the collective imagination. Meanwhile, amidst this orchestrated dance of activity, a poised news reporter assumes the mantle of a storyteller, her words a melodious symphony that paints the unfolding narrative. With a voice that holds a mesmerizing allure, she elucidates the current situation, her words a tapestry of intrigue that keeps the audience on the edge of their seats. News anchor, at a special United Nations conference, 117 countries have come together to ratify the Sokovia Accords. Within the hallowed confines of the building, a sense of anticipation hovered like a prelude to an orchestrated symphony. The air itself seemed to crackle with an electric undercurrent, as an assembly of essential figures, each a harbinger of expertise and significance, made their respective entrances into the room. Time flowed with measured precision, a conductor guiding the rhythm of the gathering. Each arrival, like a note in a harmonious composition, lent its own cadence to the unfolding drama. The room, a canvas upon which destinies converged, bore witness to the convergence of intellects, ambitions, and aspirations. Unstaffer. Excuse me, Ms. Romanov? Mr. Spider-Man? Natasha, yes? Carito, huh? Sleepy. Unstaffa, these need your signature. Natasha, thank you. Unstaffa, thanks. Carito, huh? Natasha, why are you so sleepy? Carito, playing Destiny 2, scratching his eyes. Natasha, again? You really need to give that a break. Carito, you are saying that to someone who studied video game programming? Natasha, point taken. In the midst of the scene, a mysterious figure emerges from behind, engaging in casual conversation. Tkala, I suppose neither of us is used to the spotlight. Carito, nope, it increases my anxiety. Natasha, oh, well, it's not always so flattering. Tkala, you both seem to be doing all right so far. Considering Ms. Romanoff's last trip was to Capitol Hill I wouldn't think you'd be particularly comfortable in this company. Carito, well. It takes a bit of practice to not start breaking down in front of a crowd. Tkala, scared of crowds? Carito, just when everyone's eyes are on me, I get anxious but I can control myself. Tkala, what about you Ms. Romanov? Natasha, well, I'm not comfortable really. Tkala, and that alone makes me glad you are here, Ms. Romanov and the Mr. Spider-Man. Carito, is there something that bothers you about this? Tkala, the Accords, yes. The politics, not really. Two people in a room can get more done than a hundred. Tkaka, unless you need to move a piano. In a fleeting moment, they exchanged words in their native tongue, a whisper of familiarity that wove an intimate connection between them. Undeterred by the brief diversion, they seamlessly resumed their conversation. Tkaka, Ms. Romanov. Mr. Spider-Man. Natasha, King Tkaka. Carito, it's a pleasure, your highness. Natasha, please, allow me to apologize for what happened in Nigeria. 
Clarito, yes, please accept my apologies as well, King Tkaka. Tkaka, thank you. Thank you both for agreeing to all of this. I'm sad to hear that Captain Rogers will not be joining us today. Natasha, yes, so am I. In an orchestrated symphony of technology, the speakers within the room stirred to life, their sonorous voices heralding the commencement of the meeting. With measured eloquence, a man stepped forth, his commanding presence accentuated by the authority in his voice. As if an invisible baton guided his words, he began to announce the initiation of the gathering with a refined demeanor that echoed with gravitas and purpose. Man on speakers, if everyone could please be seated, this assembly is now in session. Tkala, that is a future calling, such a pleasure. Tkaka, thank you. Carito, likewise smiles. With a grace that echoed their regal bearing, both Carito and Natasha proceeded to their designated seats, a symphony of poise and composure in their every step. The air held an air of reverence, as the king and prince of Wakanda engaged in a brief exchange, their native language lending an aura of cultural heritage and exclusivity to their conversation. Tkaka, native language for a man who disapproves of diplomacy, you're quite good at it. Tchala, I'm happy, father. Kaka places his hand on his son's cheek thank you. Tkala, grabs his father's hand thank you. Amidst the grand assembly, where the fusion of diverse cultures intertwined like an intricate tapestry, the illustrious figure of the king of Wakanda assumed his place before the gathered crowd. A halo of anticipation enveloped the room, as the air seemed to hush in reverence for the forthcoming oration. With a microphone in hand, the king's poised countenance exuded an aura of regal authority, an embodiment of eloquence and charisma that captivated all in attendance. As his mellifluous voice resonated through the airwaves, it carried the weight of generations, each word a carefully crafted brush stroke upon the canvas of collective consciousness. The audience, like captivated admirers of a masterful symphony, listened intently, enraptured by the symphony of wisdom and insight that emanated from the king's lips. Tkaka, when stolen Wakandan vibranium was used to make a terrible weapon. We in Wakanda were forced to question our legacy. Those men and women killed in Nigeria were part of a goodwill mission from a country too long in the shadows. We will not, however, let misfortune drive us back. We will fight to improve the world we wish to join. I am grateful to the Avengers for supporting this initiative. In the midst of the congregation, where the pearls of wisdom were being delicately strung together by the speaker's erudite discourse, Carito, the vigilant soul, donned a facade of attentiveness. Yet, within the recesses of his mind, the enthralling melodies of slumber began to beckon, luring him towards the realm of dreams. As his eyelids gently surrendered to the weight of drowsiness, his spider sense, attuned to the ebb and flow of unseen currents, flickered with alacrity, like a compass pointing true north. It guided his attention to the subtle shifts in the surroundings, urging him to remain on guard even in moments of repose. Tkaka, Wakanda is proud to extend its hand in pace. In the bustling tapestry of the urban landscape, where life's intricate threads intersect, Tkala, a vigilant observer, caught sight of a curious commotion. A crowd of people, like a constellation of stars fleeing from an enigmatic force, hastily dispersed from the vicinity of a van, its presence seemingly engendering both alarm and uncertainty. Amidst this tableau of enigma, a solitary dog, barking with unyielding conviction, seemed to play the role of an intrepid sentinel, guarding against an unseen threat. As the scene unfolded, like a collage of fleeting moments, Carito's consciousness became the canvas upon which the past and present converged. In a wave of realization, the jigsaw puzzle of memory clicked into place, and the enigma that had eluded him unraveled with pristine clarity. Within the sanctuary of his mind, a resurfaced memory breathed life into this very moment, rekindling a sense of purpose and direction. Carito and Kala, everybody get down. Amidst the grandeur of the assembly, where the air itself seemed to hold its breath in anticipation, a cataclysmic event unfolded, ushering chaos into the realm of serenity. Kala, embodying the embodiment of royal grace, sprinted with uncanny swiftness toward his father, the revered king of Wakanda. Beside him, Carito, the intrepid hero, found his heart laden with an internal tempest of remorse for having overlooked this crucial juncture, an oversight that now bore immense consequences. The urgency of the moment propelled the assembly into a dance of compliance, like shadows seeking shelter under the sanctuary of their tables. Carito and Kala, with determination etched upon their faces, were determined to thwart the impending threat and protect the king at all costs. In a desperate bid to secure a monarch's safety, they stretched their limits, reaching out with valiant resolve to grab hold of their esteemed ruler. Yet, the hands of fate seemed to conspire against them, as a colossal explosion, 
a force of devastation, engulfed the building's side with unforgiving might. The blast hurled them back with unrelenting force, testing their resilience and determination. As the debris settled and the aftermath unfolded, Carito, bearing the brunt of the explosion, rose with unyielding determination, grunting in both pain and frustration. Blood trickled from his lips, the physical manifestation of the inner turmoil he now faced. Amidst his introspection, he rushed to find the king, burdened by a cascade of self-recrimination. In this delicate moment of reckoning, Carito's internal lament echoed with the weight of guilt, a tempest of emotions that threatened to engulf him entirely. The cacophony of thoughts, the pressure of responsibility, and the relentless pursuit of saving others intermingled like a symphony of discord, testing the bounds of his resilience. His search for the king yielded a heart-wrenching revelation, the monarch, once the beacon of hope and wisdom, now lay motionless on the floor, in the depths of his soul. Carito knew that he had failed, that he had let the kingdom down. The clenching of his teeth, stained with blood, mirrored the crushing burden of responsibility that now rested upon his shoulders. Beside him, the prince, witnessing the hero's anguish, acted with unyielding valor, drawing strength from his resolve. Despite his own injuries, he crawled toward Carito, recognizing the unwavering commitment that the hero displayed, carrying the fallen king on his shoulders. Tkala, Spider-Man. How's my father? Carito, he. He's dead. Tkala, in shock and no. That's not possible. Pushes Carito to the side move. Carito, gets pushed to the side I already checked. He. Tkala, no. 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 Starts breaking down. Carito, places both his hands on his head I'm so. So sorry. In the midst of this somber tableau, a poignant moment unfolded, etched with profound emotion. Carito, bearing witness to the heart-wrenching scene, beheld the prince, who, amidst his anguish, carried the weight of his fallen further upon his shoulders. The prince's tears flowed like a river of sorrow, leaving an indelible scar destined to end throughout the course of his life. In the aftermath of the tragedy, the hands of time gently ebbed away, like a river's current carrying memories downstream. Meanwhile, in a separate realm of existence, Sharon made her way into the lobby of a hotel, her presence commanding the attention of Steve who engaged in a dialogue with her. Sharon, my mom tried to talk me out of enlisting, but not Aunt Peggy. She bought me my first holster. Steve, very practical. Sharon, and stylish. In the elegant milieu of the hotel lobby, Sharon, with an air of grace and composure, approached the regal elevator. Steve, CIA has you stationed over here now? Sharon, Berlin, Joint Terrorism Task Force. Steve, right, right. Sounds fun. Sharon, I know, right? Amidst the sacred embrace of silence, where unspoken words linger like ephemeral wisps of thought, Steve, a maestro of conversation, dauntlessly orchestrates the ongoing dialogue. The air itself seems to hold its breath, as if reverent to the exchanges that transpire between these two souls. Steve, I've been meaning to ask you, when you were spying on me from across the hall. Sharon, you mean when I was doing my job? Steve, did Peggy know? Sharon, she kept so many secrets. I didn't want her to have one from you. Elevator bell dings thanks for walking me back. Steve, sure. In a masterstroke of timing and presence, Sam materializes into the scene, his voice resonating with an air of authority and discernment, as he gracefully beckons Steve into attention. Sam, Steve, there's something you gotta see. In the aftermath of their encounter, Sam and the Steve retreated to their respective rooms. Sam, seeking solace, turned on the TV and tuned into the news channel. News anchor, a bomb was hidden in a news van. Ripped through the UN building in Vienna. More than 70 people have been injured. At least 12 are dead, including Wakanda's King Kaka. Officials have released a video of a suspect who they have identified as James Buchanan Barnes. The Winter Soldier. The infamous Hydro agent was linked to numerous acts of terrorism and political assassinations. Sharon, I have to go to work. Small time skip. Within the aftermath of the explosion, the scene unfolds like a tableau of organized chaos. The site, a theater of calamity and compassion, plays host to small medic camps where skilled hands tend to the injured with a delicate sense of urgency. A symphony of sirens and voices fills the air, intermingling with the resolute determination of firemen, who deftly wield hoses to quell the remnants of flames that dance upon the building's facade. Sharon, call MI6, see if we can get micro forensics to hurry this up. We need the whole team here in two hours or it's not worth it. Amidst the labyrinthine aftermath of the explosion, where chaos and stillness coalesce like a symphony of contrasts, a solitary figure graces a lonely bench. 
The Prince of Wakanda, adorned with a mantle of stoic composure, finds himself ensnared in a state of shock, his noble countenance concealing the tempest of emotions that surge beneath the surface. The remnants of the explosion have left their mark. Beside him, like a comforting serenade amidst the chaos, Natasha, the enigmatic soul, takes her place on the bench. With the grace of a confidant, she sits with a profound understanding of the prince's unspoken turmoil. Natasha, I'm very sorry. Tkala, looks and stares at a ring in my culture. Death is not the end. It's more of a stepping off point. You reach out with both hands and Bast and Sekhmet, they lead you into the green veldt, where you can run forever. Natasha, that sounds very peaceful. Tkala, my father thought so. He puts on the ring I am not my father. Natasha, Tkala. Task force will decide who brings in barns. Amidst the debris strewn ground, a poignant tableau of courage and compassion unfolds. Carito, a resolute figure, lands gracefully, burdened not only by the weight of his own injuries but also by the wounded souls he carries upon his shoulders. With a valiant sense of duty, he gently places the injured in the embrace of medic tents, where skilled hands tend to their needs with precision and care. In the midst of this symphony of aid and recovery, Carito's perceptive gaze locks onto Natasha, who stands amidst the tumultuous aftermath with the grace of a guardian angel. Her presence, like a beacon amidst the chaos, radiates a quiet strength and unwavering determination. And there, amidst the labyrinth of emotions, Tkala rises, embodying the spirit of resilience that defines the Wakandan legacy. His regal demeanor speaks volumes, as he stands tall amidst the ruins. Tkala, don't bother, Ms. Romanov. I'll kill him myself. Leaves. Natasha, sighs. Clarito, he's making a mistake. Natasha, jumps Jesus. You scared me. Clarito, Nat, he's making a mistake. Natasha, what do you mean? Clarito, Bucky wouldn't do this, at least not willingly. Natasha, cell phone rings yeah? Steve, on the phone you will write? Natasha, ah, uh, yeah, thanks. I got lucky. Steve, I'm guessing Carito is fine? Natasha, he took that in the face and is still fine. Steve, yup, sounds like him. Natasha, look, Steve, I know how much Barnes means to you. I really do. Stay home. You'll only make this worse. For all of us. Please. Steve, are you saying you'll arrest me? Natasha, no. Someone will. If you interfere. That's how it works now. Steve, if he's this far gone, Nat, I should be the one to bring him in. Natasha, why? Steve, because I'm the one least likely to die trying. Was gonna hang up. Carito, takes Natasha's phone Steve. Steve, Carito? Carito, you know he wouldn't do this unless he's being forced to. Steve, I'll keep that in mind, Carito. Thanks. Hangs up. With the weight of the call still lingering in his mind, Steve, a study in contemplation and composure, stepped into the inviting ambience of a quaint restaurant. Amidst the genteel hum of diners and the aroma of delectable cuisine, he found himself drawn to a familiar figure. Sam, embodying the essence of contentment, sat serenely, partaking in a culinary indulgence. Sam, she told you to stay out of it? Steve, nods. Sam, might have a point. Steve, he'd do it for me. Sam, 1945, maybe. I just want to make sure we consider all our options. The people that shoot at you usually wind up shooting at me. Sharon, tips have been pouring in since that footage went public. Everybody thinks the Winter Solider goes to their gym. Most of it it's noise. Except for this. Passes a folder to Steve my boss expects a briefing, pretty much now. So that's all the head start you're gonna get. Steve, thank you. Sharon, you're gonna have to hurry. We have orders to shoot on sight. Chapter 24, Civil War Part 3 Marvel DC, Images, Manquas, and every anime that will be mentioned and used in this story are not mine. They all belong to their respective owners. The main character carry to Josue Valdez and the story are mine. Location, Bucharest Amidst the vibrant marketplace, Bucky found himself perusing an array of freshly picked berries at a local stall. With a practiced hand, he selected a handful of luscious blueberries the proprietor engaging him in a lively exchange in Romanian. The linguistic exchange resulted in Bucky purchasing a larger quantity, as the vendor skillfully convinced him to take more. While delivering the payment for the berries he desired, Bucky's keen senses compelled him to surreptitiously scan his surroundings, ever wary of potential followers. Securing the bag of fruits, he arrived at a crossroad, patiently awaiting the crimson signal of the traffic lights. There, 
he noticed an enigmatic newspaper seller, who, for some inexplicable reason, seemed fixated on him. With a composed yet penetrating gaze, Bucky met the man's suspicious stare, unwittingly triggering a most unusual reaction. In an abrupt frenzy, the newspaper seller abandoned his post, fleeing in haste. Bucky was perplexed by this unexpected display, curiosity getting the better of him. He cautiously approached the deserted stall and discovered a newspaper that had caught the man's eye. As he perused its contents, a chilling realization washed over him, sending shivers down his spine. Instinctively, he knew something was amiss, prompting him to make a hasty retreat to his abode. Within the confines of Bucky's modest home, Steve had already made his way inside, embarking on a thorough reconnaissance of the meager surroundings. The dwelling, sparsely furnished and lacking extravagance, housed little more than essential sustenance in the fridge. As he surveyed the area, his discerning eyes fell upon a peculiar book resting near the refrigerator, its contents appearing to be a meticulously crafted list of some sort. Yet, what caught Steve's attention was an unexpected revelation, a photograph of himself within the pages, leaving him deeply intrigued. Before he could delve further into this enigmatic discovery, Falcon's timely warning reverberated in his ear, alerting him to imminent danger. Falcon, comms heads up, Cap. German special forces approaching from the south. Captain America, understood. As Captain's heightened senses attuned to his surroundings, an inscrutable sensation washed over him, an unmistakable inkling that he was not alone. Swiftly, he pivoted, an aura of readiness enveloping him, prepared for any potential confrontation that lay in wait. To his surprise, however, the figure before him was none other than Bucky, his gaze fixated upon the captain with an air of contemplation, devoid of any inclination towards combat. Captain America, do you know me? Bucky, comms your Steve, I read about you in a museum. Falcon, they've set the perimeter. Captain America, I know you're nervous, and you have plenty of reason to be. But you're lying. Bucky, I wasn't in Vienna. I don't do that anymore. Falcon, comms they're entering the building. Captain America, well, the people who think you did are coming here now. And they're not planning on taking you alive. Bucky, that's smart. Good strategy. They both start hearing footsteps. Falcon, comms they're on the roof. I'm compromised. Captain America, this doesn't have to end in a fight, Buck. Bucky, starts getting prepared it always ends in a fight. Falcon, comms five seconds. Captain America, starts getting desperate you pulled me from the river. Why? Bucky, reveals his metal arm I don't know. Falcon, comms three seconds. Captain America, yes, you do. Falcon, comms breach. 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 In a split second that seemed to stretch into eternity, a gleaming flash grenade hurtled into the room, its malevolent intent palpable. However, the captain's extraordinary reflexes sprang into action, and like a virtuoso wielding his instrument, he struck the grenade with the artistry of a maestro, sending it hurtling back into the unforgiving outside world with a deft flick of his shield. Undeterred by their initial setback, the assailants persisted, doubling down on their assault with yet another calculated throw. This time, Bucky, a formidable force in his own right, engaged in an acrobatic feat, deftly redirecting the grenade toward the captain, employing an audacious kick that betrayed his mastery of combat dynamics. Unperturbed, the captain met the explosive head-on, his indomitable shield forming an impregnable barrier, thwarting its destructive ambitions without a single scratch to show for it. Through the din of chaos, the confrontational symphony continued to crescendo. A sharpshooter from the law enforcement ranks sought to regain control of the situation, targeting Bucky with deadly precision. Yet, resourceful and adaptable, Bucky adroitly sought refuge behind a makeshift shield, leveraging a nearby bed for protection, impervious to the impending gunfire. Swiftly retaliating, he dispatched his aggressor with swift precision, utilizing his formidable metal arm as both weapon and shield, asserting his dominance with a calculated and emphatic takedown. Meanwhile, the unyielding pursuit of justice continued at the entrance, where the special forces unit sought to breach the stronghold. Unyielding in his resolve, Bucky demonstrated his formidable strength, brandishing a table with astounding force, propelling it with unparalleled velocity to obstruct the primary access point, foiling their advance. Within the confined quarters, the stakes intensified further as additional adversaries infiltrated through the windows. However, as fate would have it, these formidable foes stood little chance against the collective prowess of Captain America and his steadfast ally, Bucky. With grace and unwavering precision, they neutralized the intruders one by one, their collaboration and orchestration of martial mastery and strategic cooperation. The tide of battle seemed to ebb and flow, 
moments of tension interspersed with brief interludes of valor and ingenuity. Amidst the tumult, Captain America's eyes met Bucky's, a silent pact sealed between brothers in arms. However, destiny was not yet done testing them. Bucky, driven to evade capture, sought an escape through the back exit, only to encounter the resolute presence of Captain America, standing sentinel, unwilling to let his comrade go down a path of shadows. Captain America, Bucky, stop. You're gonna kill someone. With the fluidity of a seasoned acrobat, Bucky executed a nimble somersault, effortlessly soaring over Captain America's stalwart form, his agile movements a mesmerizing display of combat finesse. As he descended gracefully to the ground, he seemed poised for a fierce strike, his fist coiling back like a coiled serpent ready to strike its prey. Yet, in a stunning twist of expectations, Bucky's assault veered away from the captain, foregoing confrontation with his esteemed comrade. Instead, the room bore witness to an enigmatic act, as Bucky's fist, once a harbinger of force, met the floor with a controlled impact, reverberating with a faint echo throughout the room. Undeterred by the earthy connection, he revealed a concealed satchel secreted within the floor's recesses, the bag emerging like a hidden treasure long coveted. Bucky, I'm not killing anyone. He threw the bag to the next building. Amidst their earnest conversation, the tranquility of the small house was shattered as a formidable contingent of special forces operatives breached its confines. In a seamless display of combat prowess, Bucky became the vanguard of defense, his metal-clad shoulder deflecting the barrage of bullets directed his way. Sensing the imminent peril, Captain America instinctively shielded his ally, their unbreakable bond now the fulcrum of their collective strength. The skirmish intensified as another policeman, positioned outside the window, sought to gain the upper hand by taking aim at Bucky. Reacting with swiftness and precision, Bucky utilized his acrobatic prowess, propelling Captain America away from the trajectory of the oncoming bullets, resulting in a spectacular collision between the two adversaries. With the chaos escalating, Bucky locked eyes with his adversaries, a fierce determination etched across his features. Against a relentless onslaught of gunfire, he stood resolute, utilizing his unyielding arm to intercept the volley of bullets, a testament to his indomitable will. In a display of sheer force and strategic prowess, Bucky turned the tide of the confrontation, employing an expertly executed maneuver that propelled one assailant through a table, rendering him incapacitated. The next adversary's panic only played to Bucky's advantage, his retaliatory shots easily thwarted, culminating in a punishing blow delivered via a solid cement block. As the onslaught continued, Bucky met the challenge head-on, employing his metal appendage to devastating effect. A single punch shattered an officer's knee, leaving the hapless individual incapacitated, while a swift kick sent a group of officers tumbling down the stairs, their unfortunate companions following suit. Above, Another officer launched a futile offensive, spraying bullets relentlessly at Bucky, only to meet the unyielding resistance of the metal-armored warrior. In a daring display of might and precision, Bucky disarmed his opponent, incapacitating him with a decisive blow against the wall. Meanwhile, Captain America, recovering from the impact of their earlier collision, rose to rejoin the fray, his resolve unwavering. Stepping outside the room, he bore witness to a wounded police officer attempting to relay the unfolding situation in his diminished state. Special Forces Officer, he's headed down the east stairwell. With unwavering determination etched upon his resolute countenance, the captain swiftly seized the communicator, a stark emblem of discord, and with a potent display of physical prowess, crushed it within the formidable grasp of his hand. Unified by a shared purpose, his unyielding pursuit to locate Bucky remained undeterred. Bounding through the edifice with the grace of a seasoned athlete, he ascended the stairs with an unshakable purpose the intensity of the unfolding confrontation echoing through each step he took. As he reached the zenith of the stairwell, a riveting tableau greeted him, a ballet of battle unfolding before his very eyes. There, amidst a swirling maelstrom of combat, Bucky stood like a lone sentinel, confronting an onslaught of adversaries with an almost superhuman dexterity. The enemies encircled him, their collective aggression a formidable challenge to overcome. In the midst of this tempestuous clash, a serendipitous twist of fate unfolded. An inadvertent maneuver on the captain's part led to a fortuitous intervention. In an accidental brush against one of the assailants, an officer lost his footing, perilously teetering at the edge of the stairs. The captain's instinctive reflexes surged into action, propelling him once more into the air. With an agile leap, he intercepted the falling officer, cradling him safely within his firm grip, preventing a potential tragedy. Captain America, grunts come on, man. In a moment charged with tension, Bucky's piercing gaze met the captain's unwavering resolve, an exchange of emotions conveyed in an eloquent silence. 
the Winter Soldier, unwilling to cede ground, demonstrated his unyielding combat prowess with a calculated elbow strike, deftly incapacitating an officer who stood too close. With the agility of a battle-hardened warrior, Bucky's next move was a masterstroke of ingenuity. Breaking the support line of the staircase, he transformed the structure into an improvised swing, propelling himself to the floor below. In a breathtaking display of force, he dispatched another assailant, his well-aimed kicks sending the officer's head crashing into the unyielding cement wall, an emphatic testament to his superhuman strength. Meanwhile, the captain's mettle was equally evident as he deftly fended off the oncoming officers with precision and finesse. In a lightning-fast sequence, his seasoned combat skills were brought to the fore, delivering a resounding punch to one adversary's countenance, while employing his legendary shield as a formidable weapon, disarming and subduing another opponent. As Bucky's attempts to elude the captain took him on a daring descent through multiple floors, the relentless pursuit intensified. Aided by his metal arm, Bucky's acrobatics painted a breathtaking spectacle as he leapt from one floor to another. However, even the Winter Soldier's remarkable athleticism could not fully protect him from the jarring impact, which elicited a momentary cry of pain. Undeterred, Bucky emerged onto a different level, his senses ever attuned to potential escape routes. His gaze locked onto the back exit, determination fueling his every stride as he sprinted with unparalleled speed. With a prodigious leap, he bridged the chasm between buildings, the churning urban landscape bearing witness to his mesmerizing display of skill and resilience. In a display of agile finesse, Bucky deftly executed a controlled roll upon landing near the precipice of the building, preserving his momentum with fluid grace. Retrieving the bag he had hurled earlier, he embarked on a swift sprint towards the closest exit, yet his intentions were abruptly thwarted by a surprise assault from behind. As he rolled across the floor, he turned to confront his assailant, and there, before him, stood a formidable figure adorned in a vibranium panther suit, the Black Panther, resolute in his pursuit of vengeance for his father. With both warriors assuming battle stances, the air crackled with palpable tension, an impending duel of legendary proportions now unfolding. The vibranium claws glinted ominously, and the clashing of fierce combatants commenced. Bucky, a seasoned soldier, seized the initiative, launching an offensive salvo, yet the panther's unmatched speed and agility proved to be a formidable counter, repelling him with a pair of swift side kicks to his chest. Undeterred, Bucky sought to regain his footing launching a haymaker with unyielding determination. Alas, the panther countered with remarkable precision, evading the blow and launching a punishing back fist and a devastating flying knee that found its mark on Bucky's chest, sending him crashing into an air conditioner's condenser. With resilience that mirrored his superhuman strength, Bucky recovered swiftly, but the panther's onslaught remained relentless. In a stunning display of aerial prowess, the panther employed the condenser to propel himself skyward, executing a resounding hammer strike upon Bucky, driving him to his knees. Despite the mounting odds, Bucky's instincts prevailed, and in a moment of desperation, he seized a steel pipe, fortifying himself against the panther's unrelenting assault. The battlefield was now a maelstrom of skill and willpower, each fighter's resolve unyielding, each maneuver a testament to their martial prowess. In another corner of the fray, Captain America, the stalwart sentinel of justice, had arrived on the scene, witnessing the extraordinary clash between his comrade and the Black Panther clad in vibranium. As he spotted Sam nearby, he felt compelled to inform him of Bucky's whereabouts, for the stakes had risen exponentially, and the implications of this fateful encounter were beyond measure. The cityscape became an arena of epic confrontation, where vengeance and valor collided. Captain America, Sam, Southwest Rooftop. Falcon, who the hell's the other guy? Captain America, about to find out, steps back a few feet. With a seamless display of athletic prowess, the captain launched himself towards the adjacent edifice with unerring precision, a testament to his exceptional agility and keen strategic acumen. His landing, too, was a graceful fusion of power and grace, swiftly recovering from the aerial maneuver. Meanwhile, the epic clash between Bucky and the Panther unfolded like a symphony of strength and skill. In the heat of the battle, the panther's vibranium claws proved a formidable match for the steel pipe wielded by Bucky. The panther, with effortless grace, broke the pipe in two, poised to deliver a potentially lethal blow. Yet, Bucky's unwavering resolve manifested, allowing him to seize the panther's wrists with impressive tenacity, countering the impending attack. As the two warriors grappled, their fierce struggle was interrupted by the intervention of a special forces helicopter. However, even the formidable firepower of the helicopter's bullets proved inconsequential against the panther's vibranium-infused suit, the impervious material effortlessly repelling the attack.
Just as the captain contemplated seeking Falcon's assistance, a luminous streak of lightning illuminated the scene, heralding the arrival of an unexpected ally. In a spectacular aerial display, Falcon's would-be entrance was outshined as a bolt of lightning was swiftly followed by an acrobatic drop kick, expertly targeting the helicopter's tail. The resulting chaos sent the helicopter into an uncontrollable spin, while a distinctive whip signaled Spider-Man's timely appearance, as he gracefully landed on the rooftop. Spider-Man, Panther, you're making a mistake. Black Panther, don't get in my way, Spider. Amidst the flurry of action and intense combat, an opportune moment presented itself to Bucky, the briefest lapse in the Panther's unyielding vigilance. Seizing this fleeting instant, Bucky acted with swiftness and precision, expertly maneuvering himself to evade his formidable opponent. With the Panther moment really pushed to the side, Bucky sprang into motion, his lithe form weaving through the tumultuous battleground. The staccato rhythm of his footfalls resonated with purpose, each step a calculated measure to distance himself from the fray. Captain America, what are you doing here, Spider-Man? Spider-Man, no time. I'm gonna be in trouble for doing this but I know it's not Bucky that did this. Captain America, what? What do you mean? Amidst the labyrinthine cityscape, the pursuit of three extraordinary figures unfolded with a captivating display of finesse and prowess. The Winter Soldier, a virtuoso of Parker, fluidly descended the edifice, his agile movements resembling a choreographed dance with gravity itself. At his side, the Black Panther, equally adept in the art of movement, utilized his vibranium claws to carve a seamless path down the building's side, his descent as smooth as a brush stroke on canvas. In the midst of this dazzling spectacle, Spider-Man, that enigmatic web-slinger, demonstrated his own aerial expertise, following suit with astounding acrobatics. With a seamless leap, he defied gravity's pull, landing upon the ground with the elegance of a seasoned performer, his superhuman strength evident as the Earth bore witness to the force of his arrival. Not to be outdone, the indomitable Captain America, that emblem of valor and justice, was determined to match the otherworldly feats of his companions. Gazing down from the highest floor, he embraced the challenge, fearlessly soaring into the abyss with an unwavering resolve. Utilizing his iconic shield as both weapon and tool, he executed a graceful descent, his landing orchestrated with precision, ensuring a safe and controlled fall. Spider-Man, in his thoughts great, this place doesn't have nowhere to swing. Shit. As their relentless pursuit reached its zenith, the quartet of extraordinary individuals swiftly traversed the bustling cityscape their footfalls resounding with a harmonious symphony of determination. The vibrant metropolis bore witness to this extraordinary spectacle, a tale of valor and pursuit etched upon its very streets. Reaching the serene embrace of the park, they momentarily found refuge amidst the verdant surroundings. Yet, their respite was fleeting, as the reverberating blades of the recovered helicopter signaled that danger still lurked on their heels. With astonishing agility, Spider-Man demonstrated his acrobatic finesse once more, intercepting the helicopter's retaliatory fire, ensuring his comrades could find an escape route. In a daring move, the Winter Soldier led the charge, descending into the depths of a tunnel through a hidden aperture. Unyielding in their pursuit, the others followed suit. As they emerged onto the highway, speeding cars surrounded them. Yet, heedless of the danger that encompassed them, they pressed forward with superhuman speed transcending the limits of mere mortals. Their strides were a blur, outpacing the swiftest vehicles that roared by. The symphony of their motion sang of their prowess, each footfall a testament to their superhuman abilities. Amongst the exceptional ensemble, Spider-Man stood out, his web-slinging skills propelling him with unmatched velocity. With a graceful stride, he effortlessly closed the distance between himself and the Black Panther, a tantalizing pursuit that painted the highway with a captivating display of raw speed. Amidst the cacophony of pursuit, a lone police car surged alongside Captain America, its urgent radio transmissions imploring him to stand down. Undeterred by the vehemence of the plea, the resolve of these remarkable individuals only intensified, propelling them to even greater velocities. The captain, driven by unwavering purpose, made a daring decision to alter the course of the chase. With calculated precision, he collided with one of the police officer's cars, commandeering it in a bid to close the distance with his allies more expeditiously. Witnessing the captain's audacious maneuver, Spider-Man gracefully leapt atop the speeding cars, mirroring Bucky's own agile movements. His superhuman abilities bolstered his incredible speed, surging past the Black Panther with breathtaking fluidity, swiftly approaching the Winter Soldier's position. However, the captain's newly acquired car proved no refuge from the panther's unyielding pursuit. With determination etched upon his face, the panther clung tenaciously to the vehicle, 
undeterred by the captain's attempts to shake him off. Their fierce struggle played out upon the speeding car, the clash of wills a testament to their extraordinary abilities and unwavering dedication to their cause. Captain America, comms Sam, I can't shake this guy off. Falcon, comms right behind you. At that moment a multitude of police cars entered the tunnel, the captain started using the police cars in hopes to shake the panther off him but was very unsuccessful. The rest of the policemen went for Bucky and Spider-Man as they tried to ram the spider over but he backed flipped and latched onto the top of the car. The police in the passenger's seat opened his window and started shooting at the spider but he side flipped towards the man's direction and latched a web towards him that made him sling out of the car and stay stuck on the tunnel's walls. The police driver got out his gun and tried to shoot at Spider-Man but he flipped around and kicked the driver inside the car sending him flying to the passenger's seat door and shooting a web to break his fall. The spider spun around and made it to the front of the car, flipping it over and making a small blockade for some of the policemen that are chasing them, making around three cars crash into it as the spider turned round and sprinted towards Bucky. The Winter Soldier was nearing the exit of the tunnel but spotted a bunch of police cars going against traffic which made him run to the other lane of cars that are going the opposite of where he was going. Bucky jumped over cement barrels that block cars from passing over to the other opposite side of the road, while Spider-Man did the same. The captain was left with no choice but to crash through the barrels and go against the traffic to follow suit while most of the officers in the area were stuck in their cars thanks to Spider-Man. As Bucky continued to run he saw a man with a motorcycle and he carefully got in the man's way and pushed him off his vehicle, spun the vehicle around, and started to drive it, gaining more distance and going back to the correct side of the road. Spider-Man saw this and latched himself onto Captain's car but he forgot that the Black Panther was also taking a ride. On the top of the car Panther was holding himself on the car while fighting Spider-Man. The spider was fending off quite easily due to his wall crawling skill. Spider-Man shot a web at the Panther blinding him for a second and Sokka kicked him right in the face with a venom charged kick, sending him crashing to the roof of the tunnel and slamming to the ground. The spider turned around his spider senses going off and saw Bucky place a bomb on the roof of the tunnel making the exit start collapsing. He reacted quickly by using his lateral repulsion skill sending him blasting through the air and shooting a web at Bucky's vehicle, making both heroes roll through the floor. The captain drifted making the car go sideways and exited the vehicle sprinting towards the spider and winter soldier while his car was exactly behind him. In a fateful convergence, a moment of tension hung thick in the air as Captain America confronted Spider-Man, seeking answers that eluded them both. Yet, before words could be exchanged, the cityscape bore witness to an influx of authority. A vast contingent of police cars, akin to an advancing phalanx, descended upon the scene, their sirens a symphony of urgency. Above, a helicopter's blade sliced through the air, casting shadows upon the tumultuous ground below. As if summoned by destiny itself, War Machine, armored and resolute, descended from the heavens, a formidable force now poised before the captain and company. The weight of the moment intensified, every decision now carrying the potential for profound consequences. War Machine, blaster charges stand down, now. Spider-Man, wait don't hurt them. War Machine, good job on stopping them, Spider-Man. Spider-Man, wait, what? In a crescendo of tension, the labyrinthine streets bore witness to a congregation of lawmen, their weapons poised with unwavering determination. Unyielding in their commitment to uphold the law, they confronted the enigmatic figures before them, Bucky, Captain America, and the Black Panther, shrouded in a cloak of anonymity. War Machine, congratulations, Cap. You're a criminal. Spider-Man, wait, no do. War Machine, we'll talk about this later, Spider-Man. Not now. In the tempestuous confluence of valor and duty, the officers surged forth with an unwavering resolve their collective purpose unified in the apprehension of the enigmatic trio before them. The city's labyrinthine streets bore witness to this enthralling tableau, where allegiances hung in delicate balance, and destinies intertwined in a web of moral complexity. Amidst the charged atmosphere, Captain America's gaze found Spider-Man, a silent exchange that conveyed the weight of perceived betrayal. The web-slinger, masked and enigmatic, wore a countenance of profound confusion beneath the veil of his alter ego, a visage shielded from the world by the very fabric of his identity. As the officers closed in on their quarry, the Black Panther, an aura of regal enigma encircling him, shed the veil of anonymity. In a moment of revelation, he bared his face to the world, unveiling his true identity, T'Kala, the new king of Wakanda. The revelation held the assembled onlookers transfixed in astonishment, the fabric of their perceptions momentarily really reshaped by the revelation of royalty amidst their midst.
as the seconds stretched into a suspended reverie of surprise, Spider-Man remained an exception to the collective shock. His knowledge, acquired in the real world, was a secret he held close, lending him a unique vantage amidst this unfolding spectacle. War Machine, Your Highness. Location, Berlin. Beneath the steel and glass skyline of Berlin, a procession of law enforcement vehicles meandered with solemn purpose. The flow of traffic obediently yielded to the heavily fortified conveyance, bearing the enigmatic's bucky within its armored confines. The streets, once teeming with the vitality of city life, now stood witness to this austere parade, an extraordinary display of authority and vigilance. In a parallel vehicle, a gathering of formidable figures rode in quiet determination. Sam, Steve, Carito, and Kala composed this taciturn ensemble, their countenances poised with both resolve and circumspection. As the cityscape whirred past, Carito was entrusted with a crucial charge, to keep an unwavering vigil on the events unfolding before them. Sam, talking to Tkalazo. You like cats? Steve, Sam. Sam, what? Dude shows up dressed like a cat, you don't wanna know more? Carito, it's part of his culture man. Sam, hey, the backstabber is talking. Carito, fucking. It's not like that. Sam, sure, sure tilde. Whatever. Carito, TCH. Steve, that's enough. Your suit, it's vibranium? Tkala. Just like Spider-Man said, it's part of our culture. The Black Panther has been the protector of Wakanda for generations. A mantle passed from warrior to warrior. And now, because your friend murdered my father. I also wear the mantle of king. So, I ask you. As both warrior and king. How long do you think you can keep your friend safe from me? Carito, it wasn't Bucky. Tkala, the evidence says otherwise, Spider. Carito, no. It's a dude called Zemo who's framing him. Kala, your attempts to protect him concern me, Spider. Are you an enemy or an ally? Carito, I'm looking for the true culprit. And if I have to do it alone to prove you wrong then I will. I will prove you wrong, your highness. I'll prove everyone wrong. Kala. The air crackled with palpable tension as the conversation drew to a close, leaving an aura of unease in its wake. With resolute purpose, the entourage proceeded through a somber tunnel, their footsteps echoing amidst the hallowed silence. The path led them to the Joint Counter-Terrorist Center, a bastion of authority and intrigue. As they arrived in the depths of the facility, Bucky emerged, restrained within the confines of a glass container, a stark reminder of the gravity of the situation. This sight, reminiscent of a captive creature, evoked a sense of empathy in Steve, who regarded his longtime comrade with concern, but determination urged him forward, leading the way with the others in tow. Their somber procession found them in the presence of an enigmatic figure, clad in a grey tuxedo, his distinguished visage adorned with a mane of white hair. This enigmatic presence held an aura of authority, his every word imbued with significance. Beside him stood Sharon. Steve, what's gonna happen to him? Everett Ross, same thing that ought to happen to you. Psychological evaluation and extradition. Sharon, this is Everett Ross, Deputy Task Force Commander. Steve, what about a lawyer? Everett Ross, lawyer. That's funny. See their weapons are placed in lockup. He looks at Spider-Man good work, stopping them. Carito, thoughts that's not. Goddamn, it. Talks thank you, sir. Everett Ross, will write you a receipt. Sam, I better not look out the window and see anybody flying around in that. As the group pressed forward, their footsteps resonated with purposeful cadence, echoing through the labyrinthine corridors of the Joint Counter-Terrorist Center. Steve. Ever the sentinel, cast a lingering gaze back at Bucky, his expression a complex tapestry of concern and remorse. The elevator doors gracefully glided shut, marking the end of a fleeting moment of introspection. Within the confines of this metallic sanctuary, their collective focus shifted towards the enigmatic figure of Everett Ross, whose words now served as a beacon of guidance amidst the shadows of uncertainty. Everett Ross, you'll be provided with an office instead of a cell. Now, do me a favor, stay in it. Kala, I don't intend on going anywhere. Amidst the throngs of the bustling crowd, an enigmatic figure emerged, a silhouette that seemed to glide effortlessly through the labyrinth of humanity. Natasha, the epitome of finesse and subtlety, materialized before Steve, like a whisper of intrigue amidst the cacophony of the surrounding masses. Natasha, for the record, this is what making things worse look like. Steve, he's alive. In the labyrinthine corridors of the Joint Counter-Terrorist Center, the entourage pressed on, guided by a shared sense of duty. 
Their footsteps, a measured cadence amidst the hallowed silence, carried them to a sanctum of authority, a high security office, where Tony Stark, a paragon of technological brilliance, held court alongside a select few. Within this enclave of secrets and strategy, screens adorned the walls like an illuminated tapestry, each displaying a mosaic of camera feeds from disparate locations, an intricate web of intelligence and information. The room itself, a nexus of surveillance and analysis, bore the weight of responsibility, a citadel of vigilance where the threads of global events converged. Tony, no, Romania was not accords sanctioned, Colonel Rhodes is supervising cleanup. Natasha, try not to break anything while we fix this. And you. Points at Carito. Carito, fuck. Natasha, fuck indeed, we are talking later. Tony, on the phone consequences? You bet there'll be consequences. Obviously, you can quote me on that because I just said it. Anything else? Thank you, sir. Hangs up and walks towards Sam and Steve. Steve, consequences? Tony, Secretary Ross wants you both prosecuted. Had to give him something. Steve, I'm not getting that shield back, am I? Natasha, technically, it's the government's property. Wings too. Sam, that's cold. Tony, warmer than jail and now you. Carito. I know, you don't have to pull a gnat. A few minutes later. In the inner sanctum of the Joint Counter-Terrorist Center, the trio, Tony Stark, Natasha Romanoff, and Carito, found themselves in a discreet chamber, a realm secluded from the prying eyes of the outside world. Within the confines of this private room, the air was charged with a sense of confidentiality and gravity. Tony, what the hell were you doing? Carito, keeping Bucky alive from the new king of Wakanda. Natasha, you could have just left it to Rudy. Carito, it wasn't Bucky, I already said this. Tony, Carito, no matter how many times you say this no one is gonna listen. Everyone believes it was the Winter Solider. Carito, grunts no, it's a dude named Zemo. Natasha, Carito, you must be stressed out and tired. Go and rest for a bit, please. Carito, a. Eh? Are treating me like a crazy person? Natasha, no, I didn't mean to put it like that. Carito, a fucking course. I'm fucking batshit crazy. Thank you for reminding me Nat, you are such a good fucking friend. Natasha, wait, Carito. I'm sorry. In a crescendo of emotion, Carito's countenance betrayed a simmering anger that surged forth like a tempest. In an act of defiance, he rose from his chair with palpable determination, Casting an impassioned gaze upon Natasha, his anger manifesting in a forceful shove that sent her momentarily off balance. His frustration now channeled into an act of raw strength, Carito's foot connected with the door, unleashing a kinetic burst that propelled it open with breathtaking force, like a gust of wind tearing through the hallway. The door's trajectory echoed through the space. Natasha, W why didn't you help me? Tony, you shouldn't have said that in the first place. Natasha, I was just worried for him. He's always stressed. Tony, that doesn't excuse what you implied, even if it was an accident. You don't know half of what he's been through. Natasha, he doesn't open up to anyone. How could I know? It's not like you know any better. Tony, actually, I do. Now go and think about an apology for him. While the brothers talk, walks away. Natasha, sighs goddammit. Amidst the corridors of authority, Tony Stark retraced his steps, his keen intellect attuned to the emotions that hung in the air like a delicate symphony. As he approached the office once more, his discerning eyes fell upon Carito, the force of his anger palpable even from a distance. In a display of wisdom and empathy, Tony chose to grant Carito the space he needed to collect his thoughts, recognizing the importance of allowing emotions to settle before engaging in conversation. With the sagacity of a seasoned strategist, Tony approached Steve. Tony, hey, you wanna see something cool? I pulled something from Dad's archives. Felt timely. He sees Steve sitting down at the meeting table in the middle of the office. Tony, FDR signed the Lend Lease Bill with these in 1941, provided support to the Allies when they needed it most. Steve, some would say it brought our country closer to war. Tony, size C? If not for these, you wouldn't be here. I'm trying to. What do you call it? That's an olive branch. Is that what you call it? Steve, is Peppa here? I didn't see her. Tony, we're kinder. Well, not kinder. Steve, pregnant? Tony, no, definitely not. We're taking a break. In a sudden and unexpected breach of the room's sanctity, Carito burst forth like a tempest, his emotions churning in a maelstrom of turmoil. 
Tony and Steve, figures of discernment and strategy, were momentarily caught off guard, their expressions tinged with a blend of confusion and concern. Carito, don't make my appearance stop your convo. Keep going. Tony, sighs anyways, it was nobody's fault. Carito, the pepper thing? Tony, MHM. Carito, oh. Steve, I'm so sorry, Tony. I didn't know. Tony, a few years ago, I almost lost her. Carito, when we were attacked by those airplanes in your house. Tony, yeah, the reason why I trashed all my suits. Then, we had to mop up Hydra. And then Ultron. My fault, Carito was right that time. Carito, so you believe me? Tony, of course, I'm just doing the search by myself. Carito, fucking finally. Tony, continuing what I was saying. You know that I never stopped after all that happened, because the truth is I don't want to stop. I don't want to lose her. I thought maybe the Accords could split the difference. Size in her defense. I'm a handful. Carito, indeed. Tony, seriously, Carito? Carito, it's payback for scolding me. Tony, grunts in annoyance. Carito, though, didn't you tell me that your dad was kind of a pain in the ass? Tony, not kinda, he was. I still don't know how he and mum always made it work. Steve, I'm glad Howard got married. I only knew him when he was young and single. Tony, oh really? You two knew each other? Carito, you didn't know? Tony, he never said a word of him. Maybe only a thousand times. Carito, bruh. Tony, God, Steve I hate you. Steve, I don't mean to make things difficult. Tony, I know because you're a very polite person. Unlike this mood over here. Carito, man, fuck you. Shoots a web at Tony's tuxedo. Tony, come on, man. Carito, don't worry. It'll come out in an hour. Tony, I swear to God. Carito, don't do that, he's gonna send me to do it. Tony, face palms. Carito, returning to the topic, we know that when Steve sees something wrong he can't ignore it. Steve, sometimes I wish I could. Tony, no, you don't. Steve, looks down and then up no, I don't, sometimes. Tony, sometimes I wanna punch you in your perfect teeth. But I don't wanna see you gone. We need you, Cap. Carito, you may kiss the bride. Tony, Carito, one more I swear one more and I'll kick you out of this room. Carito, chuckles. Tony, sighs so far, nothing's happened that can't be undone, if you sign. Carito, he'll not sign. Tony, but why? We can make the last 24 hours legit. Barnes gets transferred to an American psych center instead of a Wakandan prison. Steve, grabs a pen and stands up walking slowly as he stares at the pen. Carito, sighs. Steve, I'm not saying it's impossible. But there would have to be safeguards. Tony, sure. Once we put out the PR file, those documents can be amended. I'd file a motion to have you, Carito and Wanda reinstated. Carito, wait, me? I thought that was already fixed. And what about Wanda? Tony, well, a lot of people don't like you Carito, after that. Carito, oh for fuck's sake. Pinches the bridge of his nose. Steve, what about Wanda? Tony, she's fine. She's confined to the compound, currently. Vision's keeping her company. Steve, oh, God, Tony. Gets irritated. Carito, what? I told you not to do that, mad. Steve, every time I think you see things the right way Tony talks over him. Tony, it's 100 acres with a lap pool. It's got a screening room. There are worse ways to protect people. Carito, protection? She's gonna fucking flip out eventually. Steve, is that how you see this? This is protection? It's internment, Tony. Tony, she's not a US citizen. Carito, WHO gives a shit. She's human. Just because she ain't American she has to be treated like an animal locked in a cage. Steve, oh, come on. Sighs. Tony, what? They don't grant visas to weapons of mass destruction. Carito, don't you fucking call her a weapon. She's not a tool, nor a weapon. Am I also a weapon, huh? Tony, give me a break. Fuck. I'm doing what has to be done. To stave off something worse. Steve, you keep telling yourself that. Looks at the pen hate to break up the set. Places the pen he grabbed back on the table and walks out. Carito's penetrating gaze met Tony's unwavering stare, a duel of wills unfolding before them. Amidst the gravity of the moment, 
a sense of disappointment seemed to linger in the spaces between their locked A's. Tony, what? Carito, you wanna start another argument, with me? Tony, I'm too mentally exhausted for that. Carito, same. In the aftermath of the charged encounter, a profound silence enveloped the room as Carito's disappointed countenance gradually softened. Fatigue seemed to overcome him, and he succumbed to a restless slumber, his body sinking into the chair like a shadow fading into the night. Tony, a figure of contemplation, lingered in the stillness of the moment, allowing the weight of the encounter to linger in the air before he quietly departed, leaving the room shrouded in the memories of their wordless exchange. Beyond the confines of this private chamber, a separate tableau unfolded, a symphony of questions and answers, veiled in the shadows of an interrogation room. Onlookers gathered around screens, their gazes fixated on the unfolding drama as a mysterious figure entered the cell to engage in a clandestine conversation with Bucky, like two dancers engaged in an intimate pas de deux. Zemo, in a disguise hello, Mr. Barnes. I've been sent by the United Nations to evaluate you. Do you mind if I sit? Sit down at a table your first name is James? In the recesses of the surveillance room, an assembly of watchful eyes, led by Sharon, Sam, and Steve, remained captivated by the unfolding interrogation. The screens that adorned the walls painted a mesmerizing mosaic, each frame a glimpse into the enigmatic dance of questions and answers, obscured from the world outside. Sharon, walks towards Sam the receipt for your gear. Sam, reads it bird costume? Come on. Sharon, I didn't write it. She secretly overrides an access code so that Steve and Sam could hear and see the interrogation. Zemo, in disguise I'm not here to judge you. I just want to ask you a few questions. Do you know where you are, James? No response from Bucky I can't help you if you don't talk to me, James. Bucky, my name is Bucky. Steve, looks at the mug shoot taken from Bucky why would the task force release this photo, to begin with? Sharon, get the word out, involve as many eyes as we can. Steve, right. It's a good way to flush a guy out of hiding. Set off a bomb, and get your picture taken. Get seven billion people looking for the Winter Soldier. Sharon, you're saying someone framed him to find him? Sam, Steve, we looked for the guy for two years and found nothing. Steve, but wait, didn't Carito say something about someone framing Bucky? Sharon, so you are implying that Bucky is being framed? Steve, Sharon, wake Carito up. With a graceful poise, Sharon navigated her way across the room, her footsteps carrying an air of silent determination. As she reached the other end of the table, a sense of purpose emanated from her very presence. Gently, with a soft touch, she roused Carito from his restless slumber, like an artist coaxing life into a dormant masterpiece. Carito, stretches yep, yep. I'm awake. Steve, Carito, you keep saying something about Bucky being framed by this Zemo guy. Carito, oh yeah, he a pretty smart bastard. He made it all look like it was Bucky's fault when he's actually the mastermind. Sharon, and you know this how? Carito, Sharon, I hack the Pentagon for fun. Of course, I'll know where to actually look. Looks at the TV. Zemo, in disguise tell me, Bucky. You've seen a great deal, haven't you? As if drawn by an invisible force. Carito's attention snapped towards the flickering screen, a magnetic pull that held the room in rapt attention. Carito, when did the interrogation start? Sam, just a few minutes? Carito, fuck. That's Zemo. Steve, wait what? Carito, that's Zemo. The one who framed Bucky. He planned to have Bucky here in the first place. Shit, why didn't anyone woke me up? Stands up and exits the meeting room. Within the confines of the chamber, a trio of figures, including Sharon, Sam, and Steve, stood like sentinels, their countenances marked with a complex array of emotions, concern and extreme suspicion intermingling in a delicate dance. As their eyes remained fixed on the enigmatic figure interrogating Bucky, the room seemed to pulsate with tension, each heartbeat echoing with uncertainty. Steve, let's hope you're right, Carito. In the corridors of purpose, Carito strode with an air of determination, his pace mirroring the gravity of the situation. Beside him, a figure of innovation and strategy, Tony, walked in measured steps, flanked by Natasha and the diligent cadre of workers, all navigating the labyrinthine corridors with purposeful intent. Tony, whispers did you get your beauty sleep? Carito, whispers Tony, that's the guy. Tony, what? Carito, the one interrogating Bucky. He's the actual culprit. That's Zemo. Tony, Carito, are you sure? Carito, yes, I'm fucking sure. 
he sneaked inside to get to Bucky and he's planning something. In a sudden surge of heightened perception, Carito's keen instincts detected a distant rumbling of energies, an ominous harbinger of an impending storm. A symphony of warning signals resonated within him, as if an unseen hand was gently tugging at the strings of his consciousness. Far from the bustling cityscape, an electromagnetic pulse, its epicenter miles away, unleashed its forceful embrace upon the metropolis, shrouding the sprawling expanse in darkness and disconnection. In this moment of cascading disruption, the city's grand tapestry seemed to fray at the edges, its pulsating energy reduced to flickering embers. Everett Ross, on comms come on, guys, get me eyes on Barnes. Carito, forget about Bucky. Look for the one that was interrogating him. He's the one who caused this. Everett Ross, Spider-Man, leave this to the experts. Carito, excuse me? Tony, grabs Carito by the shoulder and taps his sunglasses Friday, get me a source on that outage. Carito, the EMP was five miles in the main power station of Berlin. Tony, how did you? Carito, spider senses are better. Starts running off. In the midst of chaos and uncertainty, Carito's agile figure, akin to a fleeting shadow, darted through the darkened corridors with a sense of purpose. His instinctual response, honed by his uncanny spider senses, propelled him towards Bucky's location, a beacon of determination amidst the encroaching darkness. Yet, Carito was not alone in this dance of pursuit. Right on his heels, a duo of formidable companions, Sam and Steve, moved with seamless coordination. Their presence, like sentinels in the night, echoed the resolute resolve that propelled them forward, despite the pervasive obscurity that engulfed the once vibrant facility. Unbeknownst to the trio, the enigmatic figure of the new king of Wakanda silently observed their movements, a regal figure shrouded in mystery and intrigue. Recognizing the significance of their collective pursuit, the king chose to follow in their wake. Inside the cell with Bucky and Zemo. Bucky, what the hell is this? Zemo, why don't we discuss your home? Not Romania. Certainly not Brooklyn, no. Grabs the red book I mean your real home. In the dimly lit room. An atmosphere of intrigue and tension hung heavy in the air as Bucky's piercing gaze fell upon the book held by Zemo. His countenance, once neutral and inscrutable, underwent a swift metamorphosis, transmuting into a visage of profound horror and disquietude. Zemo, speaking in Russian longing. Bucky, no. Zemo, rusted. Bucky, stop. Zemo, 17. A subtle tremor seemed to take hold of Bucky's metallic appendage the once steady and formidable arm now exhibiting an erratic dance of vibrations. Bucky, stop. Zemo, daybreak. Bucky, ha, G-H-N-N-N-N. As an intense encounter unfolded, an overwhelming migraine abruptly assaulted Bucky's senses, leaving him at the mercy of a perplexing possession. His consciousness became a battleground, where memories of a distant program resurfaced, akin to intricate algorithms unfolding in the vast computer network. Struggling against the invisible shackles of this enigmatic force, Bucky's indomitable spirit surged forth, as if attempting to break the very chains that bound his mind. In the midst of this mental turmoil, the anguish in Bucky's cries echoed with the haunting desperation of a soul yearning for liberation. His once composed demeanor gave way to a frenzied frenzy, as if grappling with an unseen adversary. Zemo, Furnace as the conflict raged on, an enigmatic affliction overcame Bucky, causing his form to tremble uncontrollably, his very being ensnared in the clutches of an insidious force. Tormented by the tumultuous upheaval within, he found himself entangled in a battle of wills, wherein his autonomy faltered like a flickering candle amidst a tempestuous scale. In the throes of this internal tempest, a symphony of distress echoed through the air, the fervent cries of a soul grappling with an alien invasion of its corporeal sanctuary. The relentless barrage of punches directed at the unyielding glass door stood as a testament to the relentless determination with which he sought to break free from this ethereal prison. Each strike upon the glass door bore the weight of a thousand struggles. Yet, the pain he endured, whether physical or spiritual, seemed to pale in comparison to the inner torment he grappled with, like a maestro conducting a concerto of suffering. Zemo, 9. Amidst the tumultuous encounter, the Winter Soldier's primal growls reverberated through the air as he relentlessly pummeled the unyielding glass door. Zemo, homecoming. 1. Freight car. With a final display of formidable strength, Bucky delivered a resolute punch, causing the entire door to crumble before him. As the shards of his conquest settled around him, he descended to his knees in profound silence, an emblem of both his physical prowess and the emotional toll of his relentless struggle. Observing this unfolding spectacle with cautious intrigue, Zemo, ever the cunning strategist, 
approached the battle-worn soldier with a stoic countenance. Behind his inscrutable facade lay a mind calculating every conceivable outcome, prepared for the possibility that his intricate plan might not fully unfold as intended. Zemo, in Russian soldier? Winter soldier, in Russian ready to comply. Zemo, mission report. December 16, 1991. With Kerito, Sam, and Steve. In accordance with the intelligence relayed by Sharon, the trio hastened their steps, their synchronicity indicative of a well-honed team. Their destination was the fifth floor, a setting that held promises of revelation and danger alike. As they emerged upon that floor, a tableau of subdued adversaries greeted their discerning eyes. Strewn about like discarded pawns on a grand chessboard, multiple men lay prostrate on the ground, their unconscious forms bearing testimony to the swift and decisive action that had transpired mere moments before. Each fallen figure, presented an enigma shrouded in mystery. Carito, damn, he works fast as fuck. Zemo, acting help. Help me. Carito, that's him, get him. Steve complied with Carito's directive, securing his grip on Zemo's jacket, evoking an unspoken exchange of emotions between the trio. Steve, who are you and what do you want? Upset. Zemo, to see an empire fall, crushes a dark stone in his hand. As Carito delegated the task of keeping watch outside the cell to Sam, he moved to join forces with Steve in restraining Zemo. Yet, in a display of remarkable instinct, his spider sense tingled, warning him of impending danger from the right. Reacting with uncanny swiftness, Carito adeptly evaded an attack from the Winter Soldier, narrowly avoiding what could have been a devastating blow. With a precision honed through experience, Carito launched a swift cross punch, creating a momentary gap between him and the relentless soldier. However, the sudden counterattack seemed to enrage the Winter Soldier, intensifying the ferocity of his strikes. Nevertheless, the spider's agility granted him an advantage, allowing him to deftly counter and evade the soldier's onslaught. Amidst the fervor of the battle, an inexplicable metamorphosis began to unfold. A shroud of darkness enveloped Bucky, as if a sinister aura had consumed his being. This ominous transformation presented an enigma, heightening the stakes of the confrontation. As the clash continued, Carito positioned himself to block an incoming uppercut from Bucky. However, to his astonishment, the soldier's strength appeared to have undergone a drastic augmentation, rendering Carito's defense inadequate. The tremendous force behind Bucky's strike pierced through the spider's block, delivering a powerful uppercut beneath his jaw. With a thunderous impact, Carito was sent hurtling through the floor above. Carito, holding his chin and gh. Fuck. What was that? Carito's AI spoke inside his head. It seems that Zemo was given a distressed stone. Carito, the fuck is that? How did he even get one in the first place? The stone had two proposes, the first being buffing anyone you choose and the second is a call for backup. Carito, wait, backup? As the fray unfolded, an acute sense of apprehension washed over him, for he perceived the entrance of two formidable entities into the premises. Despite the mounting anxiety, he knew he must first attend to the immediate urgency at hand, the brawny winter soldiers overpowering onslaught against Steve, whose resilience seemed to wane under the relentless assault. Witnessing the throw that sent Sam hurtling across the cell further heightened the urgency of the situation. Spider-Man, auto-equip suit. A blue light surrounds Carito as he equips his suit. On the lower level, Steve valiantly rose from a forceful kick that sent him reeling, demonstrating his tenacity. However, the Winter Soldier's blows rained down upon him with unyielding ferocity, compelling the captain to utilize his entire body to bury and endure punishing impacts, causing pained grunts to escape his lips. Evidently outmatched, Steve resorted to nimble evasions in a desperate bid to preserve his footing. Despite Steve's dexterity, Bucky's newfound might proved overwhelming, inexorably pushing the valiant captain back. A stroke of luck allowed Steve to evade a bone-crushing cross, yet the strain of their confrontation manifested in a deep dent on the elevator door. Unfortunately, fortune turned against Steve when the Winter Soldier's next punch, swift and unyielding, found its mark upon his chest shattering the very elevator doors that had stood as a barrier between them. With resuming finality, Steve crashed to the floor, his body finding an unceremonious landing, his face meeting the cold surface of the elevator. Meanwhile, Bucky roamed the facility with an air of indomitable determination, leaving a trail of incapacitated adversaries in his wake. Regardless of their skill or prowess, all who opposed him found themselves powerless against his newfound and enigmatic strength, which had surged forth from the mysterious stone. As the events unfolded, Tony, Natasha, and Spider-Man arrived at the scene, 
their timely presence indicating that the confrontation had reached a pivotal juncture, fraught with implications yet to be unraveled. Black Widow, we're in position. With swift precision, Tony initiated a sequence on his watch, conjuring a blaster that materialized in his palm. Seizing the opportunity, he emerged from cover, firing a concussive sound wave toward the soldier, inducing him to cringe in pain while covering his ears in defense. In a strategic display of combat finesse, Tony moved in close, employing a blinding flash to momentarily disorient his adversary. Tony's tactical prowess came into play as he disarmed the soldier, deftly relieving him of the firearm he had taken from incapacitated guards. The ensuing clash was a masterclass of lightning-fast punches and counters, with both opponents displaying remarkable agility and skill. When the Winter Soldier aimed the gun at Tony, the quick-witted billionaire instinctively interposed his blaster arm to shield himself. The deflected shot harmlessly ricocheted away, thanks to the ingenuity of Tony's blaster watch, which had intercepted the lethal projectile. A fortuitous opportunity presented itself, allowing Tony to disarm the soldier of his weapons magazine, promptly using it as an improvised melee weapon, striking the Winter Soldier across the face. In retaliation, the soldier unleashed a devastating punch that propelled Tony into a table, the sheer force of the blow momentarily overwhelming him. Sharon entered the fray as the soldier's second opponent, launching a rapid sidekick that regrettably met his block. Black Widow capitalized on the moment, leaping into action with a flying knee aimed at the soldier's chest, only to witness his steadfast resilience as he absorbed the impact and quickly repositioned himself in a defensive stance. As a formidable tag team, Sharon and Black Widow sought to gain the upper hand, briefly overwhelming the Winter Soldier with their coordinated attacks. Nevertheless, the soldier's prowess prevailed as he swiftly flipped Sharon, causing her to collide with a table, temporarily sidelining her. Undeterred, Black Widow unleashed a barrage of elbow strikes upon the soldier's head, but he retaliated by forcefully slamming her onto a table, wielding his metal arm as a conduit to deliver incapacitating electric shocks. Black Widow, you could at least recognize me, gasping for air. Amidst the unfolding turmoil, a resounding twit pierced the air as Spider-Man swung into the fray, a nimble force to be reckoned with. His agile form intercepted the Winter Soldier's path as his foot connected with Bucky's face, compelling him to relinquish his grasp on Black Widow. In a dazzling display of combat prowess, Spider-Man executed a rapid series of strikes, a jab, a cross, a hook, and a low kick, rendering the soldier momentarily off balance, only to punctuate the combination with a swift back kick to the chest that sent Bucky tumbling to the ground. Seizing the momentum, Tkala, the formidable Black Panther, engaged the Winter Soldier in a breathtaking flurry of kicks. The clashing of their skills manifested as a mesmerizing dance, each step a calculated maneuver in the intricate choreography of combat. Yet, amidst the exchange, Tkala's calculated strikes found their mark, and a solid jab connected with Bucky's nose, causing his head to recoil under the impact. Fueled by frustration, the soldier's retaliation was swift and unnerving, as he channeled an eerie dark energy into his fist. With a burst of rage-fueled force, he unleashed a devastating punch upon Tkala's chest, sending the King of Wakanda hurtling across the cafeteria, the kinetic impact resounding like a clap of thunder. Seizing the opportunity to retreat, Bucky darted towards the stairs in an attempt to escape. However, his path was obstructed by Spider-Man, who awaited him with keen anticipation, ready to continue their intricate dance of combat. Spider-Man, you know, it's pretty hard to hold back when you are trying not to kill a friend accidentally. Winter Soldier, TCH charges his fist with dark energy. In a ballet of combat finesse, the soldier initiated the offensive, seeking to gain the upper hand. Yet, the agile Spider-Man deftly evaded the incoming strike with a graceful lean, reminiscent of a dancer evading a partner's advance. Seizing the opportune moment, Spider-Man launched a swift jab, connecting with Bucky's face, causing a momentary daze to cloud the soldier's senses. With an astounding display of speed and precision, the spider followed up with a devastating uppercut expertly aimed below Bucky's jaw. The impact resonated with such force that the soldier was lifted momentarily into the air, as if gravity momentarily lost its hold on him. However, the acrobatic spectacle didn't end there. Like a maestro composing his magnum opus, Spider-Man delivered the piece to resistance with a high kick that arced gracefully across the soldier's face. The concussive impact propelled Bucky backward, his trajectory ending with a resounding crash into an unyielding cement wall. Spider-Man, I need to control myself a bit. Good thing that you're buffed right now, if not you would have been downed by now. Midway through executing the coup de grace, Spider-Man's heightened senses detected a faint sound emanating from beneath him, 
a small toy, perhaps, or some inconspicuous object that had gone unnoticed amidst the relentless commotion of the battle. Despite the urgency of the situation, his awareness was acute, attuned to every subtlety in the midst of the tumultuous encounter. Spider-Man, R. Fu. In a riveting tableau of conflict, the Winter Soldier found himself ensnared within a formidable force field, encircled by an aura of enigmatic power. As if the very fabric of reality conspired against him, a seemingly innocuous toy that had gone unnoticed amidst the chaos suddenly detonated with explosive force. The calculated blast caught Spider-Man unawares, sending the web-slinger careening through the air, his body colliding with a cafeteria wall with resounding impact. Spider-Man, NGH, son of a bitch, holds his body in pain. Question mark allow us to present ourselves. His name is Jack O'Lantern and mine's Jester. It's a pleasure to meet you, Spider-Guardian, he he he. Spider-Man, oh, it's you guys. Fuck you're annoying. Jack O'Lantern, so we heard. You know, you are pretty famous in the dark multiverses. Spider-Man, I'm flattered. Jester, your bounty there keeps increasing by the thousands. Spider-Man, okay, one piece. Jack O'Lantern, TCH, he's just as annoying as the rest of the Spider-Men. Jester, enough chit-chat, it's time to collect the bounty. Spider-Man, don't worry about these guys, I'll take care of them. Jack O'Lantern, sure you will. In this mesmerizing dance of adversaries, the combatants deftly navigated the battlefield with calculated grace. Jack, with uncanny precision, launched a trio of flaming pumpkin bombs towards Spider-Man, prompting the web-slinger to elegantly evade the fiery projectiles. Employing his lateral repulsion, Spider-Man surged forward, his trajectory colliding with the flaming pumpkin man, pinning him to the wall in a stunning display of agility and force. However, the confrontation intensified when Jester, ever the vigilant tactician, seized an opportune moment to ensnare Spider-Man with a cleverly thrown rope. In an unexpected twist, the rope bore an insidious secret, its piercing contact with the web-slinger's skin eliciting a visceral cry of pain. Unyielding in the face of adversity, Spider-Man's quick thinking proved to be his salvation, as he retaliated with a well-aimed web, administering a jolt of electricity that momentarily incapacitated Jester. The dynamic ebb and flow of the battle continued as Jack activated his flaming glider, delivering a resolute tackle that sent Spider-Man hurtling through an unforgiving wall, their impact resonating like thunder. In a breathtaking flurry of action, the adversaries rolled upon the ground, each vying for a strategic advantage amidst the chaotic upheaval. With an indomitable spirit, Jack regained his footing, exhibiting an astonishing resilience as he hurled another flaming pumpkin bomb toward the web-slinger. Spider-Man, with uncanny reflexes, sought cover, narrowly evading the explosive eruption. Yet, amidst the relentless clash, a chilling revelation unfolded, the tragic fate of the ill-fated guards who valiantly attempted to assist Spider-Man, unaware of the grim reality that dark entities could not be harmed. Their brave yet futile attempts bore witness to the enigma that lurked within this spectral confrontation, where ordinary forces found themselves powerless against the malevolent machinations at play. The stage was set for a climactic resolution, as the chessboard of this intricate battle stood poised for a game-changing move. Spider-Man, everyone just run away. Don't fight him. Amidst the escalating clash, a disquieting metamorphosis enveloped Jack, as if a macabre symphony of malevolence surged within him. His sinister laughter reverberated through the air, akin to an eerie crescendo of madness that echoed with the intensity of a demented psychopath. The flames engulfing his pumpkin helmet flickered with newfound brilliance, an unsettling manifestation of the dark power that coursed through him. Spider-Man, Spider-Sense so oh fuck. Makes a web shield and prepares for an explosion. In an eruption of cataclysmic force, the detonation reverberated throughout the building, rending it asunder with an unparalleled magnitude. The aftermath revealed a colossal gaping hole that seemed to devour more than half of the once imposing facility, leaving behind a scene of devastation and chaos in its wake. Amidst this devastating spectacle, Spider-Man found himself caught within the tempestuous maelstrom of the explosion's shockwave. With resounding force, the web-slinger was propelled violently outward, his form soaring through the air in a ballet of uncontrolled motion. The impact upon the ground was profound, as his body collided with the earth, leaving an indelible imprint of the fierce encounter that had just unfolded. Spider-Man, NGH, fuck, I didn't know that was a demon version of Jack O'Lantern. With practiced efficiency, Spider-Man's attention moment really veers inward, assessing the state of his suit with keen discernment. His discerning eyes note a few minor cuts marring the fabric, and a revelation unfolds as he realizes his once concealed mouth now stands exposed a chink in the armor of his vigilance. 
Jester, screams we're going to get you, Spider-Man. Spider-Man, TCH, I really wished I was fighting the normal ones for once. In a strategic maneuver born of resourcefulness, the web slinger swiftly disengages from the confrontation, his discerning eyes catching sight of a nearby manhole, an inconspicuous gateway to the labyrinthine depths below. With practiced ease, he removes the manhole's cover, venturing into the concealed world of the sewers, a sanctuary of shadows and secrets. However, unbeknownst to the intrepid hero, the very refuge he sought harbored the clandestine web of dangers. The sewers, shrouded in darkness, concealed an intricate array of traps, each one an enigmatic test of cunning and survival. Jack O'Lantern, he he, let's follow. Jester, right. Spider-Man, navigating the repugnant waters with uncanny agility, utilized his webs to propel himself gracefully through the labyrinthine sewers. As he reached a crossroad, his keen senses detected a faint yet intriguing sound, hinting at an unseen presence amidst the murky waters. Spider-Man, what there? In an abrupt and explosive onslaught, Spider-Man found himself at the epicenter of a devastating blast, hurling him with unforgiving force into a nearby wall. The collision proved punishing, the impact leaving him reeling, blood intermingling with his labored breaths as more grievous wounds took their toll. The once graceful web slinger now bore the burden of the relentless confrontation. Jester, well, well, well. If it isn't the little guardian spider. It must definitely suck being you right now. Jack O'Lantern, oh, spider. You have no idea how strong we really were with the dark influences didn't ya? In a swift and calculated maneuver, Jack deftly skirted past Spider-Man, casting a toxic gas with sinister intent. However, to the bewilderment of both combatants, an inexplicable turn of events unfolded as the noxious cloud appeared to disperse without making any effect. A poisonous substance has been detected, getting rid of the poison. 3. 2. 1. Healed. Spider-Man, inhales the poison gas thanks for the smoke. Jester, ah fuck, he has that ski. In a masterful display of agility and combat prowess, Spider-Man seized a momentary advantage, swiftly kneeing Jester in the face with the aid of his lateral repulsion. A symphony of violence ensued as the web-slinger unleashed a relentless barrage of strikes upon his adversary, an embodiment of unyielding determination. Yet, the relentless tide of battle shifted, as Jack interceded with sinister intent, brandishing his deadly shoulder blades in a lethal slash aimed at Spider-Man. The web slinger's senses remained keenly attuned to the unfolding danger, allowing him to react with lightning speed. With a deft kick, he propelled Jester away, deftly blocking Jack's attack with his stingers, the resounding clang reverberating through the dim expanse of the sewers. In a captivating duel of swords and wits, Jack and Spider-Man clashed with unyielding fervor, each maneuver an intricate symphony of clashing steel and countermeasures. Yet, despite their mastery, neither combatant was able to gain the upper hand. Their swords weaving an enigmatic tapestry of prowess and prowess, each stroke met with an opposing force that thwarted a definitive strike. In a strategic maneuver, the web slinger employed his powers of invisibility, an ethereal presence amidst the darkness, granting him the advantage of surprise. He deftly exploited this concealed advantage, plunging his blade into Jack's thighs, prompting a guttural cry of pain from the villain. However, their heated duel would meet an abrupt interruption as a surprise assailant launched an explosive yo-yo at Spider-Man's back, sending him rolling across the tainted waters. Jester capitalized on this diversion, rapidly deploying a relentless barrage of explosive yo-yo projectiles, each finding their mark upon the hero's vulnerable form, leaving him grappling with the explosive turmoil of the sewer's dark underbelly. Jester, pissed off fucking bastard. Die. 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 In a display of unmatched finesse, Spider-Man deftly employed an accelerated decoy maneuver, evading Jester's advances with the artistry of a seasoned performer. Seizing the opportune moment, the web slinger executed a powerful venom-infused punch that found its mark with unerring precision, connecting with Jester's jaw, sending him skipping upon the water's surface like a skimming stone. The choreography of combat unfolded with astonishing grace, each move a calculated step in an intricate dance of confrontation. Not one to relent, Spider-Man closed the distance between them, seizing Jester by the waist with tenacity. With commanding force, he executed a suplex maneuver, brutally slamming the villain upon the unyielding cement sides of the sewers. In this moment of brutal impact, the very foundations of the sewers seemed to shudder with the intensity of their ferocious clash. The fight reached a crescendo of violence as the adversaries engaged in a relentless exchange of blows, the echoes of their strikes resounding through the confined space. 
the web slingers' jabs and hammering fists found their target upon Jester's face. Yet, in a desperate gambit, Jester revealed a concealed yo-yo, which he unleashed with malicious intent. The explosive yo-yo detonated at point-blank range, sending Spider-Man hurtling through the air, clutching his face in pain, the echoes of the blast reverberating through the murky confines of the sewers. Spider-Man, ha, huh? fuck, NGHHH. In the aftermath of the devastating encounter, Spider-Man slowly regained his vision, only to confront a grisly tableau before him. The grotesque remnants of Jester's face lay scattered upon the floor, a morbid tapestry of brain fragments, teeth, eyes, and flesh that bore testament to the violence that had unfolded. Even in the face of such macabre scenes, the web-slinger's senses remained vigilant, as a barrage of seemingly harmless candies rained upon him. However, the devious trickery was soon revealed, as the innocent guise of the candies concealed a deadly secret, lethal acid that began to sear into his skin upon contact. In a harrowing battle against the relentless pain, Spider-Man fought to remove the acid-filled candies, grappling with the agony they inflicted. His desperation escalated, his feral instincts emerging as he resorted to tearing the acid-laden projectiles from his own body. Yet, the torment was far from over, as a flaming chain wrapped itself round his neck, igniting yet another source of searing pain. In a blur of instinctive response, he launched himself at his assailant, grappling with Jack in a furious frenzy that culminated in a cataclysmic impact upon the sewer's wall. In this electrifying climax, Spider-Man's eyes crackled with otherworldly electricity, his form embodying a conduit of power. His devastating punch pierced through Jack's defenses, unleashing a torrential surge of electric energy that rent the very fabric of the sewers. Having vanquished his foe and shattered the sewers' surroundings, the web-slinger fought to exit the catacombs, battered and bloodied, yet filled with a newfound sense of tranquility as the adrenaline subsided. As he emerged into the open, he succumbed to his wounds, passing out upon the streets, his heroic spirit enduring even in the face of devastation. Witnessing the gravity of the situation, Tony Stark arrived, a harbinger of hope and rescue in the form of his vehicle, prepared to tend to the fallen hero's needs. Tony, oh my god, Carito. In a tumultuous whirlwind of concern and urgency, Tony Stark, bearing Spider-Man's wounded form, embarked on a swift journey to secure immediate medical aid. The cityscape blurred around them as they sped toward the hospital, each passing second seeming to hang heavy with the weight of the web-slinger's plight. Arriving at the medical facility, Tony's voice rang with a compelling sense of urgency, commanding attention as he urgently implored the doctors to extend their expertise to his dear friend. With a visceral intensity, he sought to pierce through the chaotic atmosphere, a beacon of determination amidst the whirlwind of bustling activity. Tony, I need a medic. Now. Chapter 25, Civil War Part 4 Marvel DC, Images, Manhus, and every anime that will be mentioned and used in this story are not mine. They all belong to their respective owners. The main character carried to Josue Valdez and the story are mine. As the gentle caress of Dawn's first light brushed against his slumbering form, the man's eyes slowly fluttered open, awakening to a world reborn in the morning's embrace. The remnants of dreams faded like wisps of memory, and with a languid stretch and a drowsy yawn, he embarked upon the journey of consciousness. With a deliberate pace, he ventured towards the bathroom, a ritual of morning rituals unfolding with quiet resolve. The rhythm of awakening echoed through the stillness, as he tended to his everyday necessities with the practiced grace of routine. Yet, as the final thread of solitude began to unravel, the melodic voice of his mother beckoned him from afar, a call resonating with warmth and familiarity. The magnetic pull of kinship drew him to descend the stairs, each step a fleeting journey through the fabric of familial connection. Carito, I'll be there in a second. Having donned a shirt that bore the mark of a new day, he traversed the threshold of his chamber, where the lingering fragrance of freshly cooked pancakes wafted through the air like a sweet serenade. The subtle notes of joy played upon his lips, and with a contented smile, he embarked on a leisurely descent towards the source of the delectable aroma. Stepping into the familial sanctuary of the downstairs abode, a tableau of domestic tranquility greeted him, where his older sister, a portrait of elegant nonchalance, found solace amidst the timeless allure of cinematic diversions. A symphony of flickering images danced across the screen, accompanied by the mellifluous hum of her own musings, as she sought refuge in the realm of random movies a sanctuary of amusement for the sake of idleness. Carito, hey, sis we are gonna eat now. Sister, yeah, I heard, I'll pause it now. The Carito's sister gracefully rose from her seat, a confluence of elegance and poise, halting the ongoing show with a measured pause that attested to the arrival of all family members at the dinner table. 
a symphony of collective presence unfolded as each member took their designated seat, a tableau of unity and togetherness, bound by shared ties of kinship. In the sacred hush of the moment, they embarked upon a solemn ritual, a reverent prayer that offered gratitude for the sustenance laid before them. A sense of devotion pervaded the air as their hearts whispered thanks, an intimate connection with the divine, resonating amidst the companionship of their shared repast. Yet, within the cocoon of familial familiarity, a subtle peculiarity lingered in the air. An uncharacteristic silence enveloped the dining table, as if the everyday banter that typically animated their gatherings had mysteriously taken leave. An undercurrent of unease rippled through the midst of this anomaly, the pause heavy with unspoken words and untold sentiments. As awkward minutes passed, a poignant sense of longing surfaced in Carito's soul, a yearning for the warmth of camaraderie and the joyful exchange of familial anecdotes. Sensing the need to bridge the unspoken chasm, he readied himself to break the silence, to usher in the harmonious flow of conversation once more. However, before his voice could find the words to weave their way into the dialogue, his mother's voice, tinted with a hint of nostalgia, beckoned him forth, using his former name. Mother, Adriel, mind if I ask you a question? Carito, ah, uh, why yeah? Mother, why? Carito, why? Mother, why Iota did you leave Iota to us? In a surreal and horrifying twist, the faces of his loved ones began to decay before Carito's very eyes, their once familiar features turning into a nightmarish spectacle of rotting flesh. Mother, was I a ring bad mother? Is that why you left? As an eerie and malevolent presence took hold, ethereal undead hands emerged from the shadows, wrapping around Carito's trembling form with a spectral grip. The nightmarish touch of these phantom appendages rendered him immobilized, ensnared in a chilling tableau of otherworldly horror. Within this suffocating embrace, terror gripped his heart like icy claws, and his cries of anguish echoed through the darkened abyss. The surreal encounter wove a sinister tapestry of fear and helplessness, as if he had become an unwitting participant in a ghastly performance orchestrated by the realm of the macabre. Mother, you Iota left us all by Iota and... Carito's anguished cries reverberated through the void, a desperate plea seeking solace amid the sinister forces that ensnared him. His voice, laden with desperation, echoed with each fervent repetition of no, as he sought an elusive refuge from the unfolding horror. Amidst the spectral hands that encircled him, he struggled against the inexorable force pulling him downward, his futile resistance a testament to the visceral fear that enveloped his very being. Yet, as he grasped for any semblance of reason or escape, his mind found no respite, no plausible justification for the haunting encounter that had befallen him. Carito, no. Mum. Please. Dad. I'm sorry. No. Embrace the suffocating grasp of torment, as it ensnares your very soul in its relentless clutches. Real time. Awakening with a gasp, Carito found himself amidst the clinical confines of a hospital room, his heart rate monitor indicating a state of distress. A vigilant nurse swiftly entered to attend to him, her compassionate presence suffering solace amid the disquietude. Nurse, Spider-Man, calm down. You are in a hospital. Carito, I noticed. How long have I been here? Nurse, a day. Upon introspection, Carito observed the once raw wounds from his intense duel with the formidable darks now rendered as naught but distant memories. His body, bore no traces of the visceral encounter that had once ravaged his form, the resilience of his regenerative powers, reaching a crescendo of near perfection. Carito, called Tony Stark. Nurse, why yes, sir. Rising with a composed grace, Carito found himself adorned in a seamless transition of casual attire, as if the very essence of his wardrobe were effortlessly summoned forth from an unseen inventory. Serenely patient, he awaited the opening of the door, its creaking hinges heralding the arrival of a nurse who held a phone. Nurse, he's on the phone. Carito, thanks. Grabs the phone Tony. What has happened in the span of a day? Tony, on the phone um, I might have said that we would capture Bucky and Steve in 72 hours I was almost begging on my knees to get that time, I used the excuse that uh, we needed you and it worked. So we have 48 hours right now. Carito, sighs you know how I feel about putting my own friends in prison. Tony, it's not like we have a choice. Plus, since those darks appeared and did to explain what they were you are literally obligated to go everywhere now. Carito, are you fucking serious? Tony, yup. Look. I know you are in a very bad mood since all of this happened so I prepared a gift for you. Carito, a gift? Tony, yeah, come by the lab quickly. Remember that we don't have much time. Carito, yeah, I'll be there. Tony, wait, you sure you can move? 
Clarito, my healing factor has gotten better so I think if I just rest for a few hours I'll be healed up. I don't need a day to heal like before completely. Tony, damn. I envy you sometimes. Clarito, thanks, I'll be right there. With the finesse of a seasoned acrobat, Clarito gracefully leaps out the window and glides through the urban expanse. His web-swinging prowess propels him toward the facility where the Quinjet awaits. Small time skip. Clarito's presence graced the hallowed halls of the Avengers compound as he navigated his way towards the laboratory. Upon entering, an enigmatic sight greeted his discerning gaze, Tony Stark, engrossed in an intricate process involving a peculiar substance, a liquefied red suit, its essence cloaked in mystery. Clarito, hey boss, what's up? Tony, I hope you knows that you sound like Chico Mark every time you do that, right? Clarito, that's the idea. Chuckles well I hope that doesn't make you Margaret Dumont. So, what are you doing? Tony, I'm almost done putting the final touches on your new uniform. Just making the design. Clarito, what does it do? Tony, with the few tests I did, I was able to see its capabilities. This suit will be able to change you physically to whoever you want, it is unlimited webbing, it can also camouflage like you, you can make solid weapons with your limbs, your healing factor will be greatly improved, it can track someone by scent no matter how far they are as long as you have something from the person you're looking for, in other words, all of your powers will be increased drastically. Clarito, inside his head Gara, this is a symbiote, right? I hope this isn't the carnage suit. Yes, it is a symbiote suit but it's not carnage. Clarito, inside his head so. It's toxin? Yes. It's the toxin symbiote. A subtle smirk graces Clarito's countenance as contemplation takes hold, the wheels of his mind turning with a calculated intrigue. Perhaps, he muses introspectively, I can harness its power, tame the tempest of violent tendencies that swirl within. With its childlike personality, I may yet guide it, akin to a father nurturing a prodigious offspring. Yet, within this enigmatic prospect lies the realization that vigilant watchfulness shall be his constant companion. A symbiotic alliance, like the delicate balance of nature, demands both nurture and caution in equal measure. In the embrace of such an amalgamation, the formidable strengths of venom, and the chaotic prowess of carnage but multiplied, the prospect of newfound power beckons, an alluring promise that could tilt the scales in his favor. The very thought of wielding this amalgam of capabilities evokes a symphony of possibilities an orchestra of potential that entices him with its magnetic allure. As he envisions the fusion of these extraordinary abilities, an undeniable conviction takes root, the potency of such a union could prove instrumental in thwarting the nefarious darks, serving as a formidable weapon in the battle for justice and righteousness. After measured contemplation, Carito's discerning mind forged a profound resolution, accepting the enigmatic gift bestowed upon him by Tony, unaware of its symbiotic nature. Clarito, thanks, Tony, I'll put it on in a second. Tony, all right. In his head well. I haven't completely tested the suit out but it should be fine. This is Clarito. He's gonna be fine. As Clarito sought refuge within the confinements of the closet, his gaze descended upon the enigmatic suit that lay before him, its presence eliciting a stoic calmness that veiled the tempest of emotions within. Clarito, I know you're a symbiote named Toxin. How long ago were you born? As Carito's deft command of bioelectricity shimmered with illuminating prowess, a seamless force field enveloped the enigmatic suit, rendering it a captive within the ethereal confines. In this masterstroke of precaution, the symbiote's capacity to abruptly entwine itself with his being was artfully nullified, held at bay by the web of electrified energy that encased it. Toxin, I. Where am I? Carito, you are in a dimension called the MCU timeline, Earth 616 or Earth 199999. I am its protector Carito Josu, guardian of the multiverse. Toxin, wait. Don't talk all fancy words. It confuses me. Carito, you are in another world. Toxin, thank you. Carito, do you know where you're from? Toxin, ah. Uh. No, it's like I gained a conscious when you called me and just gave me your name. Clarito, huh, is that so? Toxin, yeah, can you like be my host already? I can't live if I don't have a host. Clarito, you can but for a while. Toxin, you seem to know an awful lot more about my species than I know about it myself. Clarito, well, you can see inside my head when we bond. Toxin, really? Clarito, but there will be conditions. Toxin, shit. Clarito, I'll be the one in control, always. Toxin, what? Why? Clarito, because I know you're kind, that's why. 
I will help you. I promise that. Toxin. Carito, look, I don't want this relationship to be hostile. I want to have a 100% bond. I know it has to do with compatibility or how we work together. So, I'll try to be the best teammate I can be while you also do the same. We will help each other. Toxin. Has anyone ever told you that you can make a speech? Carito, sometimes. So yes or no? Toxin. Alright, not like I have much of a choice. Carito, awesome. Now latch on. With resolute intent, Carito released the restraining force field that bound the symbiote, allowing it to writhe and course across his being. The sentient tendrils cascaded like an otherworldly dance, engulfing his entire form in a mesmerizing display of fluidity and grace. As the symbiote's embrace encircled him, hands of liquid ebony caressed every inch of his physique, melding and blending with an ethereal symbiosis that defied the boundaries of mortal comprehension. The once separate entities converged into an inseparable fusion, transforming Carito into an embodiment of the symbiote's latent potential. This enigmatic transformation reached its crescendo as the symbiote reached his countenance, cloaking his visage in a vibrant hue of crimson on his upper body and navy on the lower body. The symbiote, now revealed as Toxin, seemed to claim dominion over Carito's very identity, manifesting its enigmatic nature in the form of sleek, grey lenses that adorned his eyes. As he gazed upon his reflection in a nearby mirror, Carito's eyes sparkled with a newfound sense of awe and self-discovery. The amalgamation of Toxin and Carito, unified in a symbiotic communion, presented a striking visage that bespoke the enigmatic duality now entwined within him. Carito and Toxin, now this is sick, smirks. In a mesmerizing display of metamorphosis, the symbiotic suit encasing Carito's form underwent an extraordinary transmutation, a dance of colors that shifted with an enigmatic grace. The once vibrant crimson hue gracefully yielded to the depths of a rich navy, cascading like an elegant wave from his core. As the colors melded and converged, an ethereal aura seemed to enshroud Carito, with droplets of crimson and navy radiating from his form, crackling like the essence of electrified energy. Even the once stoic grey lenses assumed a fluid, liquefied appearance, embodying the symbiotic harmony that now coursed through his being. A striking symbol of the spider, once confined to a specific region, now stretched and expanded, almost transcending the boundaries of its original confines. An enigmatic testament to the unification of man and symbiote, the symbol seemed to imbue Carito's entire being with an air of mystique, a seamless amalgamation of identities that now coexisted in remarkable tandem. Engrossed in the reverie of his newfound form, Carito's moment of introspection was interrupted by Tony's concerned voice a reminder of the world beyond the confines of his reflection. With a profound sense of self-discovery and transformation, Carito collected himself, answering the call to reassurance and reaffirming his readiness to confront whatever lay ahead. Spider-Man, yeah, I'm fine. Check my new suit out. As Tony Stark stepped into the confines of the closet, his discerning eyes fell upon Carito's transformed form, clad in the resplendent splendor of the new suit. A momentary gasp escaped from Tony's lips, betraying his awe at the sight that greeted him. Tony, holy shit. You look sick. How do you feel? Spider-Man, like I'm ten times stronger than before. Tony, you can have an easier time with those ducks now. Spider-Man, yeah. Them. Tony, Carito. Spider-Man, nah it's nothing. Tony, as much as I wanna test out your new suit we can't, I have a new member in mind that we can recruit. Spider-Man, really? Who's this newcomer? Tony, he calls himself, Spider-Boy. Spider-Man, someone's a fan. Smirks. Tony, you have no idea, he wants to be you so bad but he only has half of your powers. Spider-Man, so we gonna see him now? Tony, yep. Carito, symbiote goes inside his body but. Location, Queens. As the young man stepped out of the elevator, he exuded an air of purpose and intrigue, clutching a DVD in his hand with a sense of determination. His gaze meandered along the corridors of the apartment complex, seemingly immersed in the task at hand, all the while seeking the keys adorning the back of his pants with a touch of finesse. As he approached his apartment door, a moment of contemplation swept across his countenance, perhaps a fleeting pause to savor the allure of the unknown that awaited him on the other side. The moment passed, and with practiced ease, he unlocked the door, granting access to the enigmatic realm that lay beyond. Peter, hey, May, grunts. Peter Parker stepped into the living room, his mind occupied with thoughts that veiled the presence of the two guests engaged in conversation with Aunt May. May, MMM, hey. 
Clarito, mumbles to Tony I bet 100 he's gonna fan girl about me more than you. Tony, mumbles boy, I'm the Iron Man and Tony Stark, you are gonna lose. Clarito, mumbles you said he was trying to be me. Tony, mumbles actually, I don't wanna bet anymore. Clarito, smirks. Tony, looks away annoyed. May, how was school today? Peter, it was okay, this crazy car parked outside, sees Tony and Clarito. Tony, oh, Mr. Parker. Clarito, sup. Peter, Peter. X has stopped working. May, Peter? Peter, hey, my name is Peter Packeritz and Hanorfery out over here. Clarito, PFF. Tony, Tony, and this is. Peter, it's Spider Man, it's a pleasure to meet a Wandy out Uma. Stark. Tony, okay, I didn't think the fan thing was this exaggerated. Clarito, it was about time we met. Did you get Tony's emails, right? Peter, about to start crying why yeah, yeah, starts to control himself regarding there. May, you didn't even tell me about the grant. Tony, the September Foundation. Peter, are right. Clarito, exactly, remember when you applied? Peter, why yeah. Tony, I approved so now we're in business. May, but you didn't tell me anything. What's up with that? You keeping secrets from me now? Peter, I just know how much you love surprises so I thought I would let you know. Get nervous anyways, what did I apply for? Tony, that's what we are here for to hash out. Peter, okay. Hash it out, okay. Tony, it's so hard for me to believe that she's someone's aunt. May, chuckles yeah, well, we come in all shapes and sizes, you know? Clarito, this walnut date loaf is exceptional, where can I find these so I can buy the rest of it? Peter, massive doubt you, you sure? Clarito, yes, eats it slowly. Peter, um, is this grant got money involved or whatever? No? Clarito, told you. Tony, yeah, it's pretty well funded. Peter, yeah, wow. Clarito, he's Tony Stark, of course, there's money. Peter, point taken. Tony, can we have five minutes with him? May, sure. As the trio made their way into the confines of Peter's room, an aura of curiosity and anticipation seemed to envelop them. Within this sanctum of Peter's personal space, a delicate air of intimacy resonated, where glimpses of his true self were nestled amidst the artifacts that adorned the room. Tony, how do you eat that? Clarito, live my life and you'll know. Eats another one slowly. Tony, well the walnut date loaves go, that wasn't bad. Looks around the room whoa, what have we here? Retro tech, huh? Thrift store? Salvation army? Peter, ah, uh, the garbage, actually. Tony, you're a dumpster diver? Peter, yeah, I was. Anyway, look, um, I'm very excited Spider-Man is in my room but I know I did not apply for your grant. Clarito, kinky. Peter, what? Clarito, what? Tony, ah uh, ah, uh, me first. Peter, okay. Tony, quick question of the rhetorical variety shows an image of Peter stopping a car thief in his spider boy suit. Peter, um no, stammers what do you mean? Clarito, MHM. Look, Peter, us spider people can detect each other with this weird sensation in our heads so. Tony, shows another video of Peter catching a car look at you go, wow. Nice catch, 3000 pounds, 40 miles an hour, that's not easy. You got mad skills. Peter, wait. Mr. Spider-Man what do you mean sensation? Clarito, all right, the sensation I'm talking about is called a spider sense. It helps us detect danger or works like a radar, so I can detect people like me with similar powers when they're nearby. Didn't you feel a sensation telling you that you're like me? Tony, this is new you haven't told me about this. Peter, why yeah, when I saw you I felt like I could trust you. It was weird. Clarito, you can trust us, spider boy. Your secret is safe with us, I guarantee it. Tony, wheel in this on Essie he's definitely a spider boy, pokes a trapdoor on the roof and reveals Peter's homemade costume. Peter, he runs towards it and grabs it in his chest um, ah. Uh. Clarito, it's fine man, relax. Peter, pouts it's not to on Essie. I don't believe this. I was actually having a really good day today and this happens. I'm still happy my inspiration is here, but I don't know how to feel right now. Tony, who else knows? Anybody? Peter, nobody. Tony, not even your unusually attractive aunt? Peter, no. No. Clarito, gotta give it to Tony, she is pretty damn attractive. 
Peter, my emotions are all over the place right now. But back to the point, if she knew, she would freak out. And when she freaks out, I freak out. Tony, you know what I think is impressive? This webbing. It's very similar to the one Carito has but weaker. Who manufactured it? Peter, I did. Carito, Tony, I can tell he's like me but without the electricity and all the extra stuff. Tony, oh god. Grabs the goggles, can you even see in these? He puts them on I'm blind. Peter, grabs his suit I can see in those. Okay, it's just that when whatever happened, happened. Carito, like your senses have been dialed to eleven. Peter, exactly. It's hard to explain. Tony, I get it. I'm always putting up with this asshole all the time. Carito, hey. Tony, you're in dire need of an upgrade. Systemic, top to bottom, hundred point restoration. That's why I'm here. Carito, and I'm here for a different but somewhat the same reason. Tony, why are you doing this? Peter looks confused I got to know, what's your mo? What gets you out to the twin bed in the morning? Peter, because, stammers because I've been me my whole life, and I've had these powers for six months. Tony, mmm. Peter, I read books, I build computers, and, yeah, I would love to play football, but I couldn't then, so I shouldn't now. Carito, of course because you don't want to accidentally tackle someone into the afterlife. Peter, exactly, but I can't tell anybody that, so I'm not. Stammers it's so hard to explain the things I can do, you don't know how it feels like. Carito, I'm gonna stop you there. Peter, what? Carito, I know what you mean. Exactly what you mean. I know that many of the bad things that had happened over the years happened because of me, because I wasn't strong enough to avoid as many casualties as I can. Many people's death is because of me because I wasn't good enough to save them but I won't allow myself to be put down because I failed before when I can succeed next time. I can be better next time. I have pushed myself beyond anything I have ever done before. I do this because I have a responsibility to accomplish. It is my duty to protect the weak and hope I can save one more. Then hope again to save one other person. The villains that use their powers for bad I have to put them in their place for the sake of this world. My job as a hero is to defend and save the people even if may hate me. In the aftermath of Carito's profound statement, a profound silence enveloped the room, leaving Peter and Tony momentarily at a loss for words. The weight of those utterances seemed to resonate deeply within Peter, evoking a profound admiration that reverberated in the depths of his soul. Carito, just looking for the little guy, right? Peter, why yeah, just looking out for the little guy. That's what it is. Tony, stands up I'm gonna sit here, so you move the leg. Sits down and pats Peter on the back you got a passport? Carito, I don't even think he even has a driver's license. Peter, yeah, I don't have one. Tony, you ever been to Germany? Carito, Tony, their financial standards are worse than mine when I lived with my parents. Peter, damn, I know we are poor and all but you didn't have to do me like that. Carito, force of habit, sorry. Anyways, you'll like Germany it's pretty neat. Peter, but I can't go to Germany. Carito, you're worried for your aunt? Peter, I, you, yes. Tony, better tell Aunt Hottie I am taking you on a field trip. Peter, but I can't just drop out of school. Carito, who said anything about dropping out? Peter, what? Carito, this is the Avengers kid, you'll learn more with us than in school so don't worry. Plus you can be in and out whenever you want without getting your grades affected. Peter. Carito, it'll be fine man. Head pats him don't worry about it. Peter, a eh, alright. I'll go. Tony, how do you do that? Carito, do what? Tony, convince people. Carito, I don't know, I'm just nice. Tony, when you want to. Carito, exactly. Tony, let's go to Germany then. Carito, whispers beside Tony but he won't join the fight. Tony, why not? Carito, whispers he needs training and we are gonna fight experienced people. He has the power to keep up but not the experience. So he'll learn, from me. Tony, all right, I get your point. Upon the vast expanse of an empty parking lot, situated near the pinnacle of a towering structure, the illustrious team Captain America assembled with a precision befitting their reputation. Each member, driven by an unyielding commitment to their shared cause, arrived at the designated meeting spot as promised. Clint, Cap. Steve, you know I wouldn't have called if I had any other choice. Clint, hey, man, you're doing me a favor. Besides, I promised Pietro to help Wonder while he's gone looking for other people like him. Steve, 
thanks for having my back. Wonder, it was time to get off my ass. Steve, how about our other recruit? Clint, he's raring to go. He walks towards the white van and slides open the door. Clint, had to put a little coffee in him. But he should be good car door slams. Scott, oh, shit. Wakes up Huck. What time zone is this? Clint, come on, come on. Scott, Captain America. Steve, Mr. Lang. As the two distinguished figures of Scott and Steve stood before each other, an air of formality and mutual respect infused the atmosphere. However, amidst the shared warmth of their handshake, an unexpected moment of awkwardness seemed to weave its way into the exchange. Scott's seemingly well-intentioned curiosity led him to linger just a touch too long, inadvertently creating a fleeting sense of discomfort in the air. Scott, I it's an honor. I'm shaking your hand too long. Wow. This is awesome. Captain America. Looks at wonder I know you, too. You're great. In the realm of this momentous encounter, Scott's gaze lingered upon Steve, his eyes seemingly entranced by the aura of strength and valor that enshrouded the distinguished captain. A fleeting impulse of curiosity overcame him, urging his hand to reach out and gently grace Steve's shoulders, as if seeking to understand the essence of the man behind the legendary mantle. Scott, geez. R, look. I wanna say, I know you know a lot of super people, so. Thanks for thinking of me. Looks at Sam Hey, man. Sam, what's up? Tic tac. Scott, ah, uh, good to see you. Look, what happened last time when I... Sam, it was a great audition, but it'll never happen again. Steve, they tell you what we're up against? Scott, something about some psycho assassins? Steve, we're outside the law on this one. So if you come with us, you're a wanted man. Scott, yeah, well, what else is new? Bucky, we should get moving. Clint, we got a chopper lined up. Amidst the hallowed halls of the structure, a neary silence descended, only to be abruptly shattered by the piercing wail of an evacuation alarm that resonated with an unsettling urgency. The staccato rhythm of the alarm reverberated throughout the space, like a haunting echo of imminent danger. In the midst of this unsettling soundscape, a voice, foreign and commanding, emerged from the concealed recesses of the speakers. The guttural cadence of German lent an enigmatic air of intrigue, the words carrying an air of authority that demanded attention. Bucky, they're evacuating the airport. Sam, Stark. Scott, Stark? Steve, suit up. As the minutes passed, the team suited up for action. Captain America led the way towards the chopper, but their plans were thwarted by a cunningly placed jammer, damaging the chopper's engines. Suddenly, Iron Man and War Machine descended with a resounding thud, ready to face the impending challenge. Iron Man, wow, it's so weird how you run into people at the airport. Takes his helmet off don't you think that's weird? War Machine, definitely weird. Captain America, hear me out, Tony. That doctor, the psychiatrist, he's behind all of this. Emerging like an ethereal figure from the very essence of the shadows, a majestic presence revealed itself to the assembled team. Cloaked in the regal garb of the Black Panther, a figure of enigmatic grace and strength stepped forth with an aura of regality that commanded instant reverence. Black Panther, Captain. Captain America, Your Highness. Iron Man, anyway, I only have 36 hours left to bring you in. I was given three days and I wasted two already for Carito's sake and his new apprentice. Captain America, Apprentice? Iron Man, anyways, can you help a brother out? Captain America, you're after the wrong guy. Iron Man, did you steal that line from Carito? Because he said the same thing. I just can't let slide what your old war buddy did to those innocent people when he escaped. Captain America, and there are five more super soldiers just like him. I can't let the doctor find them first, Tony. I can't. Black Widow, Steve. You know what's about to happen. Do you really wanna punch your way out of this one? Iron Man, where the hell is Carito? Spider-Man, the camouflaged right beside Iron Man I'm right here. Captain America, cool suit. Spider-Man, thanks. Captain America, you've been busy, huh? Spider-Man, brother, you have no eyed. Iron Man, and you've been a complete idiot. Dragging in Clint. Rescuing Wanda from a place she doesn't even want to leave. A safe place. Spider-Man, she left willingly. Iron Man, Carito I will bash your face in, don't test my patience right now. Spider-Man, damn okay, Motley Crue be as chaotic as you want. Iron Man, whose side are you on? Spider-Man, cricket noises. Iron Man, I'm trying to keep Steve from tearing the Avengers apart. Captain America, you did that when you signed. 
Spider-Man, mumbles don't say a joke. 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 Iron Man, all right, we're done. You're gonna turn Barnes over. You're gonna come with us, now, because it's us, or a squad of JSOC guys, with no compunction about being impolite. Anxious come on. Falcon, Cap's earpiece we found it. They're Quinjets in Hangar 5, North Runway. In the seamless dance of combat, an unseen presence flitted beneath the radar, deftly concealing itself amidst the tides of the battle. Ant-Man, in his diminutive form, poised for a stealthy maneuver, his sights set on a well-timed uppercut aimed at Spider-Man, the unsuspecting target of his strategy. Yet, as the sounds of time unfurled, Spider-Man, a master of agility and instinct, seemed to possess an uncanny awareness of the impending assault. With the grace of a seasoned acrobat, he elegantly tilted his head, evading Ant-Man's attack with a precision that spoke of innate anticipation. A symphony of motion unfolded, as Ant-Man, restored to his normal size, found himself met with an unexpected step back from Spider-Man. In this subtle act of retraction, Spider-Man conveyed an air of tranquil resolve, seemingly unfazed by the attempted offense. With an almost enigmatic stillness, Spider-Man elected not to engage further, choosing instead to sit down, exuding an air of calm amidst the chaos of battle. War Machine, whoa! Stammers what the hell was that? Iron Man, Carito, what the hell are you doing? Spider-Man, gets popcorn from his inventory enjoying the show until I feel like joining in. Iron Man, scans the parking lot's Carito, this is no time for jokes. Spider-Man and Toxin, does it look like I'm joking? In a fleeting moment of intrigue, Iron Man's countenance betrayed a subtle flinch, as the unexpected timbre of Carito's voice, seemingly fused with dual tonalities, resonated in the air. A curious amalgamation of two voices harmoniously interwoven, an enigma that left Iron Man moment really captivated by the peculiarity of this phenomenon. With the graceful finesse of a master aerialist, Carito propelled himself into the air, skillfully web-swinging towards an elevated vantage point. The fluidity of his motion spoke of an agile mind, strategically seeking to gain an advantageous perspective on the unfolding events below. Iron Man, TCH, I'll deal with you later. All right, there are two on the parking deck. One of them's Maximoff, I'm gonna grab her. Starts to blast off do you wanna take Cap? War Machine, got two in the terminal, Wilson, and Barnes. Black Panther, Barnes is mine. Spider-Man, oi. That's the wrong guy you're hating on. Panther just ignores him. Spider-Man, damn, tried to help. Toxin, you can be incredibly annoying when you wanna be. Spider-Man, and? Toxin, it's hilarious keep going. Spider-Man, chuckles. In a seamless display of unwavering precision, Captain America hurls his iconic shield with masterful finesse, a resolute attempt to halt War Machine's advance towards Bucky. The glint of vibranium traverses the air like a celestial dance, a testament to the Captain's unwavering commitment to protect his comrades. Meanwhile, Iron Man, resolute in his endeavors to bridge the chasm of misunderstanding, makes a final, compelling attempt to establish communication with Carito. The air seems pregnant with the weight of unspoken emotions, as Iron Man seeks to convey his intentions with earnest clarity. Iron Man, Carito can't you at least web them up or something? Spider-Man, checks his alarm in a few minutes. Iron Man, gets more frustrated. In the seamless fluidity of combat, the indomitable Captain America swiftly seizes his iconic shield, an extension of his unwavering resolve, and joins the enigmatic Black Panther in a fervent pursuit to subdue the formidable Bucky. A symphony of determination and grace unfolds, as the panther surges forward, only to be halted in his tracks when Captain America's shield soars through the air with celestial precision, finding its mark upon the panther's back. A momentary pause, as he regains his footing with astounding agility. In a brilliant display of tactical prowess, the captain leverages his superhuman strength, nimbly mounting the panther's back to execute a deft back throw, an artful maneuver that creates a crucial distance between the combatants. Black Panther, move, Captain. I won't ask a second time. Captain America stands resolute, choosing not to offer a verbal reply to the Panther's unyielding presence. The air seems pregnant with tension, each breath an allegory of unspoken emotions and steadfast resolve. Undeterred by the Captain's stoic silence, the Panther embarks on a graceful yet powerful display of combat prowess. With an awe-inspiring trifecta of kicks, he strikes the Captain's iconic shield. 
the echoes of their clash resonate through the hallowed grounds, a captivating symphony of kinetic energy and profound intent. The shield, emblematic of Captain America's unwavering determination, stands as a bastion of defense, pushed back under the weight of the panther's dynamic assault. Meanwhile, Ant-Man, look, I really don't want to hurt you. Spider-Man, then don't. It's that easy. Black Widow, seriously? Spider-Man, very. Black Widow seizes a moment of diversion, capitalizing on the Panther and Captain's standoff. With remarkable precision, she employs a swift knee strike, delivering a decisive blow to Ant-Man's vulnerabilities, evoking an involuntary wince from all those witnessing the scene. Drawing from her unparalleled expertise in hand-to-hand -hand combat, Black Widow deftly grasps Ant-Man's arm, attempting to assert control. However, the agile Ant-Man swiftly employs his unique abilities, reducing his stature to infinitesimal proportions, a masterful maneuver that catches his opponent off guard. In an impressive display of acrobatics, Ant-Man defies conventional expectations, flipping Black Widow over, leaving her momentarily disoriented. Displaying unyielding tenacity, he takes advantage of the situation, running along her back, securing his hold on her arm, and endeavoring to subdue her. Yet, Black Widow is a force to be reckoned with, as she calls upon her arsenal of advanced gadgets, activating a potent electroshock from her bracelet. The resulting surge of electricity engulfs Sandman, propelling him through the air with electrifying intensity, until he collides with a nearby aircraft engine. With Spider-Man. Amidst the cacophony of clashing ideologies and frenetic combat, there stood a lone figure, seemingly aloof from the fray. Serenely positioned atop a table at the airport's vantage point, he savored a delectable tripleter, accompanied by a refreshing iced tea. The subtle nuances of flavor danced upon his palate, juxtaposed against the tumultuous backdrop of conflict. Undeterred by the escalating turmoil surrounding him, he appeared steadfast in his conviction, electing to maintain an impartial stance. The notion of apprehending his once comrades weighed heavily upon his conscience, an internal struggle that led him to choose detachment over direct confrontation. A portrait of composure and contemplation, he bore the weight of indecision with remarkable poise. While others engaged in fierce battle, he opted to embrace a semblance of tranquility, allowing himself a moment of respite amidst the tempestuous storm. Yet, an undercurrent of unresolved tension lingered beneath the surface. The allure of combat beckoned, drawing him towards a more visceral path, tempting him to succumb to the impulse that lurked within. The juxtaposition of his tranquility and latent desire for action created an enigmatic presence, a complex tapestry of emotions that seemed to swirl around him. Toxin, why are we up here? Spider-Man, because I don't want to arrest my friends. Toxin, while I will say that the food is great, I wanna fight. Spider-Man, damn, sounds like a you problem. Toxin, man, fuck you. Spider-Man, no, fuck you. Toxin, fuck you. Spider-Man, no. Fuck you, you. Toxin, nah. Fuck you, you, you. Spider-Man, no. Fuck you, 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 you. He stayed arguing with his symbiote for who knows how long. Meanwhile, in a riveting display of martial prowess, Captain America and the enigmatic Black Panther engage in a kinetic dance of combat, each movement imbued with finesse and purpose. The battlefield becomes an arena of elegant exchanges, as the panther's razor-sharp claws relentlessly scrape against the captain's unyielding shield, creating a symphony of vibranium meeting vibranium. As the stakes intensify, the resounding thuds of metal reverberate through the air, as War Machine descends upon the scene with a thunderous presence. The mood is charged with anticipation, as the weight of confrontation hangs palpably in the air. War Machine, sorry, Cap, this won't kill you. But it ain't gonna tackle either, pulls out an electric baton. In a seamless display of combat prowess, the enigmatic Black Panther executed a swift back kick, propelling Captain America away with a controlled force that left him sprawled on his back. Meanwhile, War Machine ascended into the skies, gathering momentum for a formidable assault. In this high-stakes confrontation, Captain America's acute instincts allowed him to react swiftly, instinctively raising his unyielding shield in defense. As the arc of War Machine's powerful attack found its mark, the resounding collision echoed through the air, creating a symphony of metallic resonance that resonated throughout the battlefield. Spider-Man, maybe if you were a little faster you could have gotten him. War Machine, shut up. Spider-Man, laughs. In a display of technological mastery, Iron Man swiftly intercepted Hawkeye and Scarlet Witch, bringing their motions to a momentary standstill, like figures frozen in time. As the battlefield simmered with tension, Iron Man directed his attention towards the Scarlet Witch. 
his voice carrying an air of measured authority and contemplation. Iron Man, Wonder, I think you hurt Vision's feelings. Scarlet Witch, you locked me in my room. Iron Man, okay, first that's an exaggeration. Second, I did it to protect you. Spider-Man, I told you it was a bad idea. Iron Man, shut up, Carito. You aren't even helping. Spider-Man, that's bad parenting. Iron Man, he's been pretty different since that suit. Hawkeye, we were all worried that we had to fight him but if he isn't joining then I'm more than happy. Iron Man, hey, Clint. Hawkeye, hey, man. Iron Man, clearly, retirement doesn't suit you. You got tired of shooting golf. Hawkeye, well, I played 18, shot 18. Just can't seem to miss. Spider-Man, about that. Hawkeye, not now, Spider. Spider-Man, bruh. In a split second of dazzling reflexes, Hawkeye drew his bow with finesse, releasing an arrow that sailed with unerring precision towards Iron Man. However, the formidable Avenger, ever in tune with the ebb and flow of battle, evaded the incoming projectile with graceful ease, his movements akin to an intricate dance. With an almost imperceptible gesture, Iron Man retaliated, launching a dazzling barrage of repulsor blasts, their arcs cutting through the air with lethal precision. Each volley of energy found its mark, obliterating the incoming arrows with a display of technological prowess that spoke of mastery over the cutting-edge suit he donned. Iron Man, first time for everything. Spider-Man, that's actually the second. Hawkeye, made you look. In a display of awe-inspiring telekinetic prowess, Scarlet Witch gracefully orchestrated a ballet of cars, sending them hurtling toward Iron Man with remarkable force. Despite his agile evasions, some vehicles crashed upon impact, driving the armored Avenger to the ground. Friday, multiple contusions detected. Iron Man, yeah, I detected that, too. In a dazzling display of acrobatic finesse, Captain America executed a side flip kick with precision, delivering a formidable blow to War Machine's helmeted head as he careened towards him with rocket like propulsion. The resounding thud echoed through the air as War Machine crashed unceremoniously to the ground, temporarily taken aback by the impact. Ever vigilant, the enigmatic Black Panther sought to seize the opportune moment to close in on Captain America from behind. However, the vigilant hero's instincts proved sharp as a razor, detecting the approaching threat in an instant. Reacting with unwavering speed, he unleashed a swift front kick, deftly redirecting the Panther's advance and creating a strategic distance between them. Amidst the fray, a call rang out, drawing Captain America's attention to none other than Ant-Man, who presented an unexpected sight as he wielded a seemingly minuscule truck in his grasp. Ant-Man, hey, Cap, heads up. Throws a small car at Cap throw it at this. Shows an enlarging pim particle. With masterful precision, Ant-Man deftly launched the circular pim, pime particles, particle high into the air, while Captain America mirrored the action with his own device. A moment of palpable tension hung in the air as the two particles converged their energies colliding in a symphony of microscopic power. In a breathtaking display of transformative capabilities, the seemingly innocuous small truck, now imbued with the esoteric effects of the pine particles, underwent a miraculous metamorphosis. Enlarging before their eyes, it bloomed into a colossal form, dwarfing its original size with an imposing presence. Aware of the impending impact, the Agile Widow and the enigmatic Panther demonstrated their keen instincts, nimbly evading the path of the burgeoning behemoth. However, War Machine found himself caught in the storm, unable to escape the oncoming force. With resounding force, the enlarged truck collided with War Machine's visor, the explosive impact sending shockwaves through the battlefield. Spider-Man, damn. Ant-Man, oh, man, I thought it was a water truck. Captain America, gives him the are you serious? face. Ant-Man, ah, uh, sorry. Amidst the reverberations of the resounding explosion, the assembled heroes emitted subdued grunts, attesting to the concussive force of the impact. However, it was War Machine who rose from the ashen aftermath, his countenance now a visage of regal ire. The once composed demeanor of James Rhodes now replaced by an aura of simmering fury, his resolve fortified by the vehemence of the detonation. Black Widow, is this part of the plan? Iron Man, nope, that went through the window when Carito decided to mess around. At least he blocked the way of Sam and Bucky, they had to take another route. Black Widow, you wanna switch up? In a realm of solitude atop the airport, Spider-Man stood, his attention riveted to the ethereal glow of his phone. Amidst the backdrop of Dusk's embrace, he found himself immersed in the digital tapestry that lay within his handheld device. 
Time seemed to elude him, lost in the realm of cyberspace, where the virtual world intertwined with the tangible. Toxin, can we fight? Spider-Man, in a bit, just a bit more. With singular purpose and unwavering resolve, Team Captain America advanced with synchronized determination towards the waiting Quinjet. Each member's stride spoke of their shared commitment, as they prepared to embark on a momentous journey together. Spider-Man, I don't know why but I have this huge urge to fight. Toxin, oh, ah. Uh, that's certainly, weird. Spider-Man, Toxin? Toxin, what's up? Spider-Man, nothing probably just imagining it. Toxin, relived sigh. Suddenly, a new figure emerged into Spider-Man's line of sight. Vision, a being of ethereal grace and enigmatic power, stood tall before Team Captain America, a beacon of pulsating energy in his brow. The intensity of his laser gaze held the promise of both protection and challenge, as he guarded the path with a regal poise that befits his otherworldly nature. Vision, Captain Rogers. I know you believe what you're doing is right, but for the collective good, you must surrender now. Team Iron Man took their positions with a composed unity that bespoke their unwavering resolve. With measured steps and a discerning air, they formed a formidable line on the opposing side, confronting their comrades with a collective sense of duty that mirrored their unshakable principles. Iron Man, Carito can you be useful, please? Unbeknownst to Carito, a profound metamorphosis was unfolding within the recesses of his consciousness, orchestrated in secret by the insidious toxin symbiote that had surreptitiously taken up residence within his mind. This clandestine manipulation quietly weaved its way through the labyrinth of his thoughts, entwining itself with the very essence of his being. As Carito grappled with the weight of accumulated stress and seething emotions, the symbiote seized upon these vulnerabilities, artfully leveraging them to advance its own enigmatic agenda. In the shadows of his psyche, the symbiotic entity subtly shaped and molded his perception, carefully steering him down an unforeseen path, all while the unsuspecting host remained oblivious to the profound transformation taking place within. Spider-Man, actually I have an idea. With an elegant display of aerial acrobatics, Spider-Man soared skyward, propelled by the graceful force of his lateral repulsion. His descent was equally mesmerizing, as he alighted gracefully in the midst of the two opposing factions, a sentinel of enigma amongst them. As the dust of his superhero landing settled, he unmasked himself, revealing his countenance with an enigmatic smirk that stretched from ear to ear. A palpable aura of astonishment enveloped the assembled heroes, their gazes transfixed upon the figure before them, for what stood before them was not the familiar Carito they once knew, but a figure shrouded in an inexplicable aura of ambiguity. It was as if Spider-Man had undergone a metamorphosis, transcending the confines of his former self. The expressions worn by his fellow heroes ranged from incredulity to trepidation, each one grappling to comprehend this startling transformation. Carito's once familiar visage now bore an air of devilish allure, casting an ethereal spell over those who beheld him. A potent amalgamation of awe and unease swirled within the hearts of the assembled, for this was an iteration of Spider-Man unlike any they had encountered before. Spider-Man, everyone why don't you come at me? An aura of stunned silence descended upon the assembled heroes, as Spider-Man's words reverberated through the air with an enigmatic weight. A collective state of flabbergasted astonishment settled over them, as each tried to fathom the implications of his cryptic proclamation. War Machine, are you fucking insane? Angry you have been nothing but a joke this entire time, fuck off and. In a fraction of time too swift for the human eye to discern, an extraordinary spectacle unfolded before the assembled heroes. Spider-Man, seemingly infused with an otherworldly vigor, unleashed an unprecedented display of superhuman prowess. With an eerie fluidity, one of his limbs elongated like a sentient appendage, defying the laws of anatomy, an ensnared war machine by the chest with an inhuman grip. Within this astonishing tableau, a formidable silence descended, punctuated only by the palpable tension that clung to the air like a veil of trepidation. The collective consciousness of the onlookers bore witness to a fearsome sight, Spider-Man's penetrating gaze bore into War Machine's soul, the weight of his intimidating aura echoing through the very core of the armored hero's being. As the air crackled with a mixture of astonishment and uncertainty, Spider-Man's resolve remained unyielding, the enigmatic hero, now emanating an unparalleled potency, drew War Machine closer, the intensity of the moment growing exponentially with each passing heartbeat. In a mesmerizing display of power, Spider-Man's head collided with War Machine's helmet, the impact resounding like a celestial echo that left all in its wake speechless. The indomitable force of the headbutt sent War Machine hurtling to the ground, the earth beneath him bearing the weight of this extraordinary encounter. Spider-Man and Toxin, next.
In the wake of the unprecedented display of Spider-Man's newfound prowess, an aura of perplexity enveloped the assembled heroes, leaving them immersed in a maelstrom of contrasting emotions. Baffled and intrigued, they sought to grasp the enigma before them, but comprehension remained elusive amidst the flurry of thoughts that surged within their minds. In the midst of this bewildering tableau, Iron Man's prodigious intellect shone like a beacon, foraging the depths of possibility in search of a rationale behind his friend's peculiar behavior. Within the inner sanctum of his thoughts, a theory began to take shape, a realization that seemed to offer a semblance of clarity in the fog of uncertainty. Iron Man, I think it's the suit. Black Widow, what? Iron Man, he's been acting more moody since I have given it to him as a present. Vision, the suit. It gives me a very bad vibe. Iron Man, we need to get rid of the suit or at least make him snap out of it. Black Panther, we don't have time for this. Iron Man, we can't do anything if Spider-Man is in the way. He's probably as strong as Vision now with that suit on. It also seems to be affecting him. Black Panther, fine. Iron Man, Cap. We need to do something about Spider-Man, either destroy his suit or make him snap out of it. Captain America, what's wrong with him? Iron Man, it's the suit. The suit is affecting him. Spider-Man, are you all done? Amidst the tempest of uncertainty, Spider-Man sprang into action, his agile form epitomizing a dance of grace and precision. With unparalleled swiftness, he extended his web shooters, ensnaring Iron Man and Captain America, and with a mighty pull. The two stalwart heroes collided in an unforeseen convergence. A surge of kinetic force enveloped them as Spider-Man, donning an enigmatic smirk, formed his hand into a formidable hammer, delivering a thunderous blow that sent both titans hurtling towards the unforgiving ground. The reverberating impact echoed through the air, like a symphony of steel and energy. While the others watched with astonishment, they realized there was no respite, no opportunity to hesitate or relent. United by a common purpose, they rallied against the prodigious spider-themed hero, their combined might converging in an attempt to subdue the indomitable force before them. Yet, to their dismay, Spider-Man was an enigma, his movements an ethereal dance, eluding their advances with unparalleled finesse. Each strike, each calculated maneuver, found only thin air. Black Widow, damn, spider senses. Spider-Man, and the suit helps even more. Smirks. In the midst of the pulsating encounter, Spider-Man's keen eyes followed Black Widow's swift maneuvers, her baton emitting a crackling surge of electrical energy, meant to ensnare her formidable adversary. However, her tactical acumen overlooked one crucial detail, Spider-Man has the ability to absorb and harness electrical power. Black Widow, oh no. I forgot. Spider-Man, dumbass. Spider-Man's augmented prowess found swift manifestation in a deft, open-handed maneuver directed at Black Widow. With a precision that belied the chaotic surroundings, his palm met the heroine's cheek in an emphatic gesture, propelling her into an unintended trajectory, colliding with a wooden crate. Spider-Man, oops, too hard, but these hands are rate right dirty for everyone right now. Spider-Man's finesse and strategic acumen resonated with a graceful display of power and precision. As the distant fusillade from Hawkeye and Scarlet Witch attempted to assail him, the enigmatic hero responded with a calculated maneuver that swiftly bridged the gap between them. Employing his web-slinging prowess, he ensnared their faces, momentarily blinding them and leaving them disoriented. With deft execution, he launched himself towards Hawkeye, deploying a well-timed electrostatic charge that incapacitated the archer, rendering him incapacitated with swift efficacy. Scarlet Witch, too, faced the awe-inspiring might of the symbiotically empowered Spider-Man. Attempting to utilize her formidable abilities to alter the trajectory of the encounter, she was met with unexpected resistance as the hero's hacking skill effortlessly nullified her assault. The masterful deployment of an accelerated decoy further bewildered her, providing a critical opening for the spider-themed hero to deliver a striking Superman punch that silenced her attempts to resist. Turning his attention to the next challenge, Spider-Man found himself confronted by a trio of adversaries, each formidable in their own right. Yet, a member of the trio had other plans involving vengeance. As Black Panther launched a swift offensive against the Winter Soldier, Spider-Man's agile maneuvering webbed the Panther with astonishing speed, leaving him incapacitated and befuddled, unable to counter the enigmatic hero's decisive actions. In seamless cohesion with his symbiotic form, Spider-Man channeled a wave of kinetic energy, subjecting the Panther to a series of precise, earthbound blows that accentuated his dominant position in the confrontation. Exploiting the opportunity, he propelled the panther airborne, transforming his own arms into a bat-like appendage. Spider-Man, batter up! 
In a seamless ballet of kinetic force, Spider-Man's movements spoke volumes of his heightened combat finesse. His strikes found their mark with unerring precision, as he gracefully dispatched the panther with a devastating blow to the abdomen, propelling the noble warrior through the expanse of the airport like a projectile of force. As the tension escalated, Spider-Man's acute senses detected the subtle transformation of Ant-Man, enlarging into a colossal form that loomed like a behemoth on the battlefield. Undeterred, the symbiotically empowered hero demonstrated a commanding presence, signaling the Winter Soldier to halt his hand-to-hand -hand engagement, an act that betrayed a profound understanding of the battle's ebb and flow. Spider-Man, symbiote's mouth starts forming all I need is one hand for you. Winter Soldier, what the hell is wrong with you? Spider-Man and Toxin, I want some fun and to see you humiliated as I kick your ass with one hand. Winter Soldier, TCH, I'll make you snap out of this bloodthirst. In a display of audacious bravado, Ant-Man sees the opportune moment to wield his gargantuan proportions to his advantage, intending to deliver a bone-crushing stomp upon Spider-Man. Yet, as his colossal foot plummeted earthward with a thunderous impact, an unexpected resilience greeted him. Unyielding as a fortress against the Tempest, Spider-Man's unmoved stance defied Ant-Man's forceful assault, leaving the colossal hero incredulous at the sight. And then, in an enigmatic twist of fate, an unseen force emerged from beneath the very foot Ant-Man employed to crush his adversary. A mysterious counter-force surged from the depths, pushing back against Ant-Man's titanic weight, creating a mesmerizing tug-of-war between the two forces. The ground quivered beneath the strain of the clash, leaving a fractured fissure in its wake. Ant-Man, what the hell? In an astonishing display of might, Spider-Man harnessed an extraordinary surge of strength, his sinews swelling with raw power, as he countered Ant-Man's colossal assault with unparalleled fortitude. With a resounding cry that echoed through the air, the arachnid hero forced Ant-Man's massive leg aloft, causing the colossal hero to lose his footing and land unceremoniously upon the ground. With uncanny agility, Spider-Man deftly weaved through the chaos, avoiding the Winter Soldier's attempted strike his nimble form a mesmerizing dance amidst the turmoil. Swiftly, he ensnared Ant-Man's limbs with intricately spun webs, launching himself skyward in a graceful ascent that defied the laws of gravity. As Spider-Man soared into the heavens, a sense of surreal transcendence hung in the air, captivating the onlookers who watched in awe. And then, like a celestial avenger descending from the firmament, the spider plummeted earthward, his velocity amplified by sheer force of will. With a thunderous impact, the venom-infused punch struck Ant-Man's abdomen. Ant-Man crumpled to the floor, the ground beneath him etched with the mark of his defeat. Amidst the aftermath, the Winter Soldier stood frozen, eyes wide with incredulity, as the enigmatic Spider-Man positioned himself with an air of quiet resolve, prepared for any challenge that fate might present. The aura of mystery surrounding the web slinger deepened, leaving Bucky to contemplate the enigma that stood before him, poised and unyielding. Winter Soldier, shit don't do me like that man. In a seamless display of speed and precision, Spider-Man closed the distance between himself and the Winter Soldier with startling alacrity. Bucky's strikes, though executed with swift determination, were expertly evaded or effortlessly deflected by the agile hero. With a measured grace, Spider-Man's singular focus was unmistakable. A potent surge of power emanated from the hero's palm, as he imbued his strike with venomous energy. In one fluid motion, he delivered a devastating venom blast to Bucky's abdomen launching him through the air, where he found himself unceremoniously thrown off balance. The relentless assault continued without respite. Spider-Man moved with a fluidity that seemed to transcend the boundaries of human capability, landing a precise kick upon Bucky's face that compelled the soldier to stagger back several steps. A series of swift and calculated blows followed, each connecting with unerring accuracy upon Bucky's visage. In the aftermath of the intense flurry, the spider assumed a poised and composed stance, having quelled his adversary with uncanny ease. A moment of silence pervaded the air, punctuated only by the subdued thud of the Winter Soldier's descent to the ground. Amidst the escalating chaos and tension, Spider-Man's heightened senses bristled with urgency, warning him of the approaching adversaries. A vengeful war machine launched a furious assault, tackling the spider-themed hero into the skies, where the two formidable combatants engaged in a symphony of powerful blows, each seeking to gain the upper hand. As the battle unfolded, the formidable trio of Falcon, Iron Man, and Vision joined the fray, their combined might posing a daunting challenge for the agile hero. Yet, undeterred, Spider-Man's mind worked with swift precision, adapting to each incoming threat with remarkable finesse. With deft agility, he swiftly evaded Falcon's deadly wing attack, expertly manifesting a protective shield with his hand. 
Ascending upon Falcon's back, he discharged a surge of electricity, incapacitating his airborne assailant. Ensuring Falcon's safety, he ingeniously utilized webbing to create a makeshift parachute, easing his opponent's descent. The dance of combat continued as Spider-Man maneuvered through the air, delivering an electrifying dual strike to Iron Man and War Machine. The electric surge crackled with intensity, momentarily disorienting both armored heroes, granting Spider-Man a crucial moment of advantage. Undaunted, Vision sought to seize the opportunity, aiming to strike the Spider-Hero with a powerful down smash. However, Spider-Man's ingenuity proved to be a step ahead. Utilizing his accelerated decoy, he artfully evaded Vision's attack, countering with a devastating punch that sent the android careening towards the Earth, leaving a profound impact upon impact. As the confrontation neared its zenith, Spider-Man's strategic acumen took center stage. Acting with seamless precision, he bound both Iron Man and War Machine with unyielding webs, and with gravity-defying prowess, he descended to the ground, delivering a decisive double kick that reverberated with raw force. The ground quaked beneath the impact, leaving his remaining opponents dazed and incapacitated. Spider-Man and Toxin, made sure not to hurt them too badly. This host's dedication to protecting them is still there. I was holding back most of the time. Spider-Man approached the fallen figures of Captain America and Bucky. There still forms a testament to the relentless confrontation that had unfolded. His movements were graceful, yet purposeful, as he carefully lifted their unconscious bodies and carried them towards the waiting Quinjet. With a gentle touch, he roused them from their slumber, their eyes fluttering open to meet his gaze. The gravity of the situation hung palpably in the air, and Spider-Man's expression remained composed. Captain America, NGH. He looks at Spider-Man and gets prepared to fight. Winter Soldier, a he crawls away from Spider-Man in a bit of fear. Spider-Man and Toxin, don't bother, this host's willpower had taken away my mood to fight everyone and I can feel my control over his body slowly going away. Captain America, what have you done to Carito? Spider-Man and Toxin, he never noticed that I was taking over his body by making him an asshole. It worked like a charm because he was already carrying many negative thoughts. I just empowered it. Eventually, his will to protect changed me during the fight which is strange. I thought I was in full control but looks like I wasn't. Winter Soldier, then return him. Spider-Man and Toxin, he'll take control and scold me pretty badly. Now go before the others wake up. In a poignant moment of decision, the two soldiers, Captain America and Bucky, acknowledged Spider-Man's subtle gesture and proceeded with a sense of purpose towards the waiting Quinjet. The symbiote within Carito grappled with the weight of the choices that lay ahead, recognizing the irreversible consequences of his recent actions. Imprisonment awaited him, and the repercussions of his actions on his host, Carito, were bound to be severe. The symbiote felt a growing unease, sensing the mounting rage within his host, a force that threatened to overwhelm him. Faced with this critical juncture, the symbiote reached a momentous decision. Perhaps it was a glimmer of self-preservation, or a deeper realization of the consequences of his actions, but the symbiote chose to relinquish control of Carito's body. With a determined effort, Carito forcefully disengaged from the symbiotic suit, confining it to a pocket dimension with his remarkable hacking skill. As the symbiote retreated, Carito found himself once again in his familiar Miles Morales suit. A sigh of frustration escaped him. However, amidst the whirlwind of thoughts and feelings, a voice from the Quinjet's speakers demanded his attention. Captain America, Carito, I don't think you should stay. You took her off the suit so I know it's you. Come with us, you'll just be treated as a criminal after this. Spider-Man, cracks neck I just thought of that, so I'll come with you. Captain America, good, let's go. With measured steps, Spider-Man approached the formidable Quinjet. His presence exuded a sense of resolution, for within him lay the weight of recent events and the echoes of choices made. Clad in his iconic suit, he took his place within the aircraft, deftly activating its intricate systems with practiced ease. As the Quinjet roared to life, the trio embarked on a journey that would carry them towards an uncertain future. The hum of the engines resonated with the gravity of their mission, while the whirring turbines seemed to echo the turbulence of emotions that swirled within their minds.